all of these promises of chastisement and blessing. Chastisement and blessing. Three of them. Now, the first chastisement already mentioned, Babylon. Then the next one was the Roman invasion in 70 A.D. And they've been under the chastisement now for almost 2,000 years. And the blessing is about to come, which will be this glorious kingdom. All right, <clears throat> now all the Old Testament, and I've done this before, and we're going to do it again. All these Old Testament promises are leading up to Christ's first advent, and then so far as prophecy was concerned, yes, he would be rejected, he'd be crucified, he'd be three days in the tomb, he'd be resurrected, 40 days he spent with the 12, he ascended back to glory, and then so far as the Old Testament and the Gospels and everything were concerned, in would come the tribulation, those final seven years, and it's always divided three and a half and three and a half. That's why we can determine a seven-year period. Daniel speaks of 490 years, but only 483 fulfilled. So we got seven years, plain arithmetic. All right, but then we come to the book of Revelation. Then it stipulates 42 months and 42 months. That's three and a half years and three and a half years. Another chapter will say 1,260 days, 1,260 days, three and a half years, three and a half years. So all the scripture fits in this seven-year time frame. So don't let people try to foul your thinking with all these other things. But we have this final seven years always divided in half because the first half will not be anything like the last half. All right, then as we've already seen today, these seven years will lead up to the second coming and the coming into the kingdom. Now, all through Scripture, there was not one hint but that it would all be coming right down the line. In other words, the tribulation would take place just a few years after the ascension and the second coming. So this was all going to take place in the lifetime of people living here. Now think for a minute. Take the 12 disciples. What do you suppose were their average age? Just a guess. How, much, how old do you think the disciples were? In their 30s. All right. Now we know that from the crucifixion until, oh, sometime after Peter starts preaching in Pentecost, we'll say five years go by, and that would have brought in the tribulation. So five plus seven would take you 12 years beyond the crucifixion, and you'd have the what? the kingdom. All right, so if the guys were 40, and 12 years later, they're still only what? 52. So you see, this whole top line could have easily taken place in the lifetime of the people that were living at the time that Christ ministered. And they had no idea that God was going to do something different. Because, you see, after we've gone past the ascension, Instead of the tribulation taking place, Israel rejected it all when they stoned Stephen, and that was shortly after his ascension, remember. All right, so they stoned Stephen, and who are we introduced to at the stoning of Stephen? Paul, see? And that's what you have to understand, that all of a sudden, Israel rejects their Messiah, rejects all these Old Testament promises, and God says, I'll do something different. Just like he did when he called Abraham. Had one race of people, had been dealing with them for 2,000 years, and what does God say in so many words? I'm going to do something different. And he raised up Abraham. All right, now it's the same way when Israel rejected and rejected, they Stone Stephen will not have this Jesus of Nazareth ruling over us. And we're introduced to the next major player, Saul of Tarsus. All right, that means that God is going to put this whole timeline on hold. And that's why we drop it down to a second line now. Instead of bringing in the tribulation, we bring in the dispensation of grace. When this dispensation of grace or the outcalling of the Gentile body is complete, it has to be taken out so that God can finish this line, which I've now got over here. And it's so obvious from Scripture if you realize that only Paul speaks of the rapture. Nobody else. 
Only Paul. And so, as I've already pointed out, the second coming is associated with nothing but the wrath and the destruction and the vengeance of God setting the stage for the kingdom that's still future. All right, now break time. I had Sharon come back. We did. Now, to show you how fast time goes, I thought I did that kingdom of God and body of Christ six months ago. And I went back and checked the books. You know how long it was? That's over two years, Sharon. That's over two years ago. Man, it seems like six months. But anyhow, we did a whole series on the circles that she's got here now. The kingdom of heaven, the body of Christ, but they're all in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is everything from eternity past to eternity future that are under God's righteous control. There's nothing of evil in here. There's nothing of eternal doom in here. There's nothing of the lake of fire in here. This is only that which pertains to God's righteousness, which would be heaven, the angelic hosts, all the Old Testament saints, the Gospels, Earth, Christ's earthly ministry saints, the tribulation saints, and the body of Christ saints. We're all in the kingdom of God, but we're not in there in a mumble jumble. We're in there in two totally separate entities. Everything pertaining to the Old Testament believers all the way from Adam until the second coming, which would include the tribulation believers, they're in the kingdom of heaven. They're either going to come in here as flesh and blood, having survived, well, I'm over here now, having survived the tribulation, and they've become believers from the 144,000 preaching. If they're martyred, they're going to be resurrected, brought into the kingdom of heaven, along with the Old Testament saints. If they've managed to stay alive, then they'll come into the kingdom as flesh and blood, as we've been looking at now this afternoon. All right, now, if we don't get it to this afternoon, then in our next taping, we're going to talk about that other group of believers <coughs> who are <coughs> in the kingdom of God, which is the body of Christ. But they're two totally separate entities, and that's what we have to understand. Okay, now let's go back where I just was. Jeremiah chapter 23. Is that what I said? Yeah. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 23. And let's just start at verse 1. Now again, we're just going to be looking at the physical attributes of this glorious earthly kingdom that's coming. Like I said in the last half hour, we don't know when, but it's closer today than it was yesterday. Tomorrow it's going to be closer yet because we're moving ever nearer and nearer. All right, verse 1. Now again, we're going to back up a little bit in time to the reason God had to bring in wrath and destruction. <clears throat> Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Now remember, who is Jeremiah writing to? Israel. Israel. The pastors here are the priests and the religious leaders of Israel. Therefore, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. This is all Jewish. You have scattered my flock and driven them away. You have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant, the believing remnant, and my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them. And I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now then we're coming into the kingdom economy again, and I will set up shepherds over them who shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come. Now, it hasn't happened yet. Nobody can ever tell me that this took place any time in the past. But behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And that's capitalized, because branch is another one of the Old Testament terminologies for the Messiah. All right? 
And so I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a, what's the next word? King. See? A king. Now that just reminds me. You know, sometimes I do things that I don't intend to do. Come back with me to Revelation. So that we compare Scripture with Scripture. That's the name of the game. Now, Revelation is the New Testament book that is written in the same order for the nation of Israel to give them a road map of what's ahead. It's not church language. It's Jewish language. All right, so Revelation chapter 19. Oh, my goodness. I guess I got time. We can read them all. Let's just start at verse 11, honey. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19. Now, remember why I came back here. The word king. The word king that Jeremiah uses. All right, you got it? Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. See, that's the tribulation. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood because of his victims. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, in other words, the word of God, that with it, his word, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. In other words, there's no funny business in the kingdom. It's going to be a benevolent king, but he will tolerate no opposition. All right, so he's going to rule with an absolute and then he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God as he winds up the tribulation. And now here it comes, verse 16. When he appears at his second coming and he sets up his kingdom, here's his title now. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My, that reminds me of Handel's Messiah, doesn't it? But that's what he's going to be. He's going to be the king of kings. Why is that so hard for people to swallow? He has every right. And all of scripture is prophesying it. All right, back to Jeremiah. My goodness, we only got three minutes left. Back to Jeremiah 23. Verse 5. So behold, the days come. See, it hasn't happened yet. Verse 5, the older days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king. God the Son shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment, or I always take the term government. He will execute government and justice in the earth. Now, is that plain enough? We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about planet earth. He's going to reign and execute judgment and justice in the earth in his days, that is, in the days of this coming king, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the, Lord, the Lord our righteousness. And if I remember my Hebrew right, that's Sid Canoe. All right. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That's what it's always been so far. But at this point in time, it's going to be a little different saying. But the Lord liveth, who brought up and who led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, primarily Russia and northern Europe, and from all countries, whither I had driven them, and we know that from Deuteronomy 30, you remember, 1 and 2, that the Jews would be scattered into every nation on this planet, and then at a point afterwards, God would bring them back to their homeland. Remember that? We always use that in association with the signs of the times of Matthew 16. And there they are. They're back in the land. My goodness, I tell everybody, if for no other reason, 
we know this book is true is because the Jew against all odds is back in their homeland. And our politicians are too stupid to know the difference. It's just unbelievable. Why can't anybody recognize that these people who have been scattered for 1900 and some years are against all odds back in Jerusalem, back in their homeland? All of Scripture says it was going to happen. All right, now I want to end this so we can move on in our next program. All right, but the Lord liveth who brought the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries from whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Does this book lie? No. Well, it can't. So is it going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen. And we're getting closer every day. All the things that are taking place in the world are getting ready for this glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back. And again, you know, it's got to take a while to get you all served coffee, but uh, it works pretty good, and they get it, and they get back, and we always like to be out of here by 4.15 in the afternoon if we can. Okay, all of you out in television, come and see us sometime. We have a great time on these Wednesday afternoons, and again, we just always like to remind you that we're so appreciative of all your prayers and your financial help, your encouraging letters. My goodness, how we love our mail time. Okay, we're going to go right on with our theme that we're showing the attributes of this physical, political, <laughs> earthly kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign and all these Old Testament promises will finally become a reality. This isn't just pie in the sky. This is going to happen because it's the Word of God. All right, uh, we're going to jump in at Jeremiah 31 and verse 11. Now, all of these verses are, are applicable. They're all speaking of this glorious coming time for the nation of Israel. So I'm just sort of hitting the highlights. And in your spare time, read the rest of these chapters. All right, but Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 11. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob. Now, stop a minute. Will there be any unbelieving Jews going into the kingdom? No. The Lord made it so plain in John chapter 3. And what are you speaking to Nicodemus? What did he tell him? Nicodemus, you should know this. No one goeth into the kingdom unless they be born again, or what we call now, I prefer, uh, born from above. So there will be no unbelievers going into this kingdom. It's going to be a kingdom of righteous and it'll be a righteous government. It's going to be a righteous environment. And uh, we'll be looking at some more of that when we finally get into the New Testament description of these things. But here we have the redeemed of Israel who will be going into the kingdom. Now, let me just throw some numbers at you. We know from Zechariah chapter 8 that, oh, these guys are waiting to turn the board, aren't they? Okay, just a minute. We know that from Zechariah chapter 8 that one-third of Israel is going to come through the fires of the tribulation and go into the kingdom. Two-thirds are going to be lost. All right, Israel today is around 15 million people. One-third means five million. That's a pretty good chunk of people. That's more than Dallas-Fort Worth put together. 
All right, that'll be the remnant of Israel going in on the front end. Now then, from all the other nations of the world, there will just be a smattering of survivors who are believers that will go into the kingdom as Gentiles. And that's what you always have to remember. The millennial reign will be primarily Israel's thing. They are going to be the head nation of the nations by virtue of numbers. But all the other nations are going to be represented with a few, and the population, of course, will grow from all directions. All right, so that's what we talk about now, then, when we speak of the inhabitants of this glorious kingdom. Okay, so now I'm going to start reading in Jeremiah 31, verse 11 again. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, or the nation of Israel, and has ransomed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, shall flow, that same word that Isaiah used, all the nations shall flow into it. Oh, yeah, they shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord. Now for wheat and wine and oil, for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their souls shall be as a watered garden. Are you getting the beautiful description here? And uh, they shall not sorrow anymore at all. It's going to be heaven on earth. Oh, that's the only way I can put it. It's going to be heaven, but on planet earth for a thousand years. All right? Verse 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy. I will turn comfort to them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. I will satiate, or I will actually fill the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. I'm just going to keep reading for a few more verses. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard, and Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comfort of her children because they were not... Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. In other words, the Jews are going to be coming back from wherever they had been scattered to. Verse 17, And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. The Jews are going to all be where they belong. All right, now then let's just skip across in this same chapter to verse 31 where we now have the spiritual conditions of the nation of Israel. Verse 31, now this is what we call the New Covenant. It's the eighth out of the seven. Behold, the days come. Now, I can't refrain from reminding you. What does that tell us? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't care how much they scorn or ridicule. You know, Christianity is under attack, like almost not since the Dark Ages. Our media hates us, and they falsely accuse us of everything but the truth. And uh, we're just going to have to learn to live with it because we're not going to turn them around. All right, but here again, the days come because God has promised it. Saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In other words, the whole nation is going to be involved. All the tribes, not just Benjamin and Judah, all of them. Now verse 32. This new covenant will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke. In other words, this is not like the covenant of the Ten Commandments that he got at Mount Sinai. This is a totally new agreement between God and Israel. Now verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, in other words, after these last 1900 and some years of dispersion, after the horrible seven years of tribulation, after all those years have gone by, I will put my law in their 
inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's God's promise. Now verse 34, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. In other words, as it was in Deuteronomy, when you got up in the morning, what were they to do? Memorize scripture. When they sat down for noon down and lunch, what were they to do? Memorize scripture. When they went to bed at night, what were they to do? Memorize the scripture. In other words, to study it. That won't be necessary because every Jew will just have it automatically, see? All right, that's what he means here. Uh, verse 34 again. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. It's going to be a given. They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Israel is finally going to arrive. See? Verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, who giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who divideth the sea when the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. He's the creator, remember. And it's Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Now verse 36. If... That's a word of condition. If those ordinances, in other words, if the universe that's been there for however long you want to put on it, if you're a creationist, it's less than 10,000 years. If you go beyond that, it could be billions of years. But whatever, however long it's been there, it has never deviated. The sun has never moved out of its place. The planets have never, you know, I had an interesting experience. I shared with you in our last taping that we had a couple people come over to visit us from England. And we were outside one evening and standing on the deck, and it was a beautiful Oklahoma, clear, starlit night. You city people don't know what it's like. The stars were just like they were 100 yards up. And this Brit said, there's the Big Dipper. It's in the same place as it is in England. <laughs> And you know, it is kind of a shocking thing. We know that from textbooks, yes. But to actually hear it from someone, it's in the same place that it is in England. Well, of course. But has it ever moved? No, it's exactly like it's been since creation. All right, so what God is saying, it's just as apt to fall out of its rightful place as it is for Israel to lose their identity. Now, you preterists out there, I know they're listening. I get books from them all the time. One of them even expected me to autograph it. Ha! Sorry, fellas, I will never condone preterism. Because, see, preterism says that Israel disappeared in 70 AD. Well, then this is a lie. Or they're a lie. Now, you decide. But this is what God says, that if... The ordinances of creation, the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and the galaxies. If they disappear or depart from before me, saith the Lord, then shall the seed of Israel. Well, I guess if the universe falls apart, everything goes, doesn't it? You and I included. But this is what God is saying, that his promises with Israel are just as secure as the universe. Now, isn't that enough? How in the world can mortal men say that this is a lie? But they do. All right. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me. Thus saith the Lord. If heaven above, and we don't even know where heaven is, we know it's there, but we don't know where. All right. If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, saith the Lord. Now, isn't that amazing? So will God ever give up on Israel? Never. His promises are secure with the nation of Israel. 
And I'll take it one step further. If God can't keep his promise with Israel, do you and I have any assurance of our salvation? Well, of course not. Of course not. If he can't keep his word with Israel, he has no reason to keep his word with me or you. But, oh, beloved, he will not break his word with Israel. He will not break his promise with us. We are safe for eternity because his word is true. I'll stand on that until the day they shoot me. His word is true, see? All right. Now I've got to finish the chapter, I think, and then we're going to move on to another one. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel to the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall yet go forth over again. In other words, all these kingdom promises are going to be fulfilled. All right, verse 40, the whole valley of the dead bodies, the ashes, the fields, and the brook of Kidron under the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy unto the Lord. In other words, all the things that were ravished in those closing days of the tribulation will disappear. It'll never be remembered in this glorious kingdom, and it shall not be plucked up nor thrown down anymore forever. All right, now let's just turn the page. I want to go to chapter 33. And let's see, I want to drop down to verse 7. You know, I just had a hard time picking out some of these key portions because it's all full of these kingdom promises. Now, when we get the New Testament, I'm going to give you a verse that I've used over the years, but hopefully it'll mean a lot more now than it did before. All right, Jeremiah 33 and uh, we're dropping at verse uh, seven. Yeah, 7, yeah. And I will cause the captivity or the bringing in of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. In other words, by an act of God, and we've already seen it. That's why they're back in the land. It was providential. And I will build them as at the first. Now verse 8, look at this promise and I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I procure unto it, that is, unto the nation of Israel. Well, I'm, I'd like to just read all these verses, but I'm afraid people might get uh, a little bit impatient. So let's just skip, skip on down to verse 12. My, there's some good verses up there. Verse 11, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and all that makes up of a common, ordinary human society. Now remember, they're, they're not angels, they're humans. All right, now verse 12. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord of hosts, again in this place which is desolate, without man and without beast, and in all the cities thereof shall be a habitation of shepherds. causing. Now, what are you gathering from this? Seemingly, what kind of a society or community will the kingdom be? Agrarian. Have you noticed that? Agrarian. It's not going to be metropolitan. It's not going to be urban. It's going to be agrarian. In other words, there's a verse back there someplace says that every man will sit under his own what? Fig tree. In other words, there'll be orchards. It's going to be agrarian. We're, we're going to have the beauty of the country. Now... I've never been a city dweller, neither is my little wife. And every time we go through one, we just can't imagine the horror of living in a big city. <laughs> but you know, when these city dwellers come out and we take them around the ranch, you know what flabbergasts them? Oh, the open space, <laughs> see? We can go for miles and not meet a car. Well, they just can't imagine that. And, uh, but I think that's what the kingdom is going to be. It, it's going to be so beautiful. There, there's not going to be that, that beehive of contracted dwellings and so forth. Uh, uh, from the language I get, at least, it's going to be agrarian. Okay, let's move on. 
Uh, let's see, where was I? Verse 14. Behold, the days come, say the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel, the house of Israel. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch. See, there's that word again. The term of God the Son in the Old Testament. He's called a branch. Whenever you see that with a capital B. All right, I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. See, it's not going to be any sin, no wickedness, no immorality. It's going to be glorious. But it's still going to be in a human environment, families, husbands, wives, and children. But no Satan, no death, no curse. All right, verse 16. In those days, that is during these thousand years. Now, I better emphasize, the Old Testament does not put us in a time frame. We have to go to the book of Revelation to get that. And that's where we get the thousand years. And after the thousand years, so on and so forth. So always remember that. The Old Testament does not give us a time frame. All right, reading on. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And again, it's the Hebrew term Sid Canoe. Verse 17, For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to kindle meat offering, and do sacrifice continually. Now, there will be some sacrificial offerings in the kingdom, and that's hard to reconcile, and I, for one, cannot do justice to it, so I just sort of leave it alone. But yes, there will be a, a certain amount of uh, animal sacrifice. It'll be limited, of course, but it'll be, I think, a memorial, much like our communion table. All right, verse 19, the word of the Lord came in Jeremiah saying, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day. Now here we come back again to God proving that he will never let go of Israel. If you can break the covenant of the day, my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. Now here's a good statement. When we speak of the throne of David and Christ as the son of David, this is where the connection comes from. Christ is genealogically the son of David. And we pick that up, of course, in Matthew's genealogy. So always put those two and two together, that Christ will sit upon David's throne as the son of David, genealogically, not losing sight of his deity. All right, so uh, verse 22, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Moreover, verse 23, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, the two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off. Thus they have they despise my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. In other words, I think he's referring to the two kingdoms before they would be brought together, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. All right. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and the earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, and so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity or their control of his people. He's going to bring them back, and I will have mercy on them. Okay, now we got time enough. Let's jump one more to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I'm going to jump down to verse 24. Ezekiel 36, and drop in at verse 24. Now, this is still another prophet. See, we've had Isaiah talk about it. We've seen Jeremiah speak about it. And now here comes Ezekiel, and probably in our next half hour, we'll have time to go on up to Daniel. 
And then in our next taping, we'll take a look at how the New Testament approaches this kingdom economy. All right, Ezekiel 36, verse 24. And look at the promises here. Oh my, they ought to just give you goosebumps because we've seen some of this already take place. For I will take you from among the heathen, the Gentiles. Now, I think we looked at that some time ago. In fact, I think in my seminars in Florida, I started every one of them with the same verse in Matthew 16, that you can discern the signs of the weather, but you can't discern the signs of the times. Isn't that what I was on? Yeah. And what is the major sign of the times for you and I today? The return of Israel to their homeland. That's a sign of the time because the end time could not even begin until Israel was back in the land. They have to be there, because that's where the Lord is going to return and set up his kingdom. All right, now Ezekiel says the same thing. See, I will take you from among the Gentile and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. How can anybody deny this? Beyond me, but they do. You know how they deny it. I sent you the book. They claim they're not Jews at all. They're Khazars from the Rep Russian steppes. And that they simply took over the Jewish libraries and synagogues. That's what they do with the scriptures. Yeah, that's what they claim, that these aren't Jews at all. They're imposters. Well, who in the world would want to be an imposter and step into all the hatred that the Jews get? Well, anyway, <laughs> verse 25, then, now they haven't done it yet, even though Israel's back in the land, they're not experiencing these spiritual uh, blessings yet. They're still there in unbelief. They're secular. Many of them are even atheist and, and uh, agnostic, but they're in the land, so the rest will come. Don't worry. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Now, of course, the Babylonian captivity, I think, broke them of idolatry, but nevertheless, it's still in their background. Now, verse 26, a new heart also. Remember what the covenant was? 31, 31. I will put it in your heart. You won't have to memorize it every day. It'll be there. It'll be a given. All right. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments or my ordinances or my government, and you will do them. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be What's the pronoun? My people. Now, do you remember in Israel's past, when Israel was out in rank unbelief and the prophet or whoever it was that was writing, what would God tell them to call them? Your people. He wouldn't claim them. But see, the day is coming when once again God will say, my people. See what a difference that makes? To Moses, he said, they're your people. To Daniel, he said, your people. But the day is coming. That's why the pronoun is so important here. The day is coming when you shall be, verse 28, my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from your uncleannesses. I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. In other words, when if we get time, we get to Amos yet this afternoon. I don't know if we'll make it or not. But what does Amos speak of? That the reaper will follow the planter, and the planter will follow the reaper. In other words, it's going to be continuous production of food and fiber with no opposition from insects or weeds or thorns. It'll be easy, no sweat of the face. So that's why it's maintained. I think it's going to be an agrarian economy. Okay, reading on. Uh, Verse 30. Wow, we're at the end. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. 
If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, program number four this afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, just in case you're catching us for the first time, we're just an informal Bible study. I always make the point I'm not trying to attack anyone, and uh, hopefully we can just get people to see what the book says. I don't want anyone to go into a Sunday school class and say, this is what Les Feldick says. That doesn't amount to anything. Be able to say, hey, this is what the book says. And uh, hopefully we're making some headway. All right, we're going to keep right on with our subject of the physical attributes and the qualities of this earthly kingdom that's coming. And now we're going to move on up to the next one of the major prophets, Ezekiel. So those of you in the studio, you can be turning with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. And we're just going to start reading again at verse 1. And uh, again, I'm going to do like we've been doing all afternoon. We're, we're going to do more reading than usual. But hopefully the scripture can speak for itself if you understand what we're trying to show. That these are all promises given to the nation of Israel that's in their future. Sometime it's going to happen. All right, verse 1. After, oh, that's right. My little wife is just reminding me. This is book number 74. We're in the first, in the middle, four programs, and we're in the fourth program. And that's what the formula is. Is that what you would call it? <laughs> 74, 2, and now 4. So we're in the fourth program of the middle four programs of book 74. Thank you, honey. Because if it wasn't for her, I'd fall apart. Now that's all there's to it. Okay, Ezekiel 47, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the house. Now he's speaking of this millennial building in Jerusalem. And it stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. And then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the outer gate, by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. All right, now, <clears throat> we've looked at these before, but here is this river of water that's going to come out from underneath the, the throne room there in Jerusalem during the millennium, and the river will run out east to the Dead Sea, and it will totally cure the Dead Sea and make it fresh water and everything that's associated with the water that flows to the Red Sea will cause life to come and uh, opposite of what the Dead Sea is now. Then the other half of the river will flow west to the Mediterranean and this is all during this thousand year reign of Christ. All right, let's just move on a few verses and then we're going to go on into the book of Daniel. All right, but verse 7, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. And then verse 8, Then he said unto me, Now this I think is an angel speaking to, to Ezekiel. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country. Now if you know Jerusalem, we can stand on Mount of Olives, and on a nice clear day, you can almost see the Dead Sea. So that's east about... 18 or 20 miles, if I remember right, from Mount Olives in Jerusalem. All right, and so this is what he's talking about, that from under the sanctuary, this water or this river will flow east to the desert. Then verse 8, reading on, and on into the sea, that is into the Dead Sea, which being brought forth into the sea, that is into the Dead Sea, these waters are going to be so pure 
that they will purify the salty mineralized waters of the Dead Sea. All right, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. In other words, it's going to be a water of life, or it'll be a life-giving water. And there shall be a very great multitude of of fish, because these waters shall be healed. Now, if you've been to the Dead Sea, many of you have, I'm sure, absolutely nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Nothing. Because it is so saturated with salt and minerals. That's why you can't sink in it. You float. I'll never forget the time my dear little wife over here tried to swim in the Dead Sea and it just flipped her upside down. She wasn't quite ready for it. But that's what it is. But this water from the from the mount in Jerusalem is going to totally change the Dead Sea to a fresh water sea. All right. And then verse 10. And it shall come to pass. See, it has never happened yet, but it's going to that the fishers, fishermen, shall stand upon it from En Gedi, even unto En Eglim. There shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Now, someone just asked me at break time, are we going to eat meat in the millennium? That is, if we're there. <laughs> I, I'm still not sure whether church-age people are going to be in the millennium as not, uh, because after all, we're so separated from Israel in so many ways. Uh, I'm not putting us automatically in the millennium. But anyhow, are the citizens of the millennium, the, the humans, the people who have come in at the front end, Israel as well as Gentile, are they going to eat beef? I don't think so, because there'd be no death, and you'd have to kill them, did So here's what made me think of it. What was my answer? We'll probably eat fish. <laughs> It'll probably be the main diet, because the fishermen are going to stand on the shores of the Dead Sea, now made fresh, and uh, so we know they're going to eat fish. They're not going to catch them just for the nothing. Okay, so they're going to spread forth their nets, verse 10 again, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. In other words, every species of fish that is now in the Mediterranean will also be in the Dead Sea. Now, that seems unbelievable, but the Scripture promises it. All right. Then, uh, verse 11, there will be places that will be left as it is given to salt. And then, verse 12, And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that, shall grow all trees for what? Food. See? Whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to the months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for food, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Now that doesn't mean to cure disease, but it's therapeutic, to maintain good health. Well, those are all just statements concerning this glorious earthly kingdom. Now, let's jump over to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now this is the fourth major prophet that also speaks of this glorious earthly kingdom. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 44. And then remember in Daniel's previous verses he has seen the image of a Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which was prophetic of all the Gentile empires that would be coming up through history from 600 B.C., as we had it on there uh, on the board. And again, remember that Daniel writes now from uh, this exile to Babylon, 600 B.C. All right, so from Daniel's time on, all these Gentile empires will be holding forth and will be occupying and controlling the city of Jerusalem. First the Babylonians, then the Medan Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. All right, and so that takes us on up past then the time of Christ until the Roman Empire disappears. Now again, just for a quick review, remember that this is the only timeline that the Old Testament and the four Gospels 
the first eight chapters of Acts and then the little epistles at the end of our Bible, including Revelation. This is the only timeline they understand because this doesn't appear until Stephen is martyred, and we'll see that in our next taping. And when Stephen is martyred, as I just talked to somebody at break time, who are we introduced to? Saul of Tarsus. And what does that mean? A whole change of modus operandi. Instead of Christ and the twelve holding forth, all based on these prophecies that we've been looking at all afternoon, all of a sudden all this is put on hold and we go into something totally different that no other portion of Scripture has any knowledge of. And that's why it's referred to over and over as a secret held in the mind of God until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. And so that's why I've become more Pauline with every day that I get older, because if Paul doesn't teach it, then you have to be careful, because he alone is the Apostle of the Gentiles. And that turns people off. Tough luck. You know, I mean, you better accept it, because that's the way it is. And uh, if Old Testament promises agree with some of the things that Paul gives, great. But if they don't, then they're not valid because he alone is the apostle of the Gentiles. But we're still dealing with the Old Testament. So back here to Daniel again. Verse 44, in the days of those kings, that is starting with Nebuchadnezzar and those other four great empires leading up to the time of Christ's earthly ministry. All right, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In other words, after all these Gentile empires have come and gone, and the tribulation unfolds. Now remember, there's nothing in here of the church age. Keep that out of your thinking. This is all part of the prophetic scriptures, that after all these empires have come and gone, the tribulation is past, then shall God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And I always maintain that the thousand-year millennium will slip right on into the eternal somehow or other. I can't explain it, but evidently it's going to go on into eternity. It shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Why? For as much as thou sawest, now remember this is God speaking through Daniel, and Daniel is in turn interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. So it's a reference to Christ's second coming. The stone cut out without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God, the God of creation, hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain. Now what it really amounted to then is that these great empires that had come and gone were depicted in this huge image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and the stone would strike it on its feet, and it would roll it down like a steamroller until there was nothing left but dust and chaff, and it would blow away into the dustbin of eternal history, and Christ's kingdom would become a reality. Well, now let's just move on over in the book of Daniel as yet to chapter 7. And now instead of a, interpreting a dream of someone else, Daniel has his own. He has his own vision in chapter 7. <clears throat> Let's just jump in at verse 9. He sees the same series of empires, only he sees them as carnivorous beasts of prey, but he still sees the Babylonian, the Medes, and the Greeks, and the Romans, and how they would occupy Jerusalem over various periods of time. All right, but now you come up to verse 9. In his vision, in his dream, I beheld till the thrones of these Gentile empires were cast down, and the Ancient 
of days did sit, and I feel that's a reference to God the Father who is on the throne, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And then come all the way over to verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. That's Christ again in an Old Testament analogy. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, that is, to God the Father, and they brought him near before him. Now, any time I teach verse 13, I can't help it, even though we've done it not too long ago, come all the way with me up to Revelation chapter 5, because it's a perfect parallel. Now to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> verse 1. And just see how beautifully this corresponds. Daniel sees the Son of Man coming before God the Father. Now John the Revelator sees almost the same thing. Chapter 5, Rev uh, Revelation, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, see, in the hand of God the Father, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Uh, for sake of heaven, uh, for sake of time, I'm going to take verse 3. No man in heaven nor on earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereupon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, you remember when I've taught this, this was a mortgage and in type, and Satan is holding the mortgage on planet earth, and only one can pay it off, and that is Christ the Son of God. All right, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus the Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. All right, I beheld, verse 6, And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which is another description of God the Son, who has now finished the work of the cross. He's ascended back to glory. And now it's time to fulfill prophecy. Verse 7, He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. Now verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book or this mortgage, to open the seals thereof and be able to start paying it off, which, of course, Christ will do with the seven years of tribulation. And this is why he can do what he's doing. For thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. All right, now come back to Daniel then. This is all Jewish. This is all with the promises given to the nation of Israel. Verse 14. Daniel 7, verse 14. So after he comes before the Ancient of Days and then put in what he did in the book of Revelation, he took the mortgage and he paid it off. Satan is totally defeated paid off, and he's put in, high, uh, in uh, imprisoned in the abyss, and in comes the kingdom. See? Verse 14, And there was given him, God the Son, a dominion and glory and a kingdom. And in this kingdom, all people and nations and languages shall serve him, his dominion is an everlasting. Here again, see, it makes it sound that this kingdom is going to go beyond a thousand years. This dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And it's a visible, earthly, political, monarchy, benevolent kingdom animal kingdom, 
humans, children, babies, adults, no death, no suffering, no sickness. It's going to be heaven on earth. Why is that so hard to comprehend? Well, let's look some more. Hosea. Think Hosea follows Daniel, doesn't it, honey? Then uh, Hosea chapter 3. I want to go to chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. I might as well start at verse 1. <clears throat> oh, goodness, the time's just about gone again. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. Now, is there any doubt who is this written to? This has nothing to do with us Gentiles. This is God dealing with Israel. The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, and lying, and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field, the fowl of the heaven, the fish of the sea also shall be taken away. Let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall. All right, now then, drop into verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no more priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. All right, now we're come all the way down, and uh, I want to bring you over to the chapter where, now we're thinking chapter 10. Come all the way over to Hosea now, chapter 10. Now again, we've backed up a little bit into Israel's time of chastisement and wrath, but here comes their final blessing. Hosea, now chapter 10. Drop in at verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. In other words, it's been out of production. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way. In other words, their human understanding. In the multitude of thy mighty men, therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled. As Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle, the mother was dashed in peace upon her children. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. But now we come all the way down to the ultimate blessing in chapter 13, verse 9. Remember, all the way through the prophets, it was chastisement and blessing. Chastisement followed with blessing. And here comes the final, the setting up of this glorious kingdom. Verse 9, chapter 13. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. In other words, because of their unbelief. But in me, the Lord is speaking, in me is thine help. I will be thy, what? King. See? All the way through Scripture, we've got this coming king ruling over this glorious earthly kingdom. O Israel, I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou sayest, Give me a king? I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in wrath. 
Then come down to verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance from, shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, his fountain shall be dried up, Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. Now verse 1 of chapter 14. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. And uh, let me see. I guess I got no more good stuff in Hosea. Let's move on to Zephaniah. Zephaniah, if I can find it, after Habakkuk. Zephaniah, chapter 3. Verse 14, and this will take us, I imagine, to the end of the half hour. Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 14. What's the first word? Sing. See? Oh, that's the opposite of oppression and wrath. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord. See that? That's Jesus of Nazareth. <coughs> the God of glory. <coughs> the king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, and he's mighty. <clears throat> he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. All right, now I think for sake of time, I almost have to skip a verse or two here. Come down to verse 19. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that holdeth or the lame. I will gather her that was driven out. I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. <clears throat> At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, <clears throat> for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Okay, now if you can turn real quickly to Zechariah chapter 14, a verse that we've used over and over through the years, where it makes it as plain as language can make it. Zechariah 14, <coughs> verse 9. Now if I had time, I'd like to start at verse 1, but we can't do it. We've got 30 seconds left. Zechariah 14, verse 9. And the Lord, that's God the Son, that's Jesus of Nazareth, that's Jesus the Christ. The Lord shall be at some future time Lord or King over all the earth. And in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now... Here's your host, 
Les Speldick. Okay, good to see everybody in. And again, for benefit of our TV audience, we've got people from all over the country here with us today. I haven't got time to list them all, but anyway, you'll probably see a lot of new faces that you haven't seen over the years. And so again, we just want to welcome all you folks that have come from so far. And again, for those of you in television, if you're a new listener, we're not associated with any group. I'm not a pastor of a church. I'm just a cattle rancher. But we love to teach the book, and the Lord has given me the opportunity to do this. And so we don't, uh, we don't try to attack anybody. We don't try to elevate anybody. We just simply try to get people. And it's working, isn't it, honey? My, if you could read our mail, it's working. People are saying, for the first time in my life, I'm understanding what this book is all about. Well, what more could we ask? And uh, so that's our whole purpose in teaching, is to help folks to put all this together. All right, again, we have to thank you for all your prayers and your letters and, of course, your financial help. We don't want to forget that. But uh, keep, keep praying for us, because the devil doesn't like what we're doing. We're, we are under satanic attack, and I think most of you realize that. All right, now I'm going to continue on what we started in the last two tapings, or the last eight programs, and that is more or less Jerry titled it, Connecting the Dots, didn't you? Jerry titled it for me. We're Connecting the Dots, and you know, I, I came up with that at one of my seminars, and I think it might have been the one in Oklahoma City a year ago, where I don't know how many people used the same expression on their way out. And they said, Les, today is the first time somebody connected the dots. Well, you know what that means. When you just simply get all the subject matter tied together so that it makes sense. Well, this is what we uh, hope to do, and we started with the previous eight programs way back in Genesis, and we came up through then the Old Testament and the promises, as we see in the verse we're going to open up with, Romans 15, verse 8. So for those of you in television, the studio has got to jump on you. I gave them the verse before we opened. So find Romans 15, verse 8, and I just called it to the audience here, the introduction to the book of Matthew. And you say, Paul, <laughs> introducing Matthew? Well, in reality it does. Here it is, Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was. Now naturally, that's past tense from when Paul is writing. So Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That's Israel, remember. So he was a minister of the nation of Israel for the truth of God. Wasn't something Paul dreamed up. But for the truth of God to confirm or fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Now, if you think about that for a minute, isn't that the perfect introduction to the four Gospels? Well, for most people, it doesn't mean that at all. But it should. Because, you see, as we ended up in our last program, I think the last verse I used was Zechariah 14, verse 8, if I'm not mistaken. For the Lord, God the Son, Jehovah, shall be king over all the earth. And very few in Christendom understand that. They don't know what we're talking about. So we have to just patiently keep repeating and repeating. And it finally sinks in. All right, so look at the verse again. That Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was, years before Paul writes, a minister, a sent one, a particular instrument that God used between himself and the nation of Israel. Israel, God sent him to Israel for what purpose? You know what most people say? Well, to go to the cross. No, the cross hasn't even been mentioned yet. There's no inkling of a cross except in Psalms 22, and maybe if you've got a lot of imagination, Isaiah 53, but the cross was unknown in the Old Testament prophets. They didn't know he was going to go to a Roman crucifixion, but what did they know? He was coming to be a king over a kingdom. And so all the prophets, and that's what we've showed in the previous eight programs, how that all the prophets were depicting a glorious earthly kingdom over which Israel is going to be the major player, 
They'll be the major nation on earth because Jesus Christ will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, that was the promise made to the nation of Israel, that not only would they be a favored nation, but the day would come when they could enjoy God himself in the role of the Son who would be their Messiah and King, and Israel would be the top dog of all the nations. That's what the Old Testament prophets are all about. All right, now we're going to look at how it began to unfold then. He came to fulfill the promises. Now come back with me to Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> we touched a little bit in previous programs the announcement to Joseph and Mary of this virgin-born son that was coming. We also alluded to John the Baptist and his parents and how John the Baptist's father recognized through the leading of the Holy Spirit that this was the favored son to announce the coming of Israel's Messiah. And so this is where we're going to start now. John the Baptist is now full grown and he's beginning his ministry to the nation of Israel. Now I'm going to emphasize it all afternoon. Whom or to whom did Christ come? Israel. Israel. And now next, no, this month already, we're in November. In fact, I was just thinking when I was back there having my private prayer time, I think I should encourage everyone in my listening audience, you call the White House. And you can find the number. It's available everybody. You call the White House and ask for the comment line. I do it periodically. It'll just be an opportunity to leave a 40-second recording. Well, it won't take 40 seconds to you just admonish our president, don't force Israel to give away one acre of land. That's all you have to say. And if we bombard the comment line with that kind of a statement, I'm sure he's going to have the wherewithal to think twice because that's what it's all going to be about. See, he and Condoleezza Rice want to give back the East Jerusalem and some of the West Bank. And uh, I just say it flies in the face of the promises of God, except that it probably has to happen for the end time scenario. And I guess you're all aware that we're getting close. But nevertheless... Christ came to the nation of Israel. John puts it this way. He came unto his own Israel, and his own received him not. All right. Now, in Matthew chapter 3, we have the beginning, then, of the ministry of John the Baptist, who is really an Old Testament prophet. In fact, sorry about this, honey. Back up a few pages to Malachi. Just go back to Malachi chapter 3. Because some of these preachers and theologians get all riled up with me when I make this statement that the four Gospels are just an extension of the Old Testament. The only thing that's changed is that the Messiah is in their midst. Nothing has changed. They're still the, the nation of Israel. They're still worshiping at the temple. And uh, they're resting on the Old Testament covenant promises. Nothing has changed. So I... Make no apology. The four Gospels are an extension of the Old Testament. Now look at Malachi. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, the prophet writes, I will. Now whenever I use those words, I will, in the Old Testament, what do I put on it? The promise. That's a promise of God. He's going to do it. And as I wrote to someone just this morning, any time you have a prophetic statement from the lips of the God himself, I will, you mark it down, it is going to happen. It may take a couple more thousand years. I don't think so. But even if it does, it's going to happen. Anything that God says, I will do, is going to happen. Have I made my point? Because most of Christendom scorns this anymore. They're throwing out prophecy by the truckload. They don't want anything to do with it. And I beg to differ. All right. Now look what God says through the prophet Malachi 400 years before it happens. I will send my messenger, a reference to John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's what John the Baptist did. And the Lord, God the Son, 
whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Did he? Of course he did. All right. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now verse 2. Who may abide the day of his coming? Now again, i got to stop. Who do the Old Testament prophets write to? Israel, the Jew. Now watch this. But who may abide the day of his coming to the nation of Israel? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now what's the analogy? How do you purify gold or silver or mercury or any of the heavy metals? Heat. Heat. The more you heat it, the more the impurities come to the top, see? And so that's the analogy here, that this is what God is going to do with his covenant people, Israel. It's going to be cleansing them like a refiner's fire or a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi. Now, who were the sons of Levi? The priesthood, the religious leaders, see? And he will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. I will come near to you in judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, the false teachers, the adulterers and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and those that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right, now there's the Old Testament promise of a coming herald or announcer of the Messiah. And remember, it was 400 years before it happened. That was the last word that God gave Israel before he spoke to Joseph and Mary and Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. All right, but now John the Baptist begins his ministry. Back to Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And this was his sermon. This was his message. Repent ye... For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now again, I'm gathering from the letters and phone calls I get that 90% of Christendom does not have a clue what this kingdom of heaven really is. They think it's some kind of a spiritual entity, something up there in the ethereal. No, the kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, and as I mentioned the last taping, political kingdom. Christ is going to rule and reign as a legitimate king. And whenever a king rules, there's politics involved. Not the rotten kind we're used to, but you have to control the masses. And how do you do that? With political laws and rules and so forth. All right, now, sometimes I don't know where I'm going to go next. I guess this is one of them. Jump ahead a minute. Jump ahead to Matthew chapter... 19. Verse 27. Now maybe you think it doesn't connect, but on the other hand, I think it will. So do you see what I'm talking about? That we're talking about a kingdom over which a government will hold sway. All right? Matthew 19, verse 27. We're at the end of the three years of his earthly ministry. And Peter is speaking. And answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we, the twelve, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? 
Now put that in the realm of present day politics. And it's real easy to explain. If you're going to support someone running for office, and you're going to put a lot of time and energy and maybe even some money in it, what are you going to expect in return? Well, come on, you're all normal humans. You're going to want to be a place in his administration. I want a job. I don't care what it is, but if I'm going to work for you and you win, I want a job. Okay, fair enough. That's what Peter is saying. Lord, we've been with you for three years. Now when you come and set up your kingdom, where are we going to be? Are we going to be janitors? <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. Look what the answer was. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, well, when is that? The kingdom. When he sets up his earthly kingdom in the capital in Jerusalem. And this is the prospect for the twelve. Of course, Judas lost his, Matthias comes in. But it's still the twelve. All right? So when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, in that regenerated, reconstituted, remade earth like unto the Garden of Eden, we've been stressing that over the last several months, all right, now where are the twelve going to be? You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging or ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, is that gobbledygook? That's plain English. Where are they going to be? They're going to be under the throne room there in Jerusalem, and all twelve men are going to have a distinctive tribal relationship with one of the tribes ruling under the king. Now, is that so hard to see? And it's as plain as English can make it. That's what it's going to be. Christ is going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords, but under him are going to be the twelve apostles, each with one of the twelve tribes as their jurisdiction. See? All right, now speaking of the king, let's go all the way back to Isaiah. We may have used it in the last two tapings, but let's look at it again because I've got to convince the doubters that we're talking about a literal, physical, political kingdom. Isaiah, chapter 9, I think it is. I hope it is. Isaiah 9. Verse 6 and 7. Now, if this doesn't fit what we're talking about, land, I don't know what does. But this is written 700 years before the Matthew prophecy. But it still fits. It's the Word of God. You know, when we were down in Georgia the other day, I don't know how many people said what our ministry has done for them. It's just like putting the jigsaw puzzle together. That when you've got everything as it should be, they all fit. Well, that's the way this book is. If you get it all put together, it fits. See? All right. Verse 6, Isaiah 9. For unto us, the nation of Israel, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. That was the whole purpose of Christ coming to the nation of Israel in Bethlehem. And the government, see? The government shall be upon his shoulder. Who? The son that was given, that was born in Bethlehem. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be, when he becomes this glorious king, it'll be wonderful, consular, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, no enemy is ever going to come in and upset it. And it shall be upon the throne of David. And that's why I always put it where? Mount Zion. Just south of the Temple Mount that you see in the news all the time lately. About a quarter of a mile south, down a little bit, was Mount Zion. And that's where his throne is going to be. And that's where the twelve will have their twelve thrones, see? All right, so it's going to be where the uh, throne of David existed. 
and uh, he's going to order it, <clears throat> and he's going to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth forever. In other words, that kingdom is going to slip right on into eternity, I think, on the new heaven and the new earth that we see in Revelation 21. All right, now then, let's come back quickly. My goodness, time is almost gone. Back to Matthew chapter 3. So here comes John the Baptist, the heralder, the announcer, that the king is in their midst. Consequently, what's the message? Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, now, why was repentance the prerogative? Because it's going to be a sinless kingdom. And Israel had to get righteously right with their Messiah before the kingdom could be brought in. The sin problem had to be dealt with. You don't hear much about sin anymore, do we? No matter how vile everything gets, they never call it sin. But you see, Israel had the same sins that we got today. They were listed when we were back there in Malachi. They robbed the widows. They committed adultery. They were everything. Well, they had to repent of all that and be ready for this glorious king and his kingdom. All right, verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, I didn't look at Isaiah. I looked at Malachi. I could have taken you also back to Isaiah, but I didn't for sake of time. But this is how Isaiah put it. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, maybe I can clarify it a little bit and change the, preparation, uh, the preposition. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. Get ready for him. He's coming, see? All right? Make his path straight. In other words, let his ministry come to full fruition, like Romans 15, 8 said, that he could fulfill the promises made to the fathers. All right, now then, come on across the page to chapter 3, verse 11. Not only were they to recognize who Jesus was, but now they had another prerequisite. They had to follow this repentance with water baptism. Boy, that makes everybody smile, doesn't it? Nothing makes me better, feel better when I agree with water baptism. <laughs> well, for these Jews, it was appropriate. Of course it was. My goodness, I got time. Come all the way back with me to Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Because we've got to make all of this make sense. I'll never forget, it's quite a few years ago now, I was at a funeral. And as I was walking back to my car, one of the pastors in the community, he's going on to be with the Lord now. He was walking the other way, and he just yelled across the street. He said, Les, I watch you every morning. And I, I was shocked. I, and you don't disagree? He says, how can I? He says, you prove everything from the book. Well, that's what I like to hear. All right, now here's my take. Why did these Jews need repentance and water baptism? Well, I should have even gone one chapter further. I'm sorry, honey. Keep your hand in Leviticus. Go back to Exodus 19. Here's where it all begins. I'm sorry about that. But people who know how I teach, it doesn't bother them. So I hope nobody out there cares. Exodus 19, verse 6. Israel is just out of Egypt, gathered around Mount Sinai. And in chapter 20, God is going to give Moses the Ten Commandments. So we got the nation ready for the law. But before they give the law, look what God promises again. Exodus 19, verse 6. And you, the nation of Israel, you shall be unto me a kingdom. See? A kingdom with a king but there to be a kingdom of priests. Every Jew a priest of Jehovah. Not just Levi. Every Jew was going to be a go-between. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, now come back to Leviticus. If they're going to be a priest of Jehovah, like the Levites, what are they all going to have to go through? Water washing. 
Now Leviticus chapter 8. Verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron. Now he was the first high priest, if you remember. Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. Gather thou all the congregation together to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. All right, now then, verse 5. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Now this is the first time. See, this is the beginning of Israel's religious history. Verse 6. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and what? Washed them with what? Water. And that was the whole idea of preparation for the priesthood. Now, as Judaism went up through the years, then you see, it just became a ritual where the priests would be constantly washing, 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 see, in the water. In fact, one time Iris and I were down, way down in the lower parts of ancient Jerusalem, and we had an archaeologist guide, and he was showing us what they thought had been the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Seven bathrooms. Seven. But they weren't just bathrooms, they were ritual baths. For what? That constant cleansing, cleansing, cleansing. All right, so now then, got one minute left. Come back to Matthew 3. So if Israel is going to be a nation of priests, what is every Jew going to have to use as an introductory rite? Water. Baptism. See? And that's the way it's translated in the book of Hebrews. Washings. Washings. But the Greek word is baptizo. See, so the two are synonymous. When you wash, you baptize. When you baptize, you have a, a uh, symbolic washing. All right, so just quickly now, and then we've got to wind it down. Where John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with water? No, with the Holy Spirit and fire. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon and uh, for another session of four more programs, and we just trust that the Lord will use this for His honor, for His glory as we open up the Scriptures and... Uh, we trust that people can just come back and see what this book says rather than just sit there and listen to denominational dogma. Now, I've got nothing against the local church, nothing, providing that they proclaim the truth. And uh, that I have to stand on. Uh, I can never agree to have people just constantly be fed from some of this liberal stuff that is coming in so rapidly. And so we just beg people to uh, get back into the Word. In fact, I think I quoted several programs back from the fellow who was president. I, if I remember right, it was Syracuse. Back in 1888 to 1892 was his term as president. And at that time, he made the statement. Now, you want to remember, Syracuse is as liberal as they get today. But at that time, the president of Syracuse said, unless Christendom comes back 
back, back to the doctrines and the epistles of the Apostle Paul, it is that or on and on and on to liberalism and atheism and despair. And it's just as true today as it was then. And uh, we do. We have to constantly fight the false teaching. And uh, now there is a movement abroad called the Emergent Church. And it is as false as a $3 bill, but it sounds so good that the younger generations fall for this stuff, see? And uh, so we just have to adamantly dig in our heels, come back and say, but what does the book say? All right, we left off in our last program, then over in book 75, starting book 75, the first four programs. And uh, I think I will just share it with my whole television audience, uh, our beloved Sharon, who most of you see right over here on my left with the red hair, is uh, fighting a brain cancer. And uh, we just covet the prayers of everybody from coast to coast on her behalf. All right, so back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is just after his 40 days of being with the 12 or the 11. And uh, the next event, of course, will be his ascending back to glory. But just before he leaves the 11, these are his final words. Verse 8, and this is where we closed in our last program. But you, speaking to the eleven, never forget, the scripture has to be determined who is speaking and to whom. Well, here we have Jesus, of course, speaking to the eleven. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you, which was, of course, a reference to Pentecost, ten days ahead. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem... And in Judea, which, of course, was the area of Jerusalem, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we pointed out then in the last program that they got to Samaria, but they never did get to the uttermost parts of the earth. The twelve have absolutely no scriptural record of going to the uttermost parts of the earth because, of course, Israel's unbelief. And the nation continued to reject and reject and reject, as we'll see someplace along the line this afternoon. And at that point in time, then God turns to the Gentile through the Apostle Paul. But until that time, we're still dealing with the 11, who will soon be 12 once again, and the nation of Israel under the covenant promises. And that's what I'm going to show now in the next few moments, that we still have not left the scenario of Christ's earthly ministry. You know, I like to put it this way. The four Gospels are just an extension of the Old Testament. Nothing has changed except that the Messiah has made his appearance. Israel is still keeping temple worship, synagogue worship. They still have no intent of going to Gentiles with anything. It's their religion. And so nothing changes except that Christ has now made his appearance. All right, now after we go through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and he ascends back to glory now in the next few verses, you continue on in the book of Acts and nothing still changes. That doesn't sound right, does it? Still nothing changes. Maybe that's better. Still nothing changes, except now it's in the hands of the twelve to perform the signs and wonders and miracles to yet convince the nation that this Jesus who has just left their midst was indeed the promised Messiah. That's the whole scope of Scripture until we get to the Apostle Paul. The coming Messiah, the coming kingdom. And when when he comes, believe who he is. This is the promised one. But they couldn't. And so he went through the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, now we're going to see then that after he ascends, nothing changes. It's still the same format. The one you crucified is alive and is still able to be the king. See? All right. So they don't go to the uttermost parts of the earth because Israel has rejected the Messiah who would have made it possible. So catch that that they'd never got any further than Samaria. 
All right, now then, verse 9. Now we move into new ground. Now remember, we're still connecting dots. Jerry just asked me. I said, yep, we're still connecting the dots. We started in Genesis. Now this is just a review for a lot of people. But for a lot of our new listeners, it's hopefully new and enlightening. So we're just going to connect the dots as we come up through Scripture now in an overview. And so when he had spoken these things, while they beheld... While the eleven were standing there watching him visibly, physically, bodily, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven. Now don't just read over that. Just stop and think of that for a minute. Put yourself in those guys' shoes. There they stood aghast, having just spent 40 days with him, having a hard time comprehending how he could slip through a wall, go from Jerusalem to Galilee in a split second, and yet sit down and eat fish with them. And all these things, I'm sure, were just boggling their mind, and yet they were afraid to say too much because the Lord would put them down. Oh, ye of little faith, what's the matter with you? And now to have this experience, he's standing there visiting with him one minute, and all of a sudden, like a rocket, he takes off. That's enough to shake anybody's shoes, isn't it? But that's what happened. And so there they stand, watching him go up, see? And at the same moment, miraculously, angels appear beside them. And so while they're standing there looking up, behold, two men stand by them in white apparel. They're angels, but they appear as men. And these angels, verse 11, they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? Now watch the next statement. This is what all of Christendom has been waiting on now for 2,000 years. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. What does that mean? In that same body with which he just now left. In that same physical form. He's going to return once again. See? All right? And he will come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. All right, now let's just go back for a moment to John's Gospel, chapter 14, where again most of Christendom has completely inverted the meaning. They have twisted it all out of shape. John 14. At the time of the Passover, just before his crucifixion, All got it? John 14, starting at verse 1, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, start at verse 1. Those very familiar verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, what? Come again. Now, see, most of Christendom that believes in a rapture tries to make this rapture language. This isn't a referral to the rapture. This is a referral to his second coming, when he's going to return to the nation of Israel in fulfillment of the Old Testament promise. The church hasn't even been revealed yet. God, Paul's gospel of grace hasn't been revealed yet. And I'm always stressing to people who can't believe in a rapture, it's because you won't read Paul. Paul alone teaches a rapture of the body of Christ. Because Paul alone reveals the body. Paul alone gives the gospel for the body. Paul alone gives the Christian walk for the body. And so Paul alone refers to things concerning the rapture. This is his second coming. Again, take my old rule of thumb. Who's speaking? Jesus. Who's he speaking to? To the twelve. 
See? And so leave it in that setting. He's still dealing that after he's ascended, he's going to return to that same Jerusalem from which he left. So these mansions aren't ours. <laughs> I remember years ago, a lady said, you took away my mansions. No, I didn't take away anything because these mansions are probably tense compared to what we're going to have. We don't know what we're going to have. Do you know that? And you know why? I think if God would even just give us a little tip of the iceberg of our eternal destiny, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. It's going to be so far above and beyond human comprehension that God has seen fit not to give us one word. All we know is that our eternal abode is going to be, what's the word? Glorious. That's all we know. All the other references are to the kingdom, the earthly kingdom, as is this one. Now, my own personal approach here is that the father's house, so far as Israel was concerned, was the what? Well, the temple. And the priests had rather sumptuous apartments in the temple complex. And so what Jesus is really telling them that when he returns and the millennial temple appears, these 12 men are going to have sumptuous mansions in the temple complex. It's not talking about us, the body of Christ. All right, now then, let's go all the way back to tie this. That's all Jewish, remember. These are all pertinent to the nation of Israel and their prophecies and their promises. Come back to Zechariah. Most of you already know where I'm going. Chapter 14. And see, then all of this fits. That when the angel told the eleven, this same Jesus, as you have seen go into heaven, will in like manner come again. That's not the rapture. That's the second coming. Nobody but Paul speaks of the rapture. See, now I'm repeating myself. I have to. My, I get letter after letter. Let's keep repeating. Luther was the best one that ever did it for me. He'd been coming here for years. A while back, what'd you tell me, Luther? Hey, Les, today I saw this for the first time. <laughs> well, he's not any less intelligent than anybody else. That's just the way Scripture works. And all of a sudden, it just comes to the top, and you see it, see? So I have to keep repeating and repeating and repeating. All right, Zechariah, chapter 14. We'll just start at verse 1. The tribulation, see? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. That's the tribulation. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. In other words, all the ramifications of the war and destruction. Verse 2, God says through the prophet, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, that's what we call Armageddon. And the city, Jerusalem, shall be taken. The houses rifled. And the women ravished or raped. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. In other words, Jerusalem is going to be under tremendous invasion. Now, when it looks like there's no hope for Israel, then you got verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, that's the fulfillment of all the... the descriptions of his second coming back in the earlier prophets. Now look at verse 4. Most of you have seen this over and over through the years. Some of you never. But here is the absolute Old Testament parallel with John 14 and Acts chapter 1. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day, now, is that some kind of an invisible cloud? Well, clouds don't have feet that I know of. But no, it's that resurrected body returning after it left in Acts chapter 1. And so in his second coming then, when he returns, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. See, so you know it's the same Mount of Olives from which he left in Acts chapter 1. One. All right, now let's flip back to Acts, and hopefully I've made my point there. And so this same Jesus, in verse 11, shall so come in like manner, have you have seen him go 
in the heaven. Now that's as plain as language can make it. He left from the Mount of Olives. He went up head first toward heaven. But the angel said he's going to come back and stand on that same place on the Mount of Olives at his second coming. We don't know when it'll be, but we feel we must be getting closer and closer every day. All right, so now the Lord is returned to glory. He's told these 11 men to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the day of Pentecost, which is going to be 10 days down the road. But in this 10-day period, Peter is all shook up with one tremendous item on the agenda. That's the best way I can put it. The number one item on their agenda was what? Fill that spot left open by Judas. All right, we're going to pick it up right here. Verse 15. In those days, that is in those 10 days between his ascension and the day of Pentecost, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of disciples, verse 15, and he said, there were about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, who was guide to them that took Jesus. For he, Judas, was numbered with us, had obtained part of this ministry. And now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity. Remember the 30 pieces of silver that the priest gave him. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out, and was known unto the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch that the field is called in their proper tongue, Alkadama, that is to say, the field of blood. All right, now here's the verse I want you to see. Verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, and he quotes, let his, Judas's, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop Rick, in other words, his role as one of the twelve, let another take. Now that's what the Psalms prophesied. Now what have I said over and over and over through the years concerning prophecy? If the book says it, it's got to happen. Nothing can ever take away a prophetic statement. So you see, Judas had to fall, Matthias had to be brought in in his place. Why? Because the book said so. And always remember that, that anything written in prophecy, I think I said it in the last taping, if I remember right. When Isaiah said that the Babylonians were coming, and he made it sound like it was going to be next month, how long was it? hundred years. But it happened. See, Christ's birth was foretold specifically at least 500 years before it happened. But it happened. And how does Paul put it in Galatians? Now, when the fullness of time was come, my goodness, it was hundreds of years that had been promised. But the day came, and when the fullness of time was come, what happened? God sent forth his Son made of the woman, made under the law. So always remember that these theologians today like to throw away 90% of the Old Testament prophecies as if it can't happen because Israel is no longer a nation. That's what they're trying to tell people. And they're succeeding. My people are falling for it. In fact, that's one of my concerns of this very thing that's taking place in Annapolis right now. Too many of those people in government are of that replacement theology if they know anything. What does that mean? They don't feel that there's any concern for those Israelis in the homeland of the Jew because they're not Jews anyway. Well, what a lie. Because this book says that they will come back and have their homeland, as we've seen happen, see? So again, let me emphasize, if it's written in the Old Testament and God says, I will... You mark it down, it's going to happen, see? All right, so here again, prophecy was fulfilled. Judas betrayed him for the 30 pieces of silver. Now Peter picks up the agenda, as I call it, 
And let's just go through it quickly. Verse 21. Wherefore of these men, now get the setting, we're in that 10-day window between Christ's ascension back to glory and the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit will come down. 10 days. All right, in this period of time then, Peter says, Wherefore of these men, out of that 120 over there in verse 15, Wherefore of these men who have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. Now, remember, these are the qualifications for filling Judas' spot. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing, there are good men who have in the past, and probably still do today, said that Peter was totally out of sync. He should have waited for Paul. Paul would never fill this requirement. Paul wasn't saved until 13 years or so after all this took place. This says the candidate has to have become a believer during John the Baptist's ministry. Now watch for these things, see? This is what makes Scripture so thrilling. And so this candidate must have been a believer beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up, which was just a couple days ago. It had to be someone that had been a believer all through his earthly ministry as these other 11 had been, see? And one must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So out of that 120, there were at least two men who filled that. They had been believers all through those three years. And so the one was called Joseph Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and the other one was Matthias. All right, now out of the two then, they what we would call, they drew straws. And Matthias was the chosen one. All right, and so they gave forth, verse 26, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. Now, that was a God-ordained thing, because how did Moses come to conclusion back in the Old Testament economy? With the stones in the breastplate, didn't he? The human and the thuman. And he'd pull out those stones, and however they turned up, that was God's decision, not Moses. And so the same way here. They used a, t a system that we probably still use today. How they cast their lots, whatever they use. Whether it was a dice or whether it was a short stick and a long one makes no difference. The right one was drawn according to God's design and it was Matthias. And then the last half of the verse says it all. He was numbered by God's ordination he was numbered with the 11 to bring them back to 12. Now, I always like to do this just to help you realize how accurate Scripture is. Why in the world was Peter in such a hurry to fill this empty slot? Well, you remember, I think we got time. Come back with me. This, this bears repeating because very few people know these verses are in their Bible. Believe me, I can tell from my mail. I show things that people have never seen before. Come back to Matthew 20, 19. Matthew, yeah, Matthew 19. Now, these guys were just as human as we are. Don't think for a minute Peter had forgotten all about this in a matter of months. This is still fresh on his mind because Jesus speaks this just shortly before his crucifixion. All right, Matthew 19. We've looked at it before. Don't think I don't know that. I'm repeating. Verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we, the twelve, what are we going to have? Verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me, just like he said in Acts, from the very baptism of John until the resurrection day, you who have followed me in the regeneration, in other words, when the kingdom comes in, and the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory as king of kings and over that earthly kingdom, you also 
shall sit upon 12 thrones, not 11, 12 thrones, judging or ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, do you think Peter forgot all about that? Well, of course not. But they've only got 11 men. But how many thrones? 12. So what do we need? We need the 12th man. See, that sounds like Texas A&M, doesn't it? We need the 12th man. So the first thing on the agenda before even Pentecost is to get a replacement for Judas, and it's Matthias. Now, the 12 are in place. Everything is ready now. They can look for the Lord to return at any minute like he said he would. They had no idea it was going to be 2,000 years. They all thought it would be within their lifetime, and they would enjoy the kingdom, and they would have their spot in the 12 thrones ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's uh, one of the minor things of, of prophecy, but nevertheless, it just shows that everything fits. Psalms prophesied that one would be a betrayer, and on the other hand, everything was all set so that they could replace him with... Matthias. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have you all back. You've all had your break time, and we're going to go into the second half hour now this afternoon. And again, for those of you on television, in case this is your first time and you're just clipping through and you wonder what in the world, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, that blackboard is what gets people's attention, not me thankfully. It's the blackboard. And uh, then they come back and have to see what it's all about. So we're glad you're with us. And again, we always like to thank you for your letters. My, how we enjoy our mail time. All right, Iris wants me to keep plugging our one and only book because we don't want them to sit out there in the warehouse. And uh, it's 88 questions and the answers from past programs. And uh, everybody... Uh, Seems to enjoy it, especially the younger people. So uh, we want to keep reminding you of that. All right, we're going to keep right on going where we left off with what we've been calling connecting the dots. We didn't mention it in the last program, but we just sort of decided to start at Genesis, and just as they like to say lately, you just connect the dots, how everything fits from cover to cover, even though there are changes in the program, and uh, we're covering that now as we come to the Apostle Paul. And after Paul's conversion, and he spent the three years in the desert, and as we saw in our last moments of the last half hour, he came back now to Jerusalem, only spent a couple weeks with Peter and a few of the others, and then his life was threatened again, as usual. And so he fled up to the hometown of Tarsus, up there in what is presently southwestern Turkey. But now we're going to pick up back in Jerusalem once again, or at least Joppa, with Peter. <coughs> And uh, the whole thing is so providential, but most people miss it. Because, you see, Peter is still the Jew's Jew. He has no time for Gentiles, which was appropriate at that time. And uh, how shall I put it? Yet God had to let Peter know that now something different was taking place. He was going to go to the Gentiles, Peter or no Peter. And so this is what we're going to pick up now in chapter 10, that we have to, or the Lord has to show Peter that he is now going to offer salvation to the Gentile world. Now, you've got to know your Old Testament to realize that Israel was never instructed to proselyze or evangelize 
the Gentile world. They were to keep it to themselves. They alone were under the covenants, and they would have their opportunity at some time in the future to bring Gentiles, but certainly not yet. So this whole idea of Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius now is primarily not just to save those few Gentile Romans, which is appropriate, but more importantly, to show Peter that now he was going to do something totally different. And I maintain, had Peter not had this experience, <clears throat> when they came together in the Jerusalem Council in 51 A.D., which would probably be about seven, eight years after this, no, it's 12 years after, I'm sorry, Peter would have never agreed to let Paul and Barnabas go back to their Gentile ministry. They would have squashed it right there in Jerusalem. So as we look at this event now with uh, Peter and Cornelius, keep that uppermost in your mind that this is God's way of showing Peter that he was now going to do something totally different. All right, Acts chapter 10, we'll start reading in verse 1. And there was a certain man in Caesarea, just up the coast from Jerusalem. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion or an officer of the band called the Italian band. A devout man. In other words, he was religious, contrary to most Romans who were pagan. But he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his house, gave much alms. He was certainly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A philanthropist. <laughs> he gave to those that needed and uh, prayed to God. Now, most people think that makes him a believer. No, that's most of the human race, see? And still he's as lost as a goose, is the way I usually put it. And uh, consequently, he was in need of salvation. And this is where God is going to start now, so far as the Gentile world is concerned. All right, now this Cornelius then, in verse 3, saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, which would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he saw an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and we looked on him, he was afraid... And he said, What is it, Lord? Not recognizing that it was an angel, but whatever. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa. Now you've got to know your uh, Mideast geography. We're down at that southern, or, yeah, the southern end of the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, it's a little further south of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem today, to Joppa. All right? Send a man to Joppa and uh, look for one called Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, that is, of the Mediterranean, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest do. Now, we're not going to take all this verse by verse. We've done this before when we taught the book of Acts, and uh, especially for those of you out on television watching the daily program, we're back there, just finished Acts and Romans, so this is all just a real recent review for you. But anyway, now then, when uh, Cornelius is ready to send someone down to find Peter, the Lord, again, in his own way of doing things, also deals with Peter down there at Joppa. And uh, verse 9, On their morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, that is, the emissaries from Cornelius up at Caesarea, when they were on their journey and they drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which is noon. And he became very hungry. It's lunchtime, as we call it today. And he would have eaten. But while they, probably the women folks, while they were making ready, he fell into a trance up there on the housetop. And he saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending on him as there had been a great sheet knit, knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. And in this sheet were all manner of four-footed beasts, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, which means it was mostly unclean stuff to a Jew. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, I always stop right here. Why does Peter say what he says? He's a law-keeping Jew. He's not about to eat any of this stuff that was not part of the clean animals. And so Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, that's all I want to see here is that we are dealing with Peter the law-keeping Jew. But you know what happened. Finally, uh, the Lord got through to him, 
And uh, Peter, of course, gives in to the Lord's leading. And about at the time he's agreeable, here come the people from Cornelius. And they meet him at the front door. And so now we'll jump down to verse 23. So then he called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter, Peter went away with them. Now we know from chapter 11 that he also took six fellow believing Jews with him for a total of seven. Boy, I was just interesting, reading an interesting book last night on numbers. You know, it's just amazing how this Bible is put together with numbers. It's just unbelievable. And of course, that's what makes it so supernatural. But anyway, Peter Lee leaves with them, and they... Uh, Verse 24, the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, had called together his kinsmen, his relatives, and near friends. So we have a house full of people. How many? The Bible doesn't tell us. You can use your own uh, good sense. Remember, it's a Middle Eastern home, so it certainly wasn't commodious enough for dozens and dozens, but there could have been 12, 14, 15, maybe 20 people. All right, now we come down to verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. See, now there comes that pagan background. And uh, Peter, verse 26. Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in through the front door, found many that were come together, and now Peter gets... Kind of shaky. Peter is getting a little bit worried. And I can understand why. Because, you know, when, when religion has a hold on you, it, it's, it just controls your life. And Judaism was a religion. All right, now look what happened. When he sees all these Gentiles, probably a lot of them military people, he said, you know how that it is unlawful. See how clearly this shows Peter's legalism? Peter says, you know that it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, you see how plain that is? That was the mentality of the nation of Israel, rightly. Because that's what God had instructed from the very beginning. Have nothing to do with these pagan, idolatrous Gentiles. They were a separated people. All right, but now, you see, God has to show Peter that he's going to make a break with that kind of mentality. He is going to go to the Gentile world. All right, so he says it's an unlawful thing for a man as a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean because every human being is now going to be a candidate for this glorious gospel that will be coming from this other apostle. All right, verse 29. Therefore, I came unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. And then Cornelius rehearses his uh, experience with the angel and how the Lord had told him to send for him and so forth. And uh, now then, verse 33. Winding up Cornelius' little speech, he says, Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, that is, to Peter, <clears throat> and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. In other words, Cornelius says, We're hanging on every word that you're going to be telling us. All right, so Peter now begins to unfold who Jesus of Nazareth really was. See? All right, verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Now, never lose sight of that. Up until this time, God's word had never gone to anybody but the nation of Israel. Oh, there may have been an occasional proselyte, but I always remind people, what did Jesus say about proselytes? Why, they were more the children of hell than the proselytes that they won, see? But anyway, verse 36, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed the devil, for God was with him. And were witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. All right, now the point I'm going to make here, and this is what so many people cannot understand, Peter is not proclaiming that death, burial, and resurrection as the means of salvation. It just isn't in here. He is establishing a fact that even though Israel had crucified their Messiah, shed his blood, he had risen from the dead, he had gone back to glory, but as we show here on our timeline all the time, so far as Peter is still concerned, this was all simply a matter of something or other that he couldn't comprehend, but I think they understood that the atoning blood had now been shed. Consequently, the ascended Lord, in short order, after the seven years of the tribulation, they understood that, he would be coming back and still bringing in the kingdom, and it would all happen in their lifetime. They had no idea. I can't keep repeating it. I can't help but repeat it. They had no idea that this was going to be opened up into a 2,000-year period of history. This was all supposed to happen in their lifetime, see? All right, now let's read on. don't want you to lose the thought. Verse 39, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up and showed him openly. Now verse 41, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now watch as I'm saying, not a word of salvation attached to this. It's just a statement of fact. Verse 43, to him, to this resurrected Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. A word about the blood? A word about his death? A word about his resurrection? Nothing. Now, do you see that? The world can't see that. They, that. Like I said in the last program, they try to tell me that Paul preached the same thing Peter did, and Peter preached what Paul did. Peter has no conception of what we call salvation through the work of the cross. All Peter still understands is who he was. He was that promised Messiah. And Peter says, I don't care what happened to him. He's alive, he's in glory, and he's ready to come back and still fulfill the promises. That's what I want folks to see. And if they would believe who he was, even these Gentiles, they would receive the remission of sins. All right, that's the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that's the same message that Saul of Tarsus was saved by. Saul didn't have an understanding of the work of the cross when he was saved on the road to Damascus. All he recognized was who this Jesus of Nazareth really was. That's the kingdom gospel, see? All right, now then, when these Gentiles, these Romans, when they heard that, they were so open to it, because after all, this is God doing something beyond the normal. He's got to open the door to the Gentile world. He's got to show Peter that these Gentiles are going to be saved without going through all the ramifications of temple worship and law-keeping and repentance and water baptism and the whole bit. They're going to be saved by faith even though it's not yet Paul's gospel. See? All right, so while, verse 44, while Peter yet spake, he hasn't even finished. And here comes the evidence of the believing of these Gentiles. Do you see that? So while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. Why? Because they were believing it. See? With childlike faith, they were believing what Peter was saying. And God responded by showing the proof of their faith, which was common for especially that day and time, gave them the gift of speaking in other languages, verse 45, and they of the circumcision who believed, in other words, Peter and the six men that came with him, they were, now what's the word? Astonished. And what does that mean? They couldn't believe their ears. What in the world? What's happening? These pagan Gentiles are receiving the same kind of a response that we got of Pentecost. But they had to believe it. 
God had saved them. And that was the confirmation of their saving faith. And so out on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? For they heard them speak with languages. Tongues is the word, but I think a better word is languages. And magnify God. They were praising him. They meet. You know, this is what thrills us in the ministry. The other day I had a phone call. I can sometimes not remember whether it was a phone call or a letter. But a lady, now here's a phone call. She had been raised in a home absolutely destitute of anything spiritual or biblical. She said, we didn't have a Bible in the house. My parents never believed in God. They never went to church. Consequently, we kids didn't either. And she said, I went on into my teen years with that same mentality. Never had an interest in the things of God. Never questioned about him. She said, I married somebody pretty much of the same thinking. And she said, I went into the workaday world. And for years, she said, that was my life. No concept of God or eternity or anything. And then she said, one week I was home with an injury of some kind. She couldn't go to work. And she said, I was just flipping through the channels. And she said, I accidentally caught your program. Well, she said, it struck an interest. And she said, I watched every day for about two weeks. She had taped it after she went back to work so she could watch it when she got home. And she says, after two weeks, you just happened to put the plan of salvation on the program. And she said, I was saved instantly. And she said, from that time on, my whole life changed. My husband became a believer. Our home life changed. All because of believing the gospel. See, now that's the whole idea of Scripture. As soon as these Romans believed what Peter preached, even though it wasn't yet our gospel of grace, it was still the word of God. And God responded by just giving them an open heart to believe and to show the evidence of it. Now, of course, I can never teach chapter 10 without going back to chapter 2. And those of you who are with me all the time, you would probably get tired of me doing this. But I like to compare Scripture with Scripture so that we see what a drastic difference between what happened here in this Gentile house from what happened on the day of Pentecost back there in Jerusalem. All right, and that's back at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And all I ask people to do is just use common sense and compare words with words. English with English, see? You're not comparing oranges and apples. We're comparing what took place over here at Pentecost with the Jew to what took place in the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles. And look at the complete inversion in the way God dealt with them. All right, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, here is Peter and his appeal to the nation of Israel on the day of Pentecost. Verse 38, Repent, Peter said, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and... Next step, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now look what happens in the house of Cornelius. Just compare the process. Verse 44 again, while Peter was yet speaking, he hadn't even stopped to make any kind of an invitation or an explanation. He is still in his message of who Jesus Christ really was. And the Holy Spirit fell on these Romans as an indication of their believing. And then these Jews just couldn't possibly comprehend what was taking place. But they understood that it was something real because they too spoke in languages and tongues just like they did back on Pentecost. But what hadn't they done yet? They hadn't repented, they hadn't gotten baptized. But they were believers. You see the difference? Plain as day. Now, of course, Peter, in an afterthought, said, well, now, wait a minute. We missed it somehow or other. We should have baptized them first. But he didn't have a chance, see? God was way ahead of him. And so these Gentiles became believers by just simply believing. No repentance. No water baptism. Nothing. 
Isn't that amazing? All right. So this is the whole concept now then of Peter going to the house of Cornelius. If you'll come back to chapter 10 of Acts. If you're not, why come back now with me a minute. And uh, now I just drop down in chapter 11. Because I get so many questions on things in the book of Acts. And my stock answer is, you cannot use Acts for doctrine. Acts is an historical record of moving from Israel to the Gentile world. And there are so many things in here that get confusing. And when people try to use Acts for doctrine, they get all fouled up. They get all this other stuff that has no business being in our uh, faith system today. And so I repeat it over and over. Don't use these things in Acts as doctrine and say, well, this is what you have to do because this is what Peter said. This is what you have to do because this is what happened here because it just doesn't smooth out. Paul is going to take a Jewish vow. Paul is going to baptize. And as I'm going to show you now in these succeeding programs, as soon as we get out of all this transitional stuff in the book of Acts. Then we get into Paul's epistles, and then everything starts leveling out. But all right, back to our period of time with Peter yet, in uh, now chapter 11. And remember, the basis of all of his operation is the Jewish church in Jerusalem, which is still all kingdom ground. All they've understood was who Jesus Christ was. Verse 1, chapter 11. And the apostles, the other eleven, other than Peter, the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, that is Jerusalem, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they who were of the circumcision, that is this Jewish church, including the other eleven apostles, contended with him. My, they just called him on the carpet. Peter, what in the world were you doing in a house full of Romans? See? We have nothing to do with those people. All right? Verse 3. And they don't quit with the fact that he went up there, that he went in, and on top of everything else, he sat down and ate unclean food with them. Peter, how could you? See? And so... Verse 3, they said, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised. That was bad enough. But then you sat down and ate with them? Now, do you get the picture? They couldn't comprehend something like this. Now, when Peter comes back and rehearses all that happened, you see what God is doing? He is opening up the thinking of these Jews now to the fact that God is going to go and save Gentiles, not by bringing them into Judaism as proselytes, but he's going to save them by faith and faith alone now, not in just who Jesus was, but what Jesus has done. And that is the work of the cross. And that's where all the difference of the world comes in. And that's what sets Paul's ministry apart from Peter, as different as daylight is dark, even though they're dealing with the same Christ, yet Peter is dealing with the Christ of the earthly ministry, proclaiming to be the Messiah of Israel, and Paul knows nothing, as we're going to see in the next program, nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. All right, now let's just come down a little bit more in chapter 11. And verse 4, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and he expounded it by order of them saying, and he rehearses the whole story. And uh, that kind of settles them down. But that doesn't really change their overall thinking because we're going to see later, if not today in our net of taping, we're going to see that when these Jerusalem Jews hear about Gentiles coming into salvation by way of Israel's God up there in Antioch, they're going to get all bent out of shape, just like they are here. And they're going to, again, take steps to root out any of these false teachers who could possibly think about bringing Gentiles into a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so as you see this in the book of Acts, just constantly remember the Jewish mentality that it was still all Jewish 
that Israel was alone the recipients of God's covenant promises. And on the other hand, we're getting ready to accept the fact that God is now going to go to the Gentile world without bringing them into Judaism. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to have everybody after your break again, and we are going right back in where we left off because these minutes go too fast, and I only get a complaint once in a while. Don't make announcements. You haven't got time for that. So we will. We'll just go right back into Acts chapter 11, and Peter has just finished rehearsing with the Jewish believers of Jerusalem his tremendous experience up there at that Roman house in Caesarea. Military people, no doubt, and how that God just instantly saved them the moment they believed Peter's message, which was that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. He was the Messiah. All right, now then, remember, Acts is transitional. And so far, except for the little interlude of Paul's conversion to chapter 9, it's been all Jews and Peter. And now, all of a sudden, we're going to see a change from Israel, and the Jews, to Paul, and the Gentile world. And we'll almost hear nothing more from Peter except maybe in chapter 15 when Paul goes up at the Jerusalem Council. But Peter fades off the scene and uh, becomes a non-entity, and Paul comes to the fore. But this is the beginning of the transition now. They've had all this uh, persecution up at Jerusalem because of Saul of Tarsus and the attending religious Jews. And now when you come down to verse 19 of Acts 11, now they who were scattered, see? They who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch up there in north of Lebanon in Syria, <clears throat> now watch the remaining part of the verse. Preaching the Word, which would be the Old Testament. No New Testament is written yet. Preaching the Word to none but Jews only. Now why is that so hard for people to comprehend? Because that's the way it was. It would have been totally a Jewish thing coming out of the Old Testament. Christ's earthly ministry, as we showed in the first moment of the first half hour today. What did Jesus tell the twelve? Go not to the Gentiles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, we go through the whole death, burial, and resurrection, and Christ ascends back to glory, and Peter and the eleven hold forth now on the day of Pentecost. It's all Jewish, not a word about Gentiles. It's all hanging on who Jesus was because of the Old Testament covenants. All right? And so it's no different here in verse 19. These scattered Jews are still only approaching fellow Jews about this Jesus of Nazareth. All right, now verse 20. Some of them, some of these believing Jews coming out of Jerusalem, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene who when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Grecians, a lot of your translations, some of them should say Greeks. Now, I think the reason is there's such a small difference between the Greek word for a pure Greek and the Greek word for a Jew who was from outside the land of Israel. And one is Hellenes, and the other one is Hellenus. 
And so I think what happened here is we have a, a change in the translators because as one translator that I read quite exclusively says, there wouldn't have been anything unusual talking to fellow Jews who were merely from outside the land, but what made it so alarming, they were now approaching Greeks. And that follows what just happened up here in chapter 10. Here's the transitions. All right, so I like to read it that way. That now, these, when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto Greeks, Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now remember, they cannot preach death, burial, and resurrection until we get Paul coming on the scene with what he had learned in his three years in the desert. It's still all based on the kingdom economy. It's still all who Jesus of Nazareth really was. All right, now verse 21. The hand of the Lord was with him. It's all part of God's design now to take this out to the Gentile world, see? And the hand of the Lord was with him, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Greeks. Now, like I told you in the last half hour, when the Jewish system up at Jerusalem heard some of these things, they got all shook up. Why? This isn't supposed to happen. This is our God. This is the God of Israel. This isn't the God for those Romans. And now here we got the term Greeks. And so again, Jerusalem's all shook up. Get the picture, see? When tidings of these things, what things? Gentiles are responding, see? And so when tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, the Jewish church. They sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Well, for what purpose? Barnabas, go up there and find out what's going on. Straighten things up. This is going to ruin our religion. We can't have these Gentiles coming in. And so that's the alarm. But you know what? I always make the statement... God always has the right man at the right place at the right time. Had they sent anybody but Barnabas, it would have just exploded. But good old Barnabas, see, next verse, 23. Good old Barnabas, when he gets up to Antioch, had seen the grace of God on these Gentiles, and he was glad, contrary to much of the mentality of the Jews, Barnabas was glad and exhorted them or encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, why would he make a statement like that? Come back with me. Keep your hand in Acts. We'll be right back. Go all the way up to 1 Thessalonians. And I've made the point over and over. I've been on the air so long now I can't help but repeat. <laughs> Just can't help it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, this, of course, is dealing with people up in Greece, north of Athens, at the city of Thessaloniki. But nevertheless, Gentiles were Gentiles in these days. They had all come out of abject idolatry and paganism. All right, so this is why Barnabas told them to adhere or cleave to the Lord because of what they'd come from. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 Verse 9, For they themselves, Paul writes, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. In other words, referring to people over in the rest of Greece who were just so commending of these Thessalonican believers. And so he says, What entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from what? Idols. See that? And that was true of all of Paul's converts, unless they were Jews. All of the Gentile world was steeped in idolatry and paganism, and the worship of the gods and goddesses of mythology had been ever since the Tower of Babel. That's where it all started. All you have to do is go back into ancient history, and old Nimrod just started the whole ball rolling of all of this false worship of gods and goddesses. And that's where these believers all had to come out of, see? All right? And uh, then verse 10. I'm going to have to use this one. And what would they do? They were to wait 
for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, we've got to remember, we're up now in Paul's epistles years later. And what is he reminding these Gentile ex-pagans to not only realize that they're saved, but to be ready for what? The rapture, because that's Paul's theme that all these believers are going to be suddenly translated. And again, Paul thought it was going to happen in his life. And so I'm not extreme in hoping that it'll be in my life. <laughs> We're that much closer, see? But this was the Pauline mentality that they were to wait for the soon appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to take them out before the horrors of that tribulation would begin. All right, back to Acts chapter 11. We got to finish the transition. Now we're coming away from Peter and uh, the preaching of everything under the kingdom economy to the nation of Israel. Now, before the gospel of grace kicks in, God is still saving people on that kingdom basis that Jesus was the Christ. Don't lose that. God's sovereign. He can do anything he wants to do. And if he wanted to save Saul of Tarsus by simply recognizing who he was, that was his prerogative. If he wanted to save centurions in the house of Cornelius on believing that Jesus was a Christ, that's his prerogative. And the same way here. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. All right. So now then, reading on in Acts chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 24, coming back to Barnabas again. So Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. See, that's why he could sense what was going on. And he was full of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord up there at Antioch in Syria. <clears throat> now, I love this next verse. Then departed Barnabas for Tarsus to seek who? Saul. Why? Why should Barnabas all of a sudden get the idea, well, i got to find Saul of Tarsus? Hey, this is how the God works. The man is full of faith. He's full of the Holy Spirit. So he's a man God can use. Now, how God caused the man to go, your guess is good as mine. But nevertheless, somehow or other, God let Barnabas know that now what's taking place, the influx of Gentiles into all this, now we need that apostle of the Gentiles, the sent one for their benefit. Now, keep your hand in Acts and go ahead to another verse. Go to Romans chapter 11. I've got to back up what I just said. That Saul of Tarsus, who we now know as Paul, was the designated apostle, singular, of the Gentiles. That's what the book says. It's not my idea, it's Scripture. Romans 11 Verse 13, Romans 11, verse 13, where he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, For I speak to you Gentiles. See that? Watch every word when you read your Bible. For I speak to you Gentiles, Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. And that's why we got to adhere to that. Oh my goodness, I read the best little book the other night. I wish it's too hard to read. The average person, I don't think, would just struggle through like I had. I had to go back sometimes and read things a second time. But anyway, it was just an unveiling of the history of Christianity. How many Pauline believers were there down through the last 1900 years? Few or many? Precious few. Precious few. Because you see, most of Christendom, beginning with the so-called church fathers, Oregon was the worst. They all pushed Paul out the back door, and they taught nothing but the Old Testament and the four Gospels. All the way down through history. Even the Reformation didn't make that much difference. Because, as this author put it, author's name wasn't even on it, so I can't give him credit, but as this author put it, for example, in the Crusades, 
when they slaughtered people by the thousands in the name of their religion. Where did they get the biblical authority? The Old Testament slaughter back there in the book of Judges. Have you ever read Judges? Oh my goodness, it's enough to turn your stomach. How they were just slaughtering them by the thousands, see? Well, they used that as their biblical authority then to do it in the name of Christianity. And then you get the so-called Puritans and the pilgrims of our New England early days. They weren't much better. They were so legalistic, like I shared with my class the other night. In their legalism, if a young 17-year-old girl would share a, a show a bare ankle, what would they do to them? Beat them almost to death? They were heartless in the name of religion, see? And you bring it right on up until today. Now we've gone the other direction. Anything goes and still be Christian, see? But you see, when you get into the Pauline part of it, it's a whole different world, and most of religion was constantly trying to stamp them out. If they heard of a, of a bunch of these conservative biblical Christians in some valley, they'd seek them out and kill every one of them. And that was most of history for the last 2,000 years. All right, so it's the same way even here, you see, that uh, Paul has to be recognized as the one and only true apostle or Christ's representative of the Gentile world. And people don't like that. All right, back to chapter 11. So verse 25, after he goes up to Tarsus and he finds Saul. You know, and I always make the point, he didn't just know exactly where to find him. He had to look. He had to ask a lot of questions. Where is this guy? And uh, so he finally finds him. Now verse 26. And when he had found him, Barnabas finds Saul. He brought him to Antioch. Because after all, Antioch is where Gentiles are becoming interested in these things of Israel's God. That's the best way I can put it. Now, you've got to remember, there is still no New Testament. Nothing. Only thing they have is the Old Testament. And this gives rise then to why they had to have gifted men in those early years who by a gift of the Holy Spirit could teach these things that Paul had been revealed of first so that error would not creep in through the spoken word. They had to be gifted. They had to be Holy Spirit led because there was no written. Now once the written word comes in, you see, then those gifts were no longer necessary. All right, back to verse 26. So when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, or this called out assembly now then of primarily Gentiles, and taught much people. God is opening the hearts of these pagans left and right. And the disciples, or these followers, were called Christians, as first, I suppose, the derogatory term, those people who think they're Christ-like, but in other words, the title stuck, and we still refer to believers as Christians to this day, although I don't use it as much because too often it's not a true definition. But anyhow, that's where they were first called Christians, the Antioch. Okay, now I think I got 10 minutes left yet in this half hour. Let's go ahead now and uh, to verse 1 of chapter 13. Now, Paul and Barnabas have been laboring amongst the Gentiles in Antioch, which was probably one of the most lively cities in the whole Roman Empire at this time. It was pretty much the center of the then known world. It was a large city. It had a tremendous amount of, of uh, commerce as well as it was a religious center for the worship of Diana. But anyway, after a certain period of years have gone by now, and we get up to Acts chapter chapter 13, and we are now probably around 40, 44 A.D. Now remember the crucifixion at Pentecost 29, and I always put Saul's conversion at about 37. Three years in the desert, that starts out when he goes up to Tarsus at about 40. So about four years later now, after they've been laboring there in Antioch amongst the Gentiles, now verse 1. Now there were in the church, or that assembly, that was at Antioch, 
prophets and teachers. Now you remember, we've got about four years of time have gone by. And Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now these were all men who were leaders of that Antioch uh, congregation. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now here again, the Antioch leadership didn't decide to send them out. This was a God thing. The Holy Spirit, one way or another, revealed to the men of this Antioch church that now it was time to get Paul and Barnabas out into the Gentile Roman Empire with this glorious message of the grace of God. All right, so now we can just pick it up then. Uh, oh, let's see. They go up first to the island of Cyprus. And uh, I'm going to bring you down to just one verse here. I think you all know the account how that as they ministered to the governor of the island, there was a false teaching Jew who was a sorcerer, and he was attempting to keep this Roman, probably a Gentile anyway, from letting Paul and Barnabas minister to him with the plan of salvation. All right, so he's doing everything he can. Verse 8, But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name interpretation, withstood them, that is Paul and Barnabas, seeking to turn away the deputy, the governor, from the faith or from believing. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and mischief, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of righteousness, wilt thou not cease, or will you not stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now here comes Paul's authority as an apostle. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun, now here's the key, for a season. Not for the rest of his life, but for a period of time, this false teaching Jew is going to be physically blind. Now, I take that as a type or a sign that the nation of Israel as a whole is going to experience the same thing. That here they were opposing, especially Paul and Barnabas now in these uh, Gentile cities, and it was always the Jews that opposed them the most because they were, of course, defensive of their religion. That's understandable. But nevertheless, because of their constant opposition to this, God has blinded the nation. And to this day, they are under a, a blinding. All right, let me take you ahead. The Romans. I think it's chapter 9 or 11. 11. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 11. From the pen of the Apostle Paul. Oh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> I guess just for sake of time, otherwise we won't make any headway at all. Let's jump in at verse 7. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Because I just want you to see that the Scripture makes so plain that Israel is going to be spiritually blinded, not for the rest of their life, not until the nation of Israel dies or disappears, but for a period of time. All right, what then? Verse 7. Israel, the nation, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. What were they looking for? the Messiah and the kingdom. See? But it didn't happen because of their unbelief. It's still going to happen. They're yet going to have it. Don't think for a minute they won't. But in this interim, they are judicially blinded. All right, read on. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election are those few who did believe. They obtained it. In other words, they've entered into salvation and they're going to be in glory with the rest of us. But what happened to the major part of the nation? They were blinded. Judicially blinded. 
Now, don't ask me where God can remain fair and do that. But nevertheless, it's a fact of Scripture that the nation of Israel has been nationally blinded. Now, individual Jews can still come in and be saved, absolutely, and we get our share of them. But the nation as a whole, and I've always made reference, you take the nation of Israel over there. They have a form of godliness, but is their government righteous and godly? No, it's as secular as any government in the world. They have just as much corruption as anybody else, see? They're in a period of spiritual blindness. But now, while you're in Romans 11, you might as well go on to the next verse that speaks of it, verse 25. And here's where I get the authority, biblically, to teach this period of time. Now we can drop down below Israel's timeline because that was going to take them all the way to the promise of the kingdom, but God stopped it. The tribulation hasn't happened yet. I don't care what some people say. We're not in the tribulation today. It hasn't happened in the past. It's still future. But God broke the timeline right there, and now we drop down into here. Now we're in this parenthetical period of time. Israel has been set aside. Israel is spiritually blinded. And God is pouring out the gospel and his mercy and grace upon the whole world with this glorious gospel based on the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what we're going to be looking at after we get out of the book of Acts, how that Paul will then go to the Gentile world with that glorious gospel of grace. But all right, here's where I get my authority to open up the timeline. Why do I put in a parenthesis? Well, here it is, verse 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this Mystery. Now, we're going to be using that word a lot in the coming programs. That you should be ignorant of this mystery or this secret. And what is it? Lest you should be wise in your own conceit. In other words, don't get puffed up that the Gentiles have all got it made and God's through with Israel. See, that's what a lot of people are trying to tell us, that God's all through with Israel. Don't you believe it. God is not through with his covenant people. Next statement. That blindness... A spiritual blindness, in part for a designated period of time. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. But, oh, praise the Lord, what's the next word? Until. See? There's coming a time when that blindness is going to be lifted. That blindness, in part, for a period of time has happened to Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Well, what's the fullness of the Gentiles? The body of Christ, which we're going to be looking at hopefully now the next half hour. The body of Christ, this composite group of believers from every walk of life, from every part of the globe, that have all been saved by trusting this finished work of the cross and becoming in Christ, in the body, and when it's complete, it has to be taken out of way so that God can finish with Israel. And that's what the verse says. See? Plain as day. Read it again. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until. And what's the until? When the body of Christ has been fulfilled, it's full, it's at its uh, time of fruition, however you want to pull it, and God has to take it out of the way because the body of Christ will not fit in any part of God's dealing with Israel. We're insulated from all of that. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.
Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, program number four, and uh, I'm still on two feet. So uh, we'll just uh, see where the Lord takes us in this half hour. And again, we'd like to always thank our television audience for your prayer support, your financial uh, you'll never know what it all means. Now again, my little wife is the one that's the promoter of these things. I'm going to put it on her shoulders, but she wants me to keep reminding you that this Q&A book is still available, and uh, we send it out with any postage or handling for a flat $11, and uh, that's it. All right, we're going to keep right on going where we've been, and we're connecting the dots, and we've been coming all the way through, and we got to the Saul's conversion, his time out in the desert, how he came back, and uh, God's in control of everything. And now we're making the transition from God dealing with Israel and all the Israeli covenants. And now we saw that Gentiles were getting interested up there at Antioch. And then from the Antioch church, four or five years later, Paul and Barnabas begin their first what we call missionary journeys. And as a real result of those missionary journeys, of course, Paul established Gentile churches throughout the area of Turkey and Greece predominantly, which was the major part of the Roman Empire. So I'm going to take you now up to the result of his ministry among the Gentiles and one of his letters, 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to start reading in chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Now, of course, this isn't the earliest letter, but uh, it's earlier than some. <clears throat> verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. Have you heard anything like that in the Old Testament? Have you heard anything like that in the four Gospels? Not even in John. But see, the world can't see that. They just refuse to see it. My goodness, I get a call every once in a while. Unless you make too much of Paul, I'm following Jesus. Well, that's all well and good, but listen, Jesus doesn't give you the gospel. It wasn't time for it. And so we have to constantly be reminded that all of this is in God's divine purposes, that yes, coming out of the Old Testament, everything was Jewish. He came to fulfill the promises. And through divine purposes... Israel rejected him, crucified him, brought about everything that needed to be done for this gospel. But now here we have a whole change in direction. God did not let Paul have uh, the 12 influence him. He had to be totally taught something totally different. And he's going to be re referring to it over and over as the revelation of the mysteries. And we're going to be looking at this for the next several programs, so get ready. The mysteries. And in the Greek, it's mysterion, which is also translated secret. So all these things that have been kept secret in the mind of God are now going to come from the pen of this apostle. Now, that's why I'm always reminding people, don't go back to the book of Acts to get your doctrine, because Luke wrote Acts, and Luke is not the apostle of the Gentiles. It's that simple. Luke was simply the instrument that God used to record that transition. He wrote the gospel, but you see, Luke is not the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is. And so we have to constantly come back to Paul's apostleship. Now I'm going to run right ahead of any criticism and comment by showing you now, if you're going to condemn me for making too much of Paul, then I'm going to say, then you don't know your Bible. Go back with me to 2 Peter. And I'm reminded as you look, a lady from one of our western states sent me a clipping 
out of her newspaper. And it was a letter to the editor, of course, and evidently some pastor had written a letter to the editor where he had emphasized some of these things from Paul's epistles. And this letter, oh, wow, you, you talk about a mouthful of venom from start to finish. Just venom of the hatred for the Apostle Paul. And what an idiot he really was. How he got kicked out of Greece. He got kicked out of Turkey. He got kicked out of Jerusalem. See? And so the lady that sent me the article wrote across the top of the page. She said, now I see what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. Yeah, they do. They just can't stand the man because they don't like his doctrine. See? All right, but now look what Second Peter tells us concerning this apostle that everybody thinks shouldn't even be in our, not everybody, but a lot of people think shouldn't even be in our Bibles. I haven't even found it myself yet. Second Peter, chapter 3, and those of you who have been with me now over the years, you know where I'm going. Chapter 3, verse 15. <clears throat> so I'm putting this up front so that you get tempted to call me or write me and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I can't follow this Paul bit. Well, then you can't believe what Peter says. Look what Peter wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit at the end of his life few weeks and he'll be martyred. But look what he's leaving with his Jewish listeners or readers. Account. Understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him from the Lord, has written unto you. Now, isn't that plain? Peter is telling his Jewish listeners, now if you want salvation, the kingdom gospel has dropped away. It's disappeared. Now if you want salvation as a Jew, you better go to Paul's epistles and get this gospel now for the age of grace. A Jew can't be saved today by just saying, I believe that Jesus was the Christ. That's not enough. He has to believe exactly as we do. All right, now look at verse 16. And this is where so many of our Christian leaders are as also in all his epistles. Now, I think in verse 15, he's referring to the letter of Hebrews. I don't get adamant if people don't agree, but that's what it seems obvious to me, that he had written the book of Hebrews. But, now Peter says, not just the book of Hebrews, but all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. See, there's Peter's legalism. And which they that are unlearned and unstable twist, as they do also the other scriptures. Now, what does that tell you? Paul's epistles are scripture. Don't ever let anybody tell you Paul's epistles don't belong in our Bible. Peter says they're scripture. And that's good enough for me. They are the Word of God. And they're directed to you and I as Gentiles primarily. And then, of course, all Scripture. Paul writes it himself that all Scripture, Genesis through Revelation, is inspired of God and is it profitable. Absolutely it is. But you will not find body of Christ's truth outside of Paul. It's just not in there. It's all good background. It's good all foundation. But so far as understanding God's program for us today, it has to come from this man's epistles. All right. So now then, back to the verses that I just read, because uh, I want to go back to the board. Yeah, it's here. I want to go back. Now remember, everything of this Old Testament prophecies have stopped cold. The tribulation didn't come in. The second coming hasn't happened. But instead, we've been now 1,900 and some years in this dispensation of the grace of God, which is all part of the Pauline writings. Next program, I'm going to put a circle down here. If Sharon's able to be with us, I'm going to have her put a circle. And we're just going to call it the body of church age truth. This body of Christ. And all of Paul's doctrine. In fact, I like to put it this way when people call on the phone. 
if by virtue of what may happen, if we were to lose our Bibles, if they were to be confiscated, if we could somehow, before they took our Bible, slip out Romans through Philemon, would we have enough to get by? Yes. We'd still have enough to get by. Because, you see, within the Pauline writings, we have the plan of salvation. We have the Christian walk. We have our hope for the end. Now, what more do you need? That's where all of the real meat for us today rests. Now, all the rest, as Paul said in Romans 15, all the rest is for our learning, to get a better understanding of how all of this has been going on since the creation of Adam. But to really get down to the nitty-gritty of being ready for eternity, we can find that if we just can keep Romans through Philemon, because it's all in there. But now, upon the other hand, if they took away Paul's epistles and we were left with what was left, we'd be in tough straits. There would be no real presentation of the gospel. There would be no real way to walk the Christian life. There would be no real hope to suddenly be translated because it's not back there. See, All right, so now then, if you'll come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again, here is exactly how Paul puts it. He wasn't sent like a John the Baptist with the instructions to baptize. All his commission was preach the gospel. See? All right, let's move on. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. It's a supernatural thing. See, that's why... Good people cannot be saved by their works. Good works cannot bring in the supernatural power. That takes a response to the gospel. And then, yes, God moves in supernaturally. We become a new person. We get new, new desires, new ambitions, and everything is totally different. Okay, now then, let's just take a little time here on these early verses in Corinthians. Because it's one of, like I said, one of Paul's earlier letters. It was written even before Romans. I think Galatians might have been written before, and we'll come back to that in our later programs. But now reading on here in 1 Corinthians. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, or the intellectual. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or the argumentative individual in this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now, whenever you read something like that, I hope you know your Bible well enough that you can, in your mind at least, just flip back to what could Paul refer to. Come back with me again to the book of Acts. Chapter 17. And this is exactly what he's referring to. And it's not that much different today. My, somebody would just share with me at break time again. How the religious leaders of our beloved America are turning their back by the, by the hundreds against the truth of your word, God's word. And they're coming up with all these foreign ideas. It's coming in like a tsunami. It's just unbelievable, except we know that it's the end time. And we know that the apostasy, the falling away, is upon us. But all right, look what Paul encountered up at Athens. Chapter 17, let's just go down to verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. And now while Paul waited for them at Athens, now remember they've been up to Philippi and they've been coming down the coast. They've stopped at Berea and Thessalonica and so forth. But now Paul has gone on ahead alone evidently and is waiting at Athens. His spirit was stirred in him. He just got shook up, we'd say today, 
when he saw the city of Athens holy or completely given to what? Idolatry. Idolatry. Can you imagine what that must have felt like that every place you went, there was pagan temples, there were pagan idols, and the pagan immorality was everywhere. Things that are so evident, I don't even want to mention on this program, but we see it when we're on our uh, tours and stuff. It was everywhere. And it just, I suppose, broke his heart. See, it just stirred him. All right, now verse 17. Therefore, because of all this, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And I imagine the chief conversation was this very thing. Well, how, is, how can you as synagogue religious Jews, how can you function in the midst of all this idolatry and all this immorality? See, I imagine he called them on the carpet. I, I think that's what he's doing. Now, verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics that were groups of intellectuals in this day. And when they encountered him, and some said, well, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setteth forth of strange gods. My goodness, they had thousands of them. And yet they couldn't quite comprehend what Paul could be talking about with the one God of creation. All right, he seemeth to be setteth forth a strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the what? The resurrection. That threw them a curve. They had never heard of such a thing. To the Greek philosophy, to the pagans, you died like a dog and it was all over. Now, when they would talk about uh, an eternal life or something like that, they weren't talking about it in the terms that we do. They felt that when you left offspring, they would just continue your lifeline and so it would on into time immemorial. But they had no concept of actually dying this body in death and then have a resurrection to come beyond them. They'd never heard of such a thing. All right, verse 19. And so they took him, that is Paul, brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. So they've got an interest. They could have pursued it, but they didn't. They didn't want to. They're no different than people today. They may take a, a, a temporary interest, but no, I'm not interested in any of this stuff. See? All right. All right. Now verse 21. For all the Athenians, the rank and file of the whole city, and the strangers, the people that were there as tourists or as business, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They knew there was something out there that they didn't know, and so they're willing to listen to anybody and everybody. But now the next verse, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill up there on the Areopagus, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive or I understand that in all things you're too superstitious. What's the core of religion? Superstition. Superstition to one form or another. Just stop and think about it. Why was it Lenin who said that religion was the opiate of the masses? Yeah. Why? Because that's what religion does. It just puts them under the thumb of superstition, and these religious leaders can control them. So old Lenin knew if you had to get them out from under religion, then he could get them. One thing was as bad as the other, but see, that's what religion does. And this is exactly what Paul was confronting. All the superstition of their religion. Enough done? Yeah. Okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians for the few moments we have left. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, through their intellectualism, they didn't know God. But on the other hand, God, in what seems foolish, 
it pleased God to save people who believe, even though it's so simple, instead of being complicated and intellectualized. Verse 22, for the Jews, Paul says, the religious Jews require a sign, and the Greeks, the intellectuals, like he had just confronted at Athens, and the intellectuals seek after wisdom. How many degrees do you have? Where did you go to school? Have you been to Alexandria? <laughs> See? All right. And then verse 24. No, 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Not a ton of intellectualism there. The simple fact that Christ died on that Roman cross, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews. He was a stumbling block. They couldn't believe who he was. They couldn't recognize that he was the creator of everything and then nailed to that Roman cross. If he was the creator, why didn't he call down legions of angels? See, that was their thinking. If he was who he said he was, all he would have had to do was cry out and God would have saved him, but they couldn't comprehend that this was something that had to be done in God's economy. All right, reading on. And unto the Greeks, with all of their education and all their intellectualism, it was a bunch of foolishness. But unto those who are called, that is, the believer who has responded to God's offer of saving grace, Unto those who are called, whether they be Jews and Greeks, it's Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now I just got to keep going. I was going to break there, but I got to keep going. Now verse 26. For you see your calling. Now stop a minute. Paul is not writing to a class of seminary students, is he? Who is he writing to? The rank-and-file Corinthians. Probably some longshoremen, probably some farmers, probably some merchantmen, common people. He's not, he's not addressing a seminary situation. So that's why it brings it all right down to our level, see? So he says, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not from the upper crust, the elite as we call them today. No, not many of them have an inkling of what this is all about. They're not called. But who does God call? He chooses the foolish things. You know, I'm always referring to the plowboy in England. <laughs> I think I've got a trademark there. And I hear it over and over because it just hits home. The word of God was intended to be understood by the average plowboy of England in 1500. They didn't even have high school education in those days. But was the word of God understandable? Absolutely. And that's what this is telling us. The Word of God isn't just for the elite. It isn't just for the highly educated. It's for the least of us, see? All right, so he's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things that the world in general looks down on. That's what he's chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. And why? so that nobody can ever brag in God's presence, I'm here because of who I am. won't fly. It won't fly. And so we have to enter in as nothing but hell-bound, lost humanity, but God can save us and make us fit for his eternity. All right, now then, verse 30. But of him... You are in Christ Jesus as a result of your saving faith, who of God is made unto us by virtue of our faith. It's imparted to us now to understand his wisdom and righteousness 
sanctification and redemption, that we've been bought with the price, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. All right, now in the two minutes I have left, I think I'm going to take us back to Romans chapter 16. And this is what we're going to be hammering on now for at least the next four programs in our next taping, and maybe even eight of them. I don't know yet how long it'll take. But we're going to be hammering away at the fact that everything that was revealed to this apostle had been kept secret in the mind of God until revealed to him. And see, that's what Christendom will not accept. They want to feel that Paul is just sort of an addendum. He's just been added to that which really counts. And they can't get the concept that in this body of truth, what we call Paul's revelations of things kept secret, is where everything rests for us today. All right, you got Romans 16, and with this we'll be able to close. Verse 25. I've used it for the last 30 years, and I've asked seminars from west one end of this country to the other. Have you ever heard a Sunday morning sermon on this verse? Have you ever seen it taught in Sunday school? Never. Never. And here's why. They don't like what it says. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, and remember, crucified, buried, and risen again, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, this body of truth that's been kept secret and now revealed to this apostle, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since Jesus' ministry? No. Since Peter? No. Since when? Since the ages began. None of the Old Testament writers had any inkling that this was out there in the future. You know, I think the last time we were here in the taping, I showed how that Peter says, the Old Testament prophets searched diligently. They knew there was something out there, and they couldn't get it. And it didn't appear until God revealed it to this apostle and instructed him to take it out to the Gentile world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody back, and uh, they've had their coffee break, and for those of you out in television, again, we're just an informal Bible study, and I always have to remind myself to tell you how we appreciate your letters, your prayers, your financial help, because we couldn't do what we're doing without it, and uh, we just know that the Lord is blessing it because of the response from our mail and our phone calls. Uh, whenever I got any of the office gals, I always just remind people, if you don't believe me, just ask them, <laughs> because they hear it all day long. All right, now, my little wife, again, bless her heart, wants me to remind our listening audience of this one and only book we've ever published. It's 88 Questions and Answers. But you know, in the last week, I don't know how many people have told me in their phone conversation they use these books as a mission tool 
They'll keep eight or ten copies in the car. You hear it too, Melissa? And they keep eight or ten copies in their car, and whenever someone shows a smidgen of interest, they give them one. And I said, man, that's even better than Iris and I do. We haven't done that yet, and I think we're going to have to start doing the same thing. You just carry a bunch of these along and just hand them out. And uh, I think some people order 20 at a time, don't they, Melissa? Yep. So uh, it's a tremendous tool because it's, uh, in plain language, it's not real hard stuff to understand, and uh, it does get the message across. All right, we're going to move right on into where we left off in our last program, and we're just connecting the dots. This is more or less an overview. This isn't a verse by verse, but uh, we just want folks to get an understanding how God has been dealing with the human race for the last 6,000 years, and now we feel we're close to the end. We don't know how close. It could be today. It could be another hundred years. We don't know because I've learned that God is eternal. Time doesn't mean anything to God, and His wheels grind slowly, but surely. As I've stressed lately, anything that Scripture says is going to happen, it's going to happen. You rest assured. All right, so let's just jump in now then at Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost has now come. Now, before we go any further, let's go back, honey, to Leviticus, because I think too many of our theologians who put the birthday of the church in Acts chapter 2, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why, because if you come back to Leviticus chapter 23, I think it is, yeah, Leviticus chapter 23 we have the seven feasts of Jehovah for the nation of Israel. Seven of them, beginning with Passover. And uh, we're going to just drop down and read from verse 15 on to show you how clearly and specifically this day of Pentecost started at the very onset of Israel's religious experience. The seven feast days. Earlier in the chapter, we've got the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and now when you come down to verse 10, I mean verse 15 in chapter 23. All got it? And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, or seven weeks, 49 days, shall be complete. But it doesn't stop at the 49th day. You go to verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number how many days? Fifty. What does Pentecost mean? Pente in... Latin means 50, see? So Pentecost was the feast of the 50th day. Clear enough? All right, let's just read on. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of the tenth deals, you shall be one, one shall be of flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. All right, now this is, go back to Acts chapter 2 then. This is the Feast of Pentecost, the 50th day after the Feast of Passover. And so that's why when the Lord was with the 12 or the 11 for 40 days, there was yet 10 days till Pentecost. And so in these 10 days that we talked about in the last program then, between the 40th and the 50th is when Peter had Matthias fill that 12th slot. And uh, again, just to show you that I was not remiss in saying there are a lot of people that think Peter was remiss and should have waited for Paul. At break time, one of our listeners just came up and said, yeah, somebody had just told him that in a Sunday school class the other day that Peter was in a hurry, he should have waited for Paul. But Paul would never fit the requirements as we saw last program. 
It had to be a believer that was from John the Baptist until the resurrection. And Paul doesn't become a believer until years later. All right, now then, as I come into this Feast of Pentecost, this chapter 2, and yes, it is the time when the Holy Spirit will come down, but there is not one word of Gentile language in these early chapters of the book of Acts. Not one word. It's all Jewish. It's just an extension of Christ's earthly ministry. The only difference is now that with the Holy Spirit coming down, these 12 men are going to be empowered with the power from on high to carry on the very miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus did. But for what purpose? The same purpose, to prove that the one who had died and been raised from the dead and gone to glory was coming back and would still fulfill all those Old Testament promises. Now, isn't that simple? Is that so hard to understand? The only thing that interrupted the whole thing was that which had to happen for the sake of the whole human race. Christ had to die. It had to happen. He had to be buried three days and three nights. And he had to be raised from the dead. Otherwise, everything would have fallen apart. But you see, with God, things don't fall apart. In the human understanding, it may seem like it has, but it doesn't. All right, so here we are now, right according to God's eternal purposes. The day of Pentecost has arrived, and the Holy Spirit is going to come down. All right, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, did, what did I say the last program? That when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Well, what does all this mean? God's timetable is never a day late or a day early. It's always on schedule because he's God, see? All right, so the same language. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, it wasn't the day early, it wasn't the day late, on the exact day, see? They were all with one accord in one place. That is, these 120 Jewish believers that you saw back in verse 1. You've got to remember who we're dealing with. That's all there were. After three years of signs and wonders and miracles, 120 believers in the area of Jerusalem. All right, and so they're all in one place. <clears throat> now verse 2. Suddenly, miraculously, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it, this rushing wind, filled all the house or the building with a room, wherever they were, where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire. Now there's the key word. If it had been fire, it would have singed their hair. But it didn't. But it was just two little tongues that appeared as fire resting on their heads. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all these I'm assuming now the whole 120, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, is a better word than tongues. They were all filled with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now the reason I'm using languages, I'm going to show you now in just a couple verses. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. See? No Gentile in that word. Jews. But ever since the Babylonian captivity, 600 years before, what had happened to the Jews of that day and time? Scattered. Thank you, Teresa. Scattered throughout the whole then known world. Just like they did more again after 70 A.D., after they had gone out into Babylon, instead of coming back to Jerusalem, like a few of them did, most of them had already scattered and had set up businesses and trades and everything all over the Roman Empire. But they were still devout Jews. Now, if they were devout Jews, what would they do? They would come back to Jerusalem for at least two of these seven feast days. They'd make more if they could, but a minimum was two. 
All right, so now then you have thousands upon thousands of Jews flocking into Jerusalem from all over that then known ancient world, which of course would be North Africa, the Middle East, and out into the Babylonian area, as we know now, Iraq and Iran and Syria, and then all along the Mediterranean on the north side to Turkey and Greece and Rome. See, that was all the civilized world at that time. And uh, they could make arrangements to travel. And here they came for these feast days around the temple complex in Jerusalem. But they're Jews, see? All right, they were devout men. Otherwise, they wouldn't take the time and spend the money to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All right? And they came from every nation under heaven. But they were Jews. Now, remember... 600 years is a long time. How many grand, grand, grand do we now deal with over generations? All right, now these great, great, great grandkids are no longer speaking the home tongue of Hebrew. They're speaking in the language of where they're living, whether it was Rome or Athens or Babylon or Egypt. Naturally, they had picked up the language of the land in which they live. It's no different today. My goodness, when people migrate into a foreign country, ordinarily, what's the first thing they do? Learn the language. See, that's why I'm upset with our situation today. My grandparents, I can remember them talking about it. What was one of the toughest things of coming through Ellis Island over there in New York? Language. And how people would make fools of them because they didn't know what they were talking about. I don't even dare tell you what some of the things they went through, but language. But what was the first thing they did? They learned English. So when I come along, my grandparents were still speaking German, of course, but their kids and their kids' kids were now speaking English. It was the same way here. So these Jews had been out of the Hebrew environment for so long that now they were at the fourth or fifth generation removed and they were speaking the language of their homeland. So what are they going to have to have? A common language. Oh, it's, that's the miracle of Pentecost. Okay, read on. Verse 6. So when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were amazed, astonished, because every man heard them, these 12 men, speak in their own, what? Language. So Jews from G Egypt were hearing the 12 in the Egyptian language. If they were from North Africa, they were hearing it in that language. If they were from Babylon, they were hearing it in Chaldean. And so was the whole crowd of Pentecost. Every Jew from wherever they'd come were miraculously hearing the twelve speak in their own language. That's what the book says. That's not my idea. It's what the book says. And why can't people believe it? You ought to read what some of these commentators say. That this is the beginning of the tongues movement. Are you kidding? No, this was language, see? All right, verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak the twelve now, remember, are they not all Galileans? Now, you see, the average Bible reader doesn't catch what's going on. Jerusalem was the elite. They were the educated. That's where all the priests and the rabbis originated. What was Galilee? Well, that was the frontier. They, they were rough, and, and they were uneducated. And my goodness, these uneducated men speaking 8, 10, 12 languages? Now, I'll never forget the first guy. Do you remember Eli when we first went to Israel? That fellow could speak fluently seven languages. That just blew my mind to have that level of intelligence to be able to have a busload of Americans today and tomorrow a bunch of Japanese come in and he says, no, I don't have any more trouble with the Japanese. 
happen to Eden than I do with you. Or he says a, bring, a bunch can come over from France. He could speak French. or uh, Seven languages. Well, it was the same way here. These uneducated fishermen speaking all these languages, what's going on? Now, that's easy to understand, isn't it? They were just as human as we are. That was the miracle of Pentecost, see? And they've twisted it all out of shape. All right, now verse 8, it's repeated. How do we hear every man in our own language? See? Wherein we were born, where we were raised. Then he lists them, Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites and all these areas of the then known world. And so, verse 11, it's repeated again. Cretes, Arabians, we hear them, the twelve, speak in our language the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, what meaneth this? Well, God had them exactly where he wanted them. They were thinking. See, and that's all I ask people when I teach. Think. Just stop and think. What is God trying to tell us? It's not that hard, but you've got to put a little effort into it. All right, so now then they come up with all their crazy ideas, but Peter has to stand up and he says, no, 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 no. You're crazy. They're, they're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But what you're seeing is what the prophet Joel spoke about several hundred years before Christ, prophetically. Now, Peter goes right down the line and quotes from Joel, I think it's chapter 3, word for word, and it's prophecy. And it was all, in their view, coming right down the pipe. Now I think we got the timeline back on the board. Here we go. See, we come out of the Old Testament with all these prophetic utterances concerning things to come. And in there, in veiled language that nobody really could comprehend, was, of course, the crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, the ascension back to glory, as we've already seen, Zechariah said that he would return. Well, he couldn't return if he hadn't left, right? And so that was all back here in more or less veiled language. And then after his ascension, after a little period of time, they didn't know how long in would come those final seven years, which would trigger the second coming, as we've already saw in the last half hour and he would return to Jerusalem, he would set up his throne room, and in would come the kingdom. Now, throughout all of this timeline, there was nothing revealed of this until we get to the Apostle Paul. Nothing, nothing of the age of grace. It's all based on Israel's prophecies. Now, Verse came to mind, and I lost it. It went in, and it went out. So I'll have to come back to it later. But anyway, now at the day of Pentecost, all they can think about is the tribulation is coming. They knew that, but it would be followed by the second coming. Now that, the, oh, I knew what it was. Come back with me to Peter. I have to look whether it's first or second. I think it's first Peter when I just made the statement that these Old Testament prophets had no idea of the things that were coming except that there was something. Yeah, First Peter, chapter 1, honey. I think I got time. I'm going to take a few more verses than I would otherwise. Come back to 1 Peter, chapter 1. Might as well start verse 1 first, because I always want people to understand my rule of thumb. Who's writing? The Apostle Peter. Who is he writing to? Jews, not Gentiles. All right? Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to put in the word writing just for sake of understanding. Writing, because that's what he's doing. He's writing. He's not speaking. 
he's writing to whom? Strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Were Gentiles scattered? No. Who was? Jews. All right, have I made my point? So the apostle of the nation of Israel is writing to his fellow Jews. All right, now come down to verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What's Peter talking about? Here we are. We're right in here. And Peter is writing to fellow Jews that with this horror of horrors out in front of them, they would be able to come through the testing, which would be like fire, and they would then visibly witness the second coming of Christ. So what did I tell you? They expected it within their lifetime. See? That's not so hard to understand, is it? Read it again. That the trial or the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Now, you know, I made the point in one of my seminars the other day. What's the one most important thing that God is looking for from a lost human being? Not his works. His what? His faith. See? That's all God is looking for. Can you believe me? All right, here it is. That their faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing they've already gone through the fires of... Now, another verse comes to mind. Can't help this. Hun Come back to Zechariah. Next to last book in our Old Testament. I think this is the exact parallel that Peter was referring to. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. Zechariah, next to the last book in your Old Testament, chapter 13, verse 8. And compare this with what Peter is just saying. All got it? Verse 8. And it shall come to pass. My goodness. What did I just say about a statement like that? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. We don't know when, but I'll guarantee you it's going to happen. All right, what is? That in all the land that is of Israel, saith the Lord, now watch this carefully, two parts therein, or two-thirds, shall be cut off and die. But the third part shall be left therein. They're going to survive. They're going to make it to the end. Now verse 9. God says, I will, there's the promise, I will bring the third part through the fire, the testing of the tribulation. Listen, no human being on earth understands what that seven years is going to be like. We can no more comprehend that than we can the glory of heaven. But it's going to be awful. All right, but one-third of Israel is going to survive. All right, I will bring the third part through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. See the connection? And I will try or test them as gold is tested. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Now again, to get the time element, here we are. Peter is talking to them, but the one-third are going to come out, and they're going to be right here at the end, and they're going to soon witness the second coming of their Messiah. All right, back to First Peter. Back to First Peter. Now verse 8. Whom, having 
not seen, you love. In other words, a lot of these believing Jews that Peter was addressing had already come in as believers, never having really witnessed anything of his earthly ministry. <clears throat> Whom though now you see him not, yet believing, in other words, with your faith, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, verse 10. Here's what I come back here for. Of which salvation? This salvation now based, of course, on who Jesus of Nazareth really was. Of which salvation the prophets, the Old Testament writers, have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you at some future day. Now verse 11, back to the prophets again, who were searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. All right, now in the 20 seconds I got left, what's that telling us? The Old Testament prophets knew this was coming, but they couldn't get the picture. They just couldn't understand how God would fulfill all these things. But he was back there, and see, now you and I, with our New Testament, we can understand Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you all back again. We'll start program number three for this afternoon. And again, we just like to invite our television audience to join with us. And uh, like everybody here, open your book and uh, get a pen and a notepad and take notes. Because uh, what you write, you're more apt to remember than what you just sit and say, yep, I'll remember that. No, you won't. It's, uh, that's why I keep reviewing. It takes a long time. You know, we were just rehearsing again at break time. How many times we have to hear these things before they really settle in. And uh, that's why I don't apologize too much for repeating. Now, I realize that all this has been covered before, but, you know, a lot of it has been several years ago, so it's about time we do hit it again. <clears throat> so, again, for those of you on television, again, we just covet your prayers, my, how we need your prayers, because uh, the devil doesn't like what we're doing. Now, that's all there's to it, and, uh, and we can witness that from time to time. All right, let's go right back where we left off, and uh, we're still in Acts chapter 2, and remember now, Christ has just ascended 10 days earlier, and uh, now the day of Pentecost has arrived the Jewish feast day, according to Leviticus chapter 23, and it's all Jewish. There's nothing of Gentile in here whatsoever. <clears throat> so now let's just come down to verse 22. Peter has just finished quoting Joel chapter 2 of the horrors of the tribulation, according to prophecy, and he gives it as though that's what Israel is looking for. He has no idea that it's going to be interrupted for 2,000 years. All right, so after rehearsing the prophecy from Joel, down verse 22, and again, I want to always emphasize, it's all Jewish. Ye men of Israel. There's no Gentile in that. Ye men of Israel, 
hear these words. And then he speaks of how <clears throat> Christ had been delivered up to the Romans for his crucifixion. And then verse 24, whom God raised up. Now you see, what is Peter already driving home to the nation of Israel? That that promised Messiah who lived and performed signs and wonders and miracles was rejected, was put to death, and was buried, but was raised from the dead, has gone back to glory, waiting for the day when he can come back. See? So what does Peter have to prove? Your Messiah is still alive. He is still going to fulfill those promises. Now, that reminds me of a verse that I used again just the other night, and uh, come back and look at it with me, so that you'll get the gist of this promised Messiah for Israel. Romans 15, verse 8. <clears throat> From the pen of the Apostle Paul, after the fact, and Paul is writing to us, Gentiles. And so it's for us to know how these things transpire. That's why I'm connecting the dots. It all fits, see? Like putting the puzzle together. Everything in its rightful place and it'll fit. All right? Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the what? Circumcision. Not the whole world. He was the minister of Israel. And Israel alone. All right? So he was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. And I always say, wasn't something Paul dreamed up. It was all part of God's sovereign plan for the ages. All right? So he came as the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Now, what was the purpose? To confirm or bring to fulfillment the promises made to the world? No, to the fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest of the Old Testament patriarchs were way back then already looking for this coming glorious kingdom on earth. Now that reminds me. I haven't used this in ages. I hope I can find it. Job. Come all the way back to Job. Where is it? It's in front of Psalms. I thought it was behind it. Job. My goodness, I hope I can find it. I think it's chapter 16 or 14. Job, it's in front of Psalms. Oh, my goodness. I might have, as I've said before, I walk into a buzzsaw when I try to find a verse and can't, but... Uh, just a second. If I can't find it, I'll just have to quote it from memory. But this is Job speaking. Okay, it is. 19. I was close. Job 19. Verse 25. Now this is one of the oldest books in the Old Testament, beloved. And look what Job was already looking for. See? Job 19, verse 25. Now, this ought to give you goosebumps. I get them every once in a while. My, when they call and tell me what is happening by using our DVDs, I either bawl or I get goosebumps. That's pretty typical. But here it is, see? Verse 25. For I know. I hope these guys get it on the, on the screen. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Didn't there yet. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand where? On the earth. See? I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, at the time of the end, 
upon the earth. Now, you can't get it any player it is. I want my audience to read it. Thanks, fellas. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, death, see, and he'll go back to the dust, yet in my flesh, what kind of flesh? Resurrected, I shall see God. Now, isn't that plain? Now, that was the hope of an Old Testament writer way, way back. But he had an insight that after this life of flesh, there is an eternal resurrected life on the earth. That's the part I want you to see. Not up in the ethereal heaven someplace, on the earth. And that's the earthly kingdom that every Old Testament believer was constantly looking for and waiting for. And here we've had 2,000 years of theology and they still haven't got it. Isn't it unusual? <laughs> they still can't get it. Well, anyway, some of them do. Don't worry, there are some. In fact, somebody sent me an interesting article off the internet the other day and I'm going to put it in my next newsletter. It was written in 1935. And as the gal said who sent it, lest you could have written this. And she said, it just proves you're not some weirdo <laughs> coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> but you see, most of Christendom just won't see it. But that's nothing new. I'm not the first nor the last. All right, back to the Acts chapter 2. So here we have now Peter addressing the nation of Israel with the primary message again that this Jesus of Nazareth that they had presented to Israel for three years with signs and wonders and was alive. He hasn't lost his ability to be the king, see? All right, so he's alive. He has been raised from the dead. And then he goes through some of the Psalms. Now, like I say, this isn't a verse-by-verse -verse study. This is just connecting the dots. All right, so now he goes back into the Psalms, and he quotes David. Verse 27. Quotes out of the Psalms. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, or the place of the dead, neither wilt thou permit thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now Peter says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried, just like Job, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. But, verse 30, why does Peter quote David? He was a prophet. See? Therefore, being a prophet. We normally don't think of David as a prophet, do we? We think him as the writer of the songs and the psalms and so forth. No, he was also a prophet foretelling future events, see? All right, so therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, the lineage of David, what would happen? God would raise up Christ Jesus of Nazareth to do what? To sit on David's throne, see? All looking forward to this glorious kingdom. Not a word in here about the body of Christ. Not a word about the church. It's all tied to Israel's prophetic promises. Okay, now then, verse 31. He's seeing this, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, his spirit, was not left in hell, or we know he went down into the paradise side, neither did his flesh see corruption. See? Because he was divine. He was not that much of the human. See, that's why God the Father was the the progenitor of the body of Jesus, and his blood was divine, and it was 
holy and not fit for corruption. All right, now then, verse 32, Peter again hammers the fact home that this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted because of that finished work of the cross, see? And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, this coming of the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost, which you now see and hear. He says, David is not the one who ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy phones thy footstool. That's Psalms 110, verse 1. In other words, David is prophetically speaking of the ascension of Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, and on some future day, he would leave that seated position and return to Jerusalem. See? All right, now then, verse 36. And oh, if only these people who demand water baptism, according to verse 38, could just read 36, but they can't. They can't read it for some reason or other. Evidently, it's blanked out in their Bible or something. But here it is. Therefore, let all the house of Israel. Any Gentiles in that? Not that I can see. Therefore, because of what Peter has just brought out of the prophets, Joel, David, and the Psalms, now, because of all those prophetic promises given to the nation of Israel for over a period of 2,000 years, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus of Nazareth, of Bethlehem, whom you have crucified, put to death, but he's still Lord and Christ. Death didn't stop anything, see? Now verse 37. Now when they, now don't forget, who is Peter preaching to? Jews from all over the then known world. Therefore, or I'm sorry, verse 37. Now then, when they heard this, what he had just been rehearsing. They were convicted in their heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, all 12, now remember, are involved in all of this, men and brethren, what shall we do? See? Not what shall we take by faith, what shall we do? do. Now remember, I could take you back. I haven't got time, I don't think. I could take you back to Exodus. And when God laid all this out in front of the nation of Israel, how did Israel respond? Tell us what you want us to do, and we will what? Believe it? No. We'll do it. What a difference. Today, Paul doesn't say, do this or do that. He just says, believe it. All right. Here's Israel, though. This isn't Gentile ground. This is God dealing with his covenant people. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Clear as language complaints can make it, but it's not for us. This is for Israel. Never does Paul use this kind of language. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, forgiveness, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's all the promises made to the nation of Israel. All right, now I've been stressing all the time that it's according to the covenant promises. Now let's just skip over quickly to chapter 3. Pentecost has come and gone. Time is going on. This isn't all going to happen in a week. Time has gone by. Now verse 1. But nothing has changed. Look where Peter and John go for the time of prayer. 
Now Peter and John went up together into the what? The temple. See? Does Paul ever tell us to go to a temple to pray? Does Paul ever tell us find a prayer chapel and pray? No. How does Paul in uh, how, yeah, how does Paul instruct us? I think it's in the book of Timothy. How do we approach God in prayer? Any place. Any time. Under any circumstance. The throne room is always open. You don't need to go to a prayer room. You don't need to go to a chapel. You don't have to go to some sanctuary. Your prayer room is wherever you happen to be. What a difference. But see, back here, that wasn't the case. They were still, according to Judaism, to go up to the temple or the synagogue in other cases, according to the hour of prayer that was designated by their religion. See? All right, then, of course, they come across the lame man, and you know the story of that. Peter says, silver and gold, I have none, but that which I have I give unto you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. I think he says of Nazareth. Yeah. Rise up in the name of Christ of Nazareth and walk. And then the Jews got all shook up again. How in the world did you do this? They knew the guy had been lame for 40 years. How did you do this? See? So now then, you come down to verse 12. And when Peter saw it, the consternation of the Jewish people over the healing of this lame man, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel and all you nations of the world. That's what people like to think. Not what it says. That's not what it says. Peter addresses fellow Jews. Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? Or why look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Verse 13, the God of Abraham. See? Takes them all the way back to the beginning of the Jewish race. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus. Now here he puts the dagger into the nation again, whom you delivered up and whom you denied in the presence of Pilate when he would determine to let him go. See, Peter isn't going to let Israel forget their rejection of that Messiah. But he wants them to be convicted of it, repent of it, and God would still still embrace the nation. He wasn't ready to cast them aside. And that's all Peter is trying to do, is get them to the place of repentance where they would yet believe who Jesus of Nazareth really was. And isn't it amazing that they never were convinced? Now, I know that may upset some Jewish listeners, and I've got a lot of them. I know I do. But you see, that's the record. That was the nation's unbelief, but that didn't mean that God wasn't ready and willing to forgive at the drop of a hat if they would just repent of what they had done nationally to their Messiah. All right, but Peter goes on to say then, see, that uh, they denied the Holy One and they killed the Prince of Life, but God raised him from the dead. See, they didn't stop the God of glory. He's still going to accomplish his purposes. Now then, verse 16. And his name. See, now that's what I've been stressing for the last several programs, that Israel's kingdom gospel was based on who Jesus was. See? That's all God wanted to recognize, that he was the promised Messiah. All right, so here comes Peter now, several weeks, maybe months after Pentecost, that it was through faith in his name. Now, I've said it more than once on the program. What does that really mean? 
that the name of Jesus of Nazareth was synonymous with God the Son and the Messiah of Israel. He was all the same person. Believe it. See? But oh, they couldn't. I think I said it here a few programs back. What was their stock answer? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, the Messiah did. But they couldn't buy it, see? Well, anyway. Verse 16 again. So it was his name, the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Through faith in his name hath made this man not a word about the work of the cross. Peter doesn't say, if you believe that Jesus died for you and shed his blood and rose from the dead, you'll be healed. No. All this man believed was that Jesus was the Christ. And as a consequence, he experienced miraculous healing. All right. Now verse 17. And now, brethren, Peter says... I know that through ignorance you did it. In other words, crucified the Christ. They didn't do it knowing who he was. They didn't. In fact, I think I've got time. Come ahead with me again to a statement from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I like to wait until everybody's found it. Then I can assure the TV audience can do the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, start at verse 7, where Paul now writes to us, Gentiles. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. In other words, in things that had never been revealed before are now made understandable. Even the hidden wisdom, things that Peter said the prophets, what? Diligently looked for and couldn't figure out. Now we got it, see? Now it all comes out. God reveals it. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world or the ages or the generations, time gone by, unto our glory. Now verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew. In other words, these hidden mysteries that Paul is now revealing, especially in his church letters, None of the patriarchs understood. None of the prophets understood. None of the leaders of Israel understood. None of the leaders of the Gentile pagan world had any idea of it, naturally. So none of the princes of this world knew. They did not know who he was. Then what does the rest of the verse say? For had they known it, had they known that he was the creator of the universe, had they known that he was the Son of God, would they have carried out that crucifixion? No way. But they didn't know. All right, now then, for the minute that we have left, come back to Acts chapter 3. They were ignorant of who he was, in spite of all of his signs and wonders and miracles. Now verse 18, got to do this quickly. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, see, like we showed in 1 Peter, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent therefore, be converted. Your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he, God, would send Jesus Christ, see, to be the king. It's still out in their future. But Peter knows in verse 21 that heaven must hold him until the tribulation has run its course. That's the restitution of all things. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to have to bring you all the way down to verse 24 and 25 to put the frosting on what I've been trying to say for the last 14 or 15 years. 
that Israel was the people of the prophets. Verse 24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold or prophesied of these days. Verse 25, You, Israel, are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. So Israel alone was under the covenant promises of God. We're outside, Ephesians tells us. We're outside the covenants of promise. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back for our fourth program this afternoon, and uh, we're going to just jump right in where we left off again in the book of Acts. But again, for those of you joining us on television, if you're just a new listener, and they happen every day, I guess, don't they, Melissa? Every day, new listeners, why we're just an informal Bible study. We're not associated with anyone. I'm just an independent layman, and I'm going to keep it that way. I don't want anybody to put strings around my neck, and I'm going to just keep teaching it the way I see it. And uh, if it gets to the place that the Lord wants me out of here, why, that's His doing. But anyway, we're not going to apologize. We're not going to try to compromise, nor will I attack. You know, a lot of people tell me all the time, well, Les, why don't you tell people what these guys are saying? No, I'm not going to do that. I trust that if people will just see what the book says, and with normal intelligence, you should be able to see the difference. And uh, that's been my premise. Okay, now Iris again wants me to let our television audience know we have one published book, and it is so well received, especially the college age. My, we get more comments from grandparents how their granddaughter or their grandson saw the book on the table, and uh, we're just intrigued by it. So it's, uh, it's something that's uh, 11 bucks, no postage or anything, just a flat 11, and... Uh, Maybe you can afford to hand a few of them out here and there. All right, I think that's all. We'll go right back. We left off in the book of Acts. We're going to go on into chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Now you remember in our closing statement, Peter is addressing Jews, and he's telling them up there, I had to hurry because time was running out, up there in verse 24 and 25. I want to repeat that for just a moment, where he says to these Jews, that all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold or prophesied of these days. What days? Christ's first advent, see, his death, burial, and resurrection. But it was in such veiled language, they couldn't understand what it was all about. All right, then he says, you are the children of the prophets... You are of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. All right, now I ran out of time in the last program, so I wanted to go ahead to Ephesians. So let's do that now a minute before we go into chapter 4. Come on up to Ephesians chapter 2. See, now this verse makes all the sense in the world that the Apostle Paul is writing to a group of Gentiles over there in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. We've used them quite often. 
But see, remember what Peter said? You, Israel, you're the children of the prophets. You are the ones who are under the covenants. Now look what Paul says about Gentiles. It just, just, just throws the 300-watt bulb on it. Verse 11, wherefore, remember, don't forget now, he's writing to Gentiles, that you, being in times past, your genetics, go back to the Old Testament economy, your genetics as Gentiles in times past, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by those who are the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. In other words, Jews would refer to Gentiles as uncircumcised. Now verse 12, that at that time, while God was still dealing like he is in the book of Acts with Jew only, that at that time you, Gentiles, were without Christ, no hope of a Messiah, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now here it is. Strangers from the covenants of promise. See that? Gentiles had no part in those covenants. That's why Jesus had to begin his earthly ministry right up front telling the twelve, go not to the Gentile. They're not under these covenant promises. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, if you just understand all that, it's so plain that he couldn't be anything to the Gentile world because he had come to fulfill the covenants. And Gentiles had no part in them. And Paul repeats it, see? That you Gentiles were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. He was dealing only with Israel. Well, what's the next verse? But now, see? But now, on this side of the cross, on this side of the cross, he now becomes the Savior of the whole world, not just Israel. In Christ Jesus, you who are at one time far off, you pagan Gentiles, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now salvation is open to the whole human race, not just Israel. But you see, Christendom is just determined to muddy it all up. Most people now call me now, use my own term, they're blenderizing the scriptures, and it does nothing but confuse. How can you understand something that's all blenderized? But sort it out that all these promises made to Israel were to the nation of Israel and not to the Gentile. And it wasn't until he went to the Gentile world that it opened up as a result of the work of the cross. Now, a verse is coming to mind. I sure didn't plan to do this one. Come back with me to John's Gospel. John's Gospel. Chapter 12. I haven't looked at this one for a long time either, so maybe it's appropriate. Here we have Jesus at the very end of his ministry. Again, the crowds are gathering for the third Passover at the end of his three years. And the whole temple complex is just packed with Jews coming in from all the areas of the then known world. But in this passage, we're dealing with a small group of Gentiles. We don't know how many. It's just like the wise men. Everybody says three. The Bible doesn't. We don't know how many there were. Well, same way here. Drop in at verse 20. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks. How many? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Two, three, four, five. Couldn't have been an awful lot of them. But there were certain Greeks, Gentiles, among, see? They were in the crowd that came up to worship at the feast. Now, they were probably just curiosity seekers. What are these Jews all about in all this massive crowd? All right. 
And they had been around Israel long enough to have heard of the miracle worker, Jesus of Nazareth. We can pick that up from what they're asking. All right, so these Greeks, in the midst of this crowd of Jews waiting for Passover to begin, verse 21, came therefore to Philip, who was one of the twelve, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and they desired, or they asked him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, this is one portion of Scripture. I like to have people just sit back and use a little imagination. Here you've got this crowd of Jews waiting for Passover to begin. And here are these probably pagan Gentiles who have been in the land long enough to have heard about all the miracles that this Jesus of Nazareth had been performing. So their curiosity was aroused. All right, so as they move through the crowd, use a little imagination. If you were looking for someone and you were in a total strange environment, what do you do? You ask questions. Now, I know I'm probably unusual in this regard, but the minute Iris and I are in a strange place and I feel lost, I pull in the first place that's open and I ask questions. Where am I? <laughs> Where do I go from here? That doesn't bother me one bit, rather than just keep going and going and be on the wrong road. All right, now, these men did the same thing. They started asking, Where is this Jesus of Nazareth? Well, somebody said, there's one of his followers. Go ask him. Well, it happened to be Philip, see? So they do. So they go to Philip, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now again, put yourself in Philip's shoes. Jesus had commanded, have nothing to do with Gentiles. Well, what are we going to do with these guys? They knew they were Gentiles. Do we take him to see Jesus? Is he going to put us down for breaking his commandment to have nothing to do with Gentile? So Philip is in a quandary. Now, there's safety in what? Numbers. <laughs> so what does Philip do? He goes and finds Andrew. Andrew, what are we going to do? These Gentiles want to see Jesus. And we know only too well he has nothing to do with Gentile. All right, so now the next verse. The two of them go and tell Jesus. Well, goodness sakes, the Scripture gives you enough intelligence to determine what are they going to tell him. There's Gentiles out here that want to see you. See? Now verse 23. So when they find Jesus and tell him that there's Gentiles, here's his answer. Bring them to me. That's not what your Bible says. He says, instead, the hour is come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. What's he talking about? The cross. It's just a matter of 72 hours at most. See? And he knows. And so he says, the hour is upon us when the Son of Man shall be glorified, which will happen at his resurrection. Verily, verily, I say unto you, now watch this. Most of you know this, but there are probably some out there that are new listeners that have never heard this before. And Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies. Now, if you've had eighth grade biology, what do we know? A seed cannot germinate and bring forth new life until it what? Dies. Death has to happen before new life can come. It's a fact of creation, see? Now, why do you suppose God created it that way? Because of the cross. That's the whole doctrine of the cross, that you can't have life until there's death first, see? All right, so he brings it into the biological world that a seed of corn or uh, of wheat can't fall into the ground unless it dies, it will abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth what? A hundredfold. What's he referring to? His own death, burial, and resurrection. 
and that he cannot be an object of faith to those Gentiles until he finishes the work of the cross. Up until that time, it's a Jewish thing. And that's why you find no reference to Gentiles throughout those early chapters of Acts. It's still based on the Old Testament covenant promises. But once the work of the cross is revealed to the Apostle Paul, then it becomes the life-giving salvation, not just for Israel, but for the whole human race. All right, back with me then to Acts chapter 3, and then verse 25. You are the children of the prophets again. I'm repeating purposely. We've got to drive it home. To Israel, this is what Peter says, you are the children of the prophets, the Old Testament. Let me repeat the subject. You are the children of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you First, see? Now, let's go back or go ahead. Keep your hand in Acts. Go ahead to Romans, chapter 1, verse 16. This is exactly why the Holy Spirit prompted to Paul write what he wrote. Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, verse 16, where Paul writes to us, see, not to the children of Israel. He's writing to the whole human race, but Gentiles in particular, Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And remember, what's Paul's gospel? Christ died for your sins, was buried, and three days later arose from the dead. That's Paul's gospel, all right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew, what? First, and then to the Greek. What does Acts say? God came to Israel first. All of Scripture fits, see? All right, back to Acts. Back to verse 26. I'm not ready to leave it yet either. Unto you first, according to God's divine purposes, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, the nation of Israel, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, had every Jew responded, what would have happened? Well, the tribulation could have come in and Christ could have returned and set up his kingdom and Israel could have evangelized the world. That was the Old Testament format. But they didn't do it. Now, this is where I like to make comparison with scriptures. For Israel, for things to happen Every last Jew had to respond. That's what it says, everyone. Now, when Paul goes to the Gentile world, what's the word? Some. That I might save some. Peter puts it, yes, we all know James at the Jerusalem Council. James says, yes, we now agree. In fact, uh, just go ahead. It's in Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 15, I'll let the scripture speak itself. Drop down to verse 13. Keep your hand in chapter 4. You'll be right back. Now drop down to chapter 15, verse 13. After the end of the Jerusalem council, and they now agree that Paul and Barnabas can indeed go to the Gentiles, not to win every last one, like with Israel, but here it is. Now, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, or Peter, 
hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them everyone, what? A people for his name. Just a small percentage. And then Paul does indeed, I think in the book of Romans, say that he wants to at least save some. So we don't have to expect a great outpouring of Gentiles into salvation. It's a relatively small percentage. But to Israel, he expected every last Jew to respond, which, of course, they did not do. All right, back to chapter 4. <clears throat> now, we're still dealing with Peter and the eleven and the nation of Israel, especially now the religious leaders. <clears throat> and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon. See, this is all Jewish. There's not a Gentile thing in here. Being grieved that they, the twelve, taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, they laid hands on them and put them in hold or put them in prison until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them, that is of these Jews now, who heard the word believed, and the number of them was about 5,000. So the numbers are growing, but it's still nothing compared to the whole. All right, now then in this next series of verses, we have the religious leadership calling the 12 on the carpet, and trying to shut them down from having any more of this Jesus of Nazareth. All right, now let's for sake of time drop down to verse 8, <clears> or <throat> verse 7. So when they, the religious leadership, had set Peter and the others in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, isn't it amazing? Now, here Jesus has just spent three years and Peter and the eleven have been, I think we're probably already three, four years after Pentecost, and still this religious leadership cannot get it through their head who this Jesus really was. Isn't it amazing? All right, so then verse 8. Then Peter, he's always the spokesman when we deal with the twelve. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, no Gentiles, all Jews. <clears throat> if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, the raising of the lame man, back there in chapter 3, and by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, let the whole nation understand that it was by the name, not the cross, not the shed blood, not the resurrection, but it would by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, <clears throat> even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Now, do you see where the emphasis is? On his name, on who he was. Not a word yet of salvation based on trusting death, burial, and resurrection. Now, granted, according to the eternal purposes, Christ had to shed the atoning blood coming out of the Old Testament Day of Atonement, but it is not yet revealed that this is where salvation lies. It's only on still believing who he was. See? Now the reason I'm emphasizing that is because turn ahead so that you'll see where I'm coming in a little little while, another two or three tapings anyway, to Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Because Paul is not going to discontinue with the message that Peter and the eleven have been preaching, that it's the name of Jesus of Nazareth, but it's that name of who he was plus what he's done. See? All right, and that was kept secret. 
And that's what most of Christendom cannot understand, that these revelations given to the Apostle Paul were utterly secret. Nobody understood that the death, burial, and resurrection was going to be a gospel all its own. They had no idea of that. And I can prove from Scripture over and over, they did not know that until this apostle. All right, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power. See, that word power is always associated with the revelation of the Holy Spirit's work in the human race. To him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, not Peter's, not Jesus' gospel, Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. See? Something that had never been revealed before, which was kept, what? Secret. God never revealed it before. That's why Peter couldn't preach death, burial, and resurrection. It was still kept secret. Now, I got time. Come on back. I've used it over and over because a lot of people think I make too much of Paul. Well, Peter does a lot more than I. Second Peter, chapter 3, at the end of his life. As soon as he finishes Second Peter, I think it's just a matter of days and he's martyred. But oh, the Holy Spirit still got it out there. And he's writing to Jewish believers who as yet have not embraced Paul's gospel. I don't think. I don't see how they could have. <clears throat> now in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and don't forget the setting, just shortly before he dies, it's also shortly before the temple will be destroyed. Peter didn't know that, but the Spirit does. And so with all that in view, Jerusalem and the temple and the priesthood will soon disappear. So where does that leave these Jews? Here it is. Verse 15. Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom of, what wisdom is he talking about? The revelation of the mysteries. See? Things that Peter had never understood. So he says to his readers, now you go to Paul. Because of the wisdom given unto him, he has already written unto you. I think that's evidence that he wrote the book of Hebrews. But now verse 16. As in all his epistles. See? Not just Hebrews. But as in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, what things? Salvation, in which are some things hard to be understood, because this was all beyond Peter. He couldn't comprehend this, and God didn't expect him to, because he didn't reveal these truths to Peter like he did to Paul. And so here's where you have to draw the line of demarcation that when the Jewish program falls through the cracks, Paul's gospel comes to the fore. And all oh, the world of Christendom hates it. What a pity. They fight it tooth and toenail. They just refuse to see it. And I read article after article, and they all say the same thing. There's never been any difference between what Peter preached and what Paul preached. And I beg to differ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. 
Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in on this beautiful day in Oklahoma. And uh, for those of you out on television, again, we just love to invite you to sit down and study with us. I uh, hopefully don't preach at you, but uh, once in a while it almost gets close, doesn't it? But anyway, we attempt to just teach the book and uh, help folks to read it and understand it on their own. And I think we're making headway. My goodness, according to the mail we get, it's... Uh, it's really encouraging that folks are beginning to enjoy their own Bible. So we're just going to pick right up where we left off in our last taping, and uh, we finished in Acts chapter 3. So I'm just going to start with the last couple verses in Acts chapter 3 and then move on. Connecting the dots is what Jerry put on it. We just started at Genesis, and that's just what we're doing. We're just connecting the dots, and uh, I always like to let people be assured, be confident that this book is true. It is the Word of God, and it's the only Word of God. And uh, for that reason, we like to show how everything fits. Okay, we're in the middle four programs now of book 75. So if you want to know how many programs there are available, why well, you just multiply 75 times 12, and you'll get pretty close. So now in Acts chapter 3... Review a little bit of how Peter is ending up now his second message after Pentecost. And as I've been emphasizing, it's still all Jewish. Everything is still concerned with the temple and all the covenant promises made to Israel. And uh, hopefully we're going to point out a few things that I've even neglected to see before. Not that I didn't see it, but I just didn't think it was important enough to bring it to the top. But we're going to look at that in a little bit. And so now Peter is ending up his second message after Pentecost. Already a few weeks have probably gone by, maybe even a few months. And look what he says now again in uh, verse 24, 5 and 6, and then we'll move on. Yea, all the prophets. Well, now, if you're a Bible student, what's he referring to? The Old Testament. See? All the Old Testament. The prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold or prophesied of what days? These days. Now, you remember, oh my goodness, how long ago was it when I had Coverdale statements on the screen? If you're going to be a Bible student, the first thing you do is what? Who's writing? Then what, Luther? You know them. What's he writing? What's the next thing? To whom is he writing? When is it written? What are the circumstances? What went before? What follows after? Okay, so stop every time you come to a few words. Okay, what's he talking about here when he says, Samuel and those that follow after have spoken of these days? Ours? No, theirs. Where Israel was at this point in history, and that was shortly after the crucifixion, 50 days later, we had Pentecost, and that's where we were in our last taping. Oh, and now we're some months beyond Pentecost, but it's still all part of that prophetic end time so far as the Old Testament was concerned. Maybe I should have had them flip the board, but I won't do it anymore. We'll do it in our next program. So that I can show you in the timeline that here we're coming. How can I do this so I'm going the right direction for you? I've got to go out. Here we're coming from the Old Testament, past the crucifixion, his ascension, Pentecost, and Israel, a lot of them are responding, as we're going to see in a little bit. But percentage-wise, for the whole nation, just a few. But nevertheless, the emphasis has been that God is winding up the prophetic statements of the Old Testament. The end is in view. All they're going to have to do is go past the tribulation, and Christ would return, and in would come that kingdom. 
They had no idea of a 2,000 year church age. Don't, don't ever think, well, what about this too? No, they didn't know that. They were thinking everything was just gonna come right down the way the prophets had foretold. And so that's why he said, in these last days. See what a difference one word can make? Now verse 25, addressing the nation of Israel. You are the children of the what again? The prophets. They were the ones to whom all the Old Testament prophets wrote. Well, like he said, where do you start? Samuel. Who's the next great prophet? David. And then Solomon got his words in, you know, with Ecclesiastes and so forth. And then you start the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then all those 12 minor prophets. All of them writing pretty much on the same level prophesying this glorious earthly kingdom that God's going to give to Israel. And so all the word from Samuel until we get to where Peter is today, Israel was being admonished to look for this glorious king and his kingdom. See? But from our vantage point, they rejected it. And so that whole program had to be laid aside, and God, as we're going to see before the afternoon is over, hopefully, brought up the other dispensation through the Apostle Paul, which we call the Age of Grace. Totally unknown to all these prophets, they never once said one word concerning this Gentile Age of Grace. It was all directed to Israel and her coming kingdom. All right, now then, verse 25 again. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant. Now, you remember we did a whole series on covenants a year or two ago that all the Old Testament covenants were not between God and the world. They were between God and Israel. See, the covenants belong to Israel. I'm going to put a statement on the screen before the afternoon is over by a famous dispensationalist who actually founded the Dallas Theological Seminary. And somebody sent it to me, and I'm going to hopefully get it on the screen before the afternoon is over, because I've never read it before, but he said word for word what I've said over and over, so that just confirms and gives me confidence, you see, that I'm not like the gal that sent this. She says, you're not some nut coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> no, no, I'm not alone. My, there are a lot of folks that see this the way I teach it, so uh, don't ever... Uh, don't ever get second thoughts. Well, wait a minute. Maybe Les is just out on left field. No, I'm not in left field. Okay. So he says, you're the children of the prophets, verse 25, which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, see, way back in Genesis 12, and in thy seed, that is the offspring of Abraham, which would be the nation of Israel, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Well, who was included in that seed of Abraham? Jesus Christ. And it was through Jesus and his work of the cross that he reached to the whole human race and not just Israel, see? All right, now then, verse 26, and then we're going to move on. Unto you first. Now remember our rule of Bible study. Who is he talking to? Israel, the Jew, see? So under you Jews first. That's where it all had to start. God, having raised up his son Jesus, after they're rejecting him, and as Peter says in chapter 2, they killed him, but God raised him from the dead, so the king is still alive. He's still going to fulfill the prophecies. That's the whole thrust of these early chapters, that the one they killed was alive, and he could still fulfill all the promises, see? So unto you first, Israel, having raised up his son Jesus, he sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And in my closing remarks, if I remember right, I made the statement. See, here God expects the whole nation to respond before he could actually fulfill the promises. But they didn't, only a small percentage. But on the other hand, when the next apostle comes, he never tells Paul, you're going to go out and win them all. You're going to win how many? Some. And that's where we are today. God is just calling out one here and one there. And uh, it's just the way Christendom has uh, unfolded. It's not the multitudes. It's the one here, one there, the sum. All right, now then, continuing on with 
Peter and uh, his Jerusalem believers there, all Jews. Come over with me now to chapter, oh, let's go to chapter 4. I was going to skip it and go on a little further, but let's stop at chapter 4, just for a verse or two. Starting at verse 32, because so, what I'm going to show you this afternoon, we're not just dealing with a little flock, like a, a few chickens or something like that. We're dealing with thousands of people, which is only a small percentage of the whole, because Israel has always been between 5 and 10 million. But Nevertheless, there are thousands of people that are responding to Peter's and the 11th message here in the nation of Israel. All right, so verse 32 of chapter 4, and the multitude, see, now that indicates a, a fairly large number of people, and the multitude of them that believed, now I got to stop again, believed what? That Christ died for their sins and rose from the dead? No, that hasn't been revealed yet. So what did they believe? Jesus was the Christ. That's so. Still under the law. Nothing has changed. They still keep the food laws. They still keep the Saturday Sabbath. They still keep the feast days. But now they have recognized that Jesus of Nazareth was that promised Messiah. And on that basis, God saved them. Now, you want to remember, salvation has always been by what? Faith. See, always by faith. Well, go back to Adam. What was Adam's faith? You remember I showed it when we went back there some time ago? What was Adam's faith when he named his wife, what? The mother of all living, Eve. Well, God told him they were going to die. So how does he know now that she's going to live long enough to have children? God told him. And how did Adam respond? He believed him. And what did God call it? Faith. See, God told Noah a flood was coming. Build an ark. How much did Noah know about water and arks and so forth? Nothing. But what did he do? He built the ark. On what basis? Faith. See? All right, now here comes Jesus into this religious little nation of Israel with all their temple worship and all their Old Testament prophets, and he proclaims himself as their Messiah and King. What did he expect them to do? Believe it. But only a few did. But now, since Pentecost, it's coming a little more, and so now we have the reference of multitudes have now believed that Jesus was the Christ. See? All right, so they believed. They were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of things which he possessed was of his own, but they had all things common. Now oh, stop and think. Here you've got multitudes of people, as we saw in our last taping, that had come in from every corner of the then known world, from out at the Far East all the way to probably Spain, maybe a few from Great Britain. Certainly all North Africa was now civilized and uh, under the Roman Empire. And so here these Jews have been coming from all the corners of the Roman Empire, and they literally filled the city of Jerusalem. But as I'm going to show you before the afternoon is over, most of them evidently stayed in Jerusalem and did not go back to their homeland out in the Gentile world. And why not? The king is coming. That's what I want to impress on you this afternoon. They stuck tight to Jerusalem because they were convinced that now that Christ had finished the work of the cross and had been raised from the dead and ascended to glory, in short order, he would be coming back and fulfilling the promises made to Israel. And so many of them did not go back home. And they had it so good, as this passage is going to show us, why should they? My, when you got a free lunch, <laughs> why go back home and struggle? <laughs> See? All right, now just watch this attitude as we come through these verses. Now verse 33, or verse 32, I didn't finish it. Neither said any of them that ought or any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. What is that? That's pure communism. Now we always think of communism on the evil side. 
But you see, this was a righteous communism. Nobody was claiming anything more than his neighbor. They all pooled their resources, and they were all living out of that common wealth that had now been accumulated. Now you've got to remember, if you've got multitudes, thousands, because 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost, and then every day from then on, multitudes were coming into salvation and were all glued to the, what I call the Jerusalem church, which I'll probably address next program. Now then, all of these people are pooling their resources. That's what it says. Now look at it. And with great power, God gave the apostles, the twelve, witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In other words, that they knew their king was alive. There's no salvation attached to it. That's where people miss the boat. Peter never says, believe that Christ died for your sins and rose from it. They never said that. All Peter says is that the one you killed is alive and he will yet come and bring in the kingdom. Now, is that so hard to understand? And you can look for it. Check me out. You won't find it associated with their salvation. It was merely the emphatic fact that he was alive. All right? So great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In other words, the blessings were just flowing on this congregation of Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 34, neither were there any among them that lacked. What does that mean? Hey, nobody was going hungry. Nobody was going without necessary food and shelter. They had it pretty good, see? Nothing lacked. For as many as was possessors of lands or houses, what'd they do with them? Turned them into cash. And what'd they do with the cash? Turned it into the 12 apostles, see? And so the wealth is accumulating. I've often said if they could have just invested that with 50% interest, they'd still be going. <laughs> but they didn't and they couldn't. And so, as we're going to see, in time, it ran out. And then we're going to end up with a bunch of what? Poor Jews. It's coming. Okay, stay with me. But here they've got nothing lacking. They've got ample funds. And so far, the 12 had been able to handle the paperwork, as we call it today, the administration of it all. Now, stop and think. Was that simple? Was that simple to be able to take care of thousands of people with all of their physical needs? Now, that took some administration work. That took paperwork. They had to know how much was going out, how much was coming in. All right, read on. Keep all that in your computer up here. And so, as many as had possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold. See how plain that is? They brought it all to the twelve, verse 35, <clears throat> and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution, what does that entail? What I just was talking about. They had to administer this. They had to keep track of what was going out compared to what was coming in. And that somebody wasn't being corrupt and taking more than they needed. It took administration. It took paperwork. Okay, read on. Distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. What does that mean? Maybe a head of a household of five or six naturally needed more than a husband and a wife or a widow. See? All of this is just plain common sense if you'll stop and think it through. All right? Now verse 36. And Jose, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, the same Barnabas that will end up with the apostle Paul who was being interpreted, this son of consolation, was a Levite. He was of the tribe of the priests and of the country or the island of Cyprus. Now, if you know your geography, Cyprus has always been a rather productive piece of real estate. They've got beautiful vineyards and orchards, and uh, Cyprus is a good place to own some property. All right, so he owned land on the country of Cyprus. Verse 37, he sold it and brought the money and laid it 
at the apostles' feet. Now, what I did the last couple of days that I'd never done before, do you think Barnabas was the only one that did that? Think. No, there must have been a number of Jews that probably had property. Who knows? North Africa, Italy, Greece, you name it. And they evidently did the same thing. Now, if you don't want to agree with me, that's fine. I'm just projecting here what I feel human beings would do. If Barnabas did it, no doubt many other wealthy Jews did the same thing. Sold their property wherever it was and brought the money. So here they're piled up with wealth. I know they were. They had a bunch of it. All right, now then, the numbers are increasing. And uh, I'll jump across the page in my Bible now to chapter 5, verse 12. <coughs> chapter 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now, you remember, I think it was in the last taping, or the one before, I don't know, but I made the statement, I made it as clear as I knew how, why were the twelve given the same signs and wonders that Jesus practiced? Same purpose. Now let's back up to his earthly ministry. What was the reason for his signs and wonders and miracles? To convince Israel who he was, see? What are they still trying to do? Convince Israel the one they crucified was the Christ. See, nothing has changed except the work of the cross is now completed. Everything is in, in, has been set for us as Gentiles, but so far as Israel is concerned, it was just an extension of these Old Testament promises. And now the twelve are performing the same kind of wonders and miracles that Jesus did for the same purpose. Convincing Israel who Jesus of Nazareth really were. All right, now verse 13. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them and believers. See? I'll keep it straight. Not grace age believers yet. What kind of believers? Jews believing who Jesus was. Still in the kingdom program. They're still looking for the king. All right? And so believers were the more added to the Lord. What's the next word, at least in the King James? Multitudes. See? Now, so did you catch what I'm driving at? Go back to chapter 2, verse 41, honey. Go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So that you'll get what I'm driving at, that we're not just talking about a couple dozen or even a couple hundred. We're talking about thousands of Jews all gathered here in Jerusalem around the temple area or wherever. Now, where they had a thought of this during the night last night, the scripture never tells us, but where do you suppose they fed all these people? Where do you suppose they kept all the things that were necessary for the daily needs? I don't know, but it must have been a big facility someplace there in Jerusalem. Because I remember when I was in service, at one time we ate in a battalion mess hall, and that thing was huge. And thousands of guys could come in and eat within the same hour. But it took facilities, took big kitchens, took umpteen tables. That's the term we're going to see here. All right, we're doing the same thing with these believing Jews in Jerusalem. Thousands of them. I didn't read it yet, did I? Chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, that is Peter's, were baptized, and the same day, the day of Pentecost, were added unto them, that is, the Jerusalem church, starting with 120, remember. How many? 3,000. That's a good bunch of people in anybody's language. All right, now on top of that then, we have here in chapter 5 that multitudes are still coming. Now, what are we ending up with? A bunch of people that are not working... <laughs> They are all eating and everything out of that common kitty, is the way I used to call it, from all the accumulation of the wealth of these people who were now selling what they had and bringing it to the apostles' feet. So all I'm trying to impress on you this half hour, that we're dealing with a lot of people. 
And they're all dependent on the administration of these 12 apostles. All right, now, got three minutes left. Let's jump over to chapter 6. Now, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now, we're still on this same level playing field. We're dealing with these Jews that are coming into the Jerusalem church who are becoming believers in the kingdom gospel, looking for the king and the kingdom to come in short order. Now, verse 6. Now, in those days, while all this is going on, and it could already be a couple, three years down the road, in those days when the number of the disciples or believers or these followers of Peter and the eleven, <clears throat> when the number was multiplied, there arose a murmuring. Now, you know what I always call that? That's the first crack in that beautiful veneer of this glorious congregation of believing Jews. Remember it said back in chapter 4, they were all of one accord. Everything was just hunky-dory. No arguments, no disputes. All of a sudden, there's a crack in it. And what is it? That there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. All right, now you have to know a little bit of Greek. Who were the Grecians? They were Jews who had been raised and learned the language and the customs of a foreign country. They were Grecians. Greeks or Gentiles of any sort. All right, so out of this multitude of Jews that had come in from every corner of the world and had become believers, become part of this great Jewish congregation with all this accumulated wealth to meet their every need, there were Grecian widows. They were not homeland Jews. They were Jews from other areas of the world. And you know, it's no different in Israel today. You know, I read an article in Jerusalem Post some time ago that when American teenagers move to Israel, you think they've got an easy role? No, because the native Israelis just sort of make life miserable for them until they really get acclimated. I mean, that's just common. Right here in America, you move from one part of the United States to another part, and you all know the same thing. I don't care where it is. It's always the same. Well, they treat you as. You're an outsider. See? You're not part of us. Well, Israel was no different. And so now these Grecian widows who were not part of the original Israeli or the Jewish citizenry were being slighted when it came time to hand out the goodies. See? All right, so there arose a murmuring because of that, because their widows were being neglected in the daily, what? Ministration. What does that tell you? somebody's in control. They had to be. And so it was an administration problem that they had to deal with immediately. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. It's good to have you all back. I see you've had your coffee, and uh, for those of you out on television, I trust you know by now that we take a break every half hour, and uh, we keep it informal, so that's why you can see coffee cups on the table. And uh, we're just here to study the Word, and I trust, I hope I'm not saying something out of place, but I trust that everybody has their own Bible, and that's what I always if I can brag on anything, that's what I like to brag on, that I can get people to study their own 
Bible. And so when you all come in with your separate Bible, you don't know how I appreciate that. And the same for those of you out in television. Get your Bible and don't just listen, study. And uh, that's why we like to put it on the screen. In fact, I think I shared it with a whole national audience one time. I had a fellow call from Florida. And he had caught my program for the first time, and at the end of 30 minutes, he was saved, and he said, I'll never go back to my <laughs> old uh, church or whatever. But he said, don't get the big head. <laughs> well, no, I'm not prone in that direction, but why? He said, you didn't do it. I said, well, I know that, but what did? He said, it was the scripture that you showed on the screen. That's why I just told Mike a little while ago, I'd rather have scripture on the screen as me. And he said, that was the first time in my life I had ever read a word from the Bible. And what verse it was, I don't know, but it did it in 30 minutes. And so that's why it's more important to see for yourself what the book says is to hear me say it. All right, so we're going to go right on back where we left off in the last 30 minutes, and that was in Acts chapter 6, and we're dealing with this multitude of Jews in the area now, Jerusalem, who are evidently part and parcel of all these who had come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, and uh, when they saw that they had the free lunch and the hope of this coming kingdom, why go back home and grub out a living? So that's the way I look at it. They just stay in Jerusalem, and uh, they are. They're getting a free lunch, because now we're going to see how this all, if you study the Scripture, it's there. All right, let's just start at verse 1, even though we covered it. And in those days, that is, while Peter and the eleven are holding forth in Jerusalem, they're gathering all this wealth that people are turning in, and they're administering it out as people have need, but it's getting more than they can handle. It's just going beyond them, see? All right, here we go. In the those days, when the number of the disciples had multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians, and we explained that in the last half hour, Jews who had grown up outside of the land of Israel, and they were murmuring against the Hebrews, the homeland people, because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, the handout, see? Then the twelve, Peter, James, John, and the rest of them, then the twelve called the multitude of the believers, the disciples, unto them, and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve what? Tables. I remember the last program I made mention of my old battalion mess hall? That thing was humongous. What was it filled with? Tables that would seat thousands at a time. That's what they have here. They had tables for who knows how many people. So I don't know where they're meeting, but nevertheless, you've got to put two and two together. They're coming together for their meals, and they're being served. But the twelve said, we've got more important things to do than to handle all of this. Now what the word is at the end of verse 3, what is it? Business. Well, it was big business. My when you're going to dispense food, clothing, and needs of thousands of people, that's a big business in any man's language. And so that's what we've got here. That's what I want you to see. All right? Then verse 4. But, Peter says, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, because after all, what's the end hope? Christ will return and bring in the kingdom. And that's why these people are so willing to not go back home. Now, I'm interjecting that. I can't prove that. I'm telling you that that's the way I look at it, that they just don't see any need to go clear back to Babylon or over to Spain or wherever because the king is coming, the kingdom will be coming in, and who needs houses and lands and wealth, see? That's the idea. Okay, so verse 5. So the saying, please, the whole, and again, what's the word? Multitude. And they chose Stephen. Now, I'm stopping right there because that's the next person we're going to study for a little bit. Stephen now is not of the twelve, but he is of the seven men who were set apart to take care of these material things, such as keeping the groceries out, keeping these people supplied, and maintaining a semblance of order and good business. See? 
All right, so they picked the seven, now verse six, and when they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The word of God increased. See, it's still coming. And the number of the disciples, now that's not associated with, like we use the 12 disciples. This is just another word for the believers. And so these believers multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of what people? The priests, see? A great number of even the priests were obedient to not the law, but to the what? To the faith. And what were they placing their faith in? Who Jesus was. They are now recognizing that, yes, indeed, he was that promised Messiah. And if Israel will just recognize it, in will come that promised kingdom. Now, I'm going to make reference to it, and I'm going to use, like I said in the first program, I'm going to use a quote from a well-known scholar in years gone by, but I'm not ready for it yet in this half hour. We'll use it in the next one. How that these Jews are all coming in under what I call the kingdom economy. And that is, the law hasn't changed. Temple worship hasn't changed. They still practice all the food laws. They practice the Saturday Sabbath. They still go to the temple, and nothing has changed except now that the Messiah has come, gone back to glory, and they're expecting him to come back anytime, although they did know they'd have to go through some tribulation. But nevertheless, they're all looking forward to the coming now of the king and the kingdom. Okay, reading on. Verse 8, Stephen, one of these seven, Picked out specially by the Holy Spirit as he caused Luke to write, <clears throat> this Stephen was full of faith and what? Power. Where did he get his power? Holy Spirit. See? The power from on high. All right, now then we see all the way through the text that this man Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Everything that referred to him was he was working and operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, for example, come down to verse 10. Some of his opposition. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit, a reference to the Holy Spirit, by which he spoke. See, he's a man full of the Holy Spirit. All right, verse 11. Then they, his opposition, those that were still just frantically trying to stop this movement of accepting Jesus as their Messiah, they suborned or they drafted or they conscripted men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Well, <laughs> you know, it's just like I'm accused in my teaching when I point up Paul's epistles, then you are telling us that Jesus didn't mean anything? No, I didn't say that. I'm just saying that everything Jesus said was to Israel under the law, and everything he says to us comes through his designated apostle, and that's all Stephen had ever said about Moses. Well, listen, Moses' day has come and gone. Now we're ready to accept this Jesus of Nazareth as the primary individual, see? And then they thought that was downgrading Moses. Well, that's just the way people think. So anyway, that's their accusation. Verse 12, so they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, caught him, and brought him to the consul, and set up false witnesses. See, things haven't changed, have they? They set up false witnesses, and these witnesses said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. <laughs> well, was that so bad? <laughs> because once Christ had returned and set up his kingdom, he's not going to use this same old temple that Herod uh, built. He's going to build his own millennial temple, see? And so... Stephen was just being falsely accused and twisting his words, and, uh, well, I have it happen every once in a while, even in my own ministry. In fact, one of these fellows here just came a little bit ago, and this is typical right here. He said, Les, this verse says in this translation, just opposite of what you say. You don't mind. I won't point you out. And I said, no, it doesn't. I said, read it again. 
Well, before he left visiting with me, he saw it. Oh, he said, I read that wrong. But see, that's human. And uh, I have it happen every once in a while. Somebody called and said, Les, you said such and such. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't say anything like that. Yes, you did. Well, let's go see what the book says. Well, then they admit, oh, I heard you wrong. <laughs> see? But until they confront me with it, how many people have they told, well, don't listen to Les Valdick. He hasn't got it right. <laughs> well, it's not my fault. You know, they aren't reading it right. Well, anyway, same way with poor old Stephen. He's being falsely accused now of actually... He's telling it like it is, that when this Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will return and set up his kingdom, then all of this earthly stuff is going to disappear, and the whole millennial uh, environment will be totally different. Okay, so they bring him on the carpet. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, we're not going to take this verse by verse. I would like to, but uh, I've already done it when we took the book of Acts verse by verse. But we're going to hit the highlights of it before we move on. Now they take Stephen up before all the big wheels of Israel. And the high priest said, are these things so? Now then, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, he actually up in, uh, where is it, verse 15 of chapter 6, his face was like that of an angel. So God was with him. And now Stephen speaks in verse 2. Now, you know, as I was rehearsing this again in the last week, getting ready for today, you know what just struck me? Never has before, but it did this time. How many times have you read articles and some of these newfangled uh, so-called books of so-and-so and books and so-and-so, and they come to the conclusion that our Old Testament really isn't that believable? Well, especially archaeologists. My, they'll come up and they'll just over and over say that much of what we have taken for granted in the Old Testament never happened. It's not true. But you know what? Stephen here, after the fact of hundreds and hundreds of years for a lot of it, is rehearsing everything in a compact way, beginning with Abraham all the way up to that present time, and fills in a lot of details that the Old Testament doesn't give us. And you know, I thought of it in that light. See, I don't care what these scholars say. Our Old Testament is believable. It's just as true as anything can be. And Stephen's address here confirms it. Now, like I say, I haven't got time to go verse by verse. So when you get home this evening, if you've got time, you just sit down and read this chapter 7. And you will see all of Old Testament history encapsulated and it's as true as anything can be all right but let's just start up there at verse 2 and he said men and brethren fathers see he's addressing Jews no Gentiles hearken or listen to me the God of glory appeared visibly unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now the question comes in just every so often, was Abraham a Jew? No, he couldn't have been a Jew because the Jewish race hadn't even started yet. The Jewish race was by covenant promise beginning with Abraham, but what was he genetically? He was a Syrian, see? His whole family was Syrian. Now let me show that. that. That'll give a good chance to answer a lot of questions out there in TV land as well. Come back with me to uh, Genesis. My goodness, I hope I can find it. Way back at the time of Jacob. I thought it was in chapter 29, but I wasn't seeing it. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, chapter 28. 28. Because I want my whole TV audience to see this, and then maybe it'll save me a whole bunch of letter writing. <clears throat> chapter 28 of Genesis. Verse 1. Isaac. Abraham and Sarah's son. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, 
arise and go to Padan Aram, that's up there in Syria, where uh, Abraham and Lot and all them had stopped on their way down to Canaan. But go up to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. Now, before we go any further, what was the relationship between Abraham and Sarah? Half brothers and half sister. So they're out of the same stock, okay? So go to Padan Aram, the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And uh, God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful, multiply thee, thou must be a multitude. Now let's come all the way down to verse 5. So Isaac sent away Jacob. He went to Padan Aram, up there in Syria, unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the what? Syrian. So the whole family was Syrian until God separated Abraham and gave him the covenant promises. And then, yes, from Abraham on, all those offspring are Jews, Israelites of the 12 tribes. But anyway, that answers that question, that we were dealing with Abraham the Syrian until God fulfilled his covenant promises. Okay, now we can come back to Acts chapter 7. And so the God of glory, verse 2, appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, and before he dwelt in Haran, he was a Syrian, and he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, and come into the land that I will show thee. So he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Haran, which was still up in Syria. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him unto this land, the land of Canaan, wherein you now dwell. Well, anyway, we're going to come on down until we get to verse 6. And as God is dealing now with Abraham, God spake in this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land. In other words, he didn't actually set roots down, but he just migrated up and down the length of what is present-day Israel amongst the Canaanites, see? and that they should bring them into bondage and treat them evil 400 years. Now, of course, that's a reference, I'm sorry, that's a reference to uh, to nation, Egypt, I'm sorry. Now, verse 7, And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, Egypt, God says, I will judge, and we know he did. Now, there again, the archaeologists in particular, if you ever read any of their articles, they maintain that there is no visible evidence of the Israelites ever being in Egypt. Almost no archaeological proof, according to their, their shards and so forth. But, you know what I always maintain? God has purposely hidden a lot of things in human history, like, for example, Noah's Ark. For what purpose? To force us to take it by faith. See, now, as soon as the archaeologists come up and say, well, of all the digging that they've done in Egypt and all of the Egyptian history, there's not one inkling of the Jews ever being in Egypt. Well, if I'm going to believe that Israel was in Egypt, how am I going to have to take it? By faith. I don't care whether they can't find proof. Doesn't make a bit of difference to me. My Bible says they were there hundreds of years. And someday, maybe, the archaeologists, like David, there was another one. Do you know the archaeologists were just on a, they were on a binge. There was never a record of a guy by the name of David. So they just threw all kinds of doubt on the Word of God. Well, here, just in the last couple or three years, they found a stele, I think that's the way it's pronounced, which was just sort of a, a dagger-like stone. And whose name do you suppose they found on it? David. And it just blew their minds. But that's the one and only time that, so far at least, that they've found something that I'm aware of that has an indication of David. But, you see, I think God does that. Same with the ark. Why in the world does God keep that ark from human view? Because if it was out there where people, what would people do? They'd go and worship it. They'd make a shrine of it. And so the world still doesn't believe of a flood or in the fact that Noah ever existed. So again, how do we know it? By faith. And I think that's why God does it, to force us to take these things by faith 
in his word. See? All right, back to our text. I shouldn't get digressed, but I can't help it once in a while. Acts chapter 7, and uh, now verse 8. He gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And after the covenant of circumcision, in comes the, the Jewish line now, not out of Ishmael or Esau, but out of Jacob and the 12 sons. And so circumcision then became the, the uh, covenant between God and Israel. All right, verse 9, the patriarchs moved with envy, the 11 brothers, and they sold Jacob or Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. It was all part of his divine purposes that Joseph should be sold into slavery, taken down into Egypt, because, now let's come a little further, verse 10, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he made him governor <coughs> over Egypt and all his house. In other words, Joseph is, again, a good illustration of how Jews many times come clear to the very top of Gentile governments. Joseph is the first one. Moses did. Daniel did. See? All right, so now then Stephen continues. Now, don't, don't forget the setting here. What is Stephen showing to these religious leaders that all these prophecies that have been building up through the Old Testament are about to be fulfilled? And so he's showing them from Scripture, historically, that all of this was in God's divine purposes for his covenant people. All right. Then you come on down to verse 11. Now there came a dearth, a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance, no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first, that is, the other remaining sons of Jacob. All right, and the second time. Now you've heard me teach this, and we'll repeat it again. Why do you suppose the Holy Spirit inspired Stephen to make a point of the second time? Well, you see, you've got the same thing up here in... Uh, Verse 23, 24, and 25 with Moses. Let's just jump up there a minute. I think I've got time. Yeah. Jump ahead. Verse 22. When Moses was learned or educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptian, was mighty in word and deed, and he was a full 40 years old. You don't get that in the Old Testament. This is a little tidbit that we get here. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, avenged him that was oppressed, and smote or killed the Egyptian. Now verse 25, for he, Moses, supposed or he thought that his brethren, the Jews, that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. What did he want to do? He wanted to lead the nation out with his own power and pomp and circumstance because he was a great man in Egypt. And so he thought that God had laid on his heart to lead the children out. But it wasn't God's time. And so what happened? Read on. They understood not. Verse 26, And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him or threw him aside, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Now, what's all this a picture of? Christ's first coming. Both of them. When Joseph went down, I mean, when the brothers went down into Egypt to get grain and Joseph was in control, Joseph knew them. Did they know Joseph? No. And they never did get it. All right, but when they came, like he says back there in verse 13, when they came the second time, now what happens? That great reunion between Joseph and his brethren. All right, what's the picture? The first time Jesus knew his covenant people, did they know him? No, for the most part. And they rejected him. But he's coming the second time. Now when he comes the second time, 
they're going to recognize him. They're going to see him, I think, coming in the clouds of glory and every last Israelite or Jew, whatever you want to call them, <clears throat> that will be in that one-third remnant will become believers. Oh, and now it's the same way with Moses. The first time, he couldn't get the first base because they wouldn't trust him. They wouldn't believe who he was. Then come on down to verse 28 where we left off. These Jews who were rejecting Moses said, you're going to kill me as you did the Egyptian. And at that, Moses fled and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. And now here it comes. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire in a bush. You all know that back in Exodus chapter 3. And that precipitated then, verse 32, out of the bush, God says, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And the Lord said to him, put your shoes off your feet. And then he comes on down to verse 34. I have seen the affliction of my people who is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I'm come down to deliver them. Now come, God is speaking, I will send you into Egypt. Now for what purpose? <coughs> to be the deliverer the second time, see? And so this is what you have to learn from Acts chapter 7, if nothing else, that it is brought home so clearly that at the first advent, Israel could not buy into it. They could not believe who he was. But when he comes the second time, they will recognize him, and as Zechariah says, they will say, what are these wounds in thy hands? And how will he answer? those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And so Israel will suddenly realize who he is and why he has come, and they will enter into the glory of that kingdom. So always remember that, the first advent and the second. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, program number three, and uh, again, we just want to uh, invite our television audience to study with us, get your Bible, take your notes, and uh, if you get a question that just compounds why you call me. I'm on the phone almost every forenoon, so uh, I guess that's just part of the ministry. So we just uh, encourage you, don't, uh, don't sweat it, just uh, give us a call and we'll try to clarify if we possibly can. And like I said in an earlier program, usually when people call with a question, it's because they heard me wrong. And uh, I can't help that. So anyway, here we go. Back to where we left off in our last program. And again, I guess I should thank my whole audience, you as well as everybody, for your prayers and your letters and your financial help. Because after all, uh, that's what keeps us going. All right, back to Acts chapter 7 for a little bit. And uh, here we're still in the message that Stephen, not one of the twelve, but one of the seven that were appointed to take care of some of the material needs of all these multitudes of Jews who have been staying in Jerusalem. They're living out of the common kitty. And uh, as we're going to see in probably this program or the next one, their money runs out. Isn't it amazing? It happens. And uh, when the money ran out, they didn't have money to go back home. So where'd they end up? those poor Jews in Jerusalem. And uh, that, of course, is going to 
go right on into Paul's ministry, as we will see. But for now, we're still dealing with a multitude of Jews, and here we have Stephen making his appeal to the Jewish leadership that all the Old Testament was now being fulfilled right before their very eyes, and uh, why can't you see it? You know, that's what he's asking them. Why can't you see it? Well, he comes down to, oh, let's see. Let's come all the way up to verse 35, still in chapter 7. He's still rehearsing all the history of Israel, and now he's up to Moses, who after his second time, God used him to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. All right, verse 35. So this Moses, whom they refused at his first offer, this Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same, same Moses, did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now, I trust you all remember that Exodus chapter 3, where Moses saw that burning bush and stepped aside to see what in the world was going on, and it was the Lord himself speaking telling him that he would now send him back to Egypt to lead his people out of bondage. All right, so reading on, verse 36. So he brought them out, out of Egypt. He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. Now that i got to stop a moment. Come back, or go ahead rather, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 22, now this is Paul writing years later, but he makes such an appropriate statement that I always like to have people lock on to. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. See that? That's all you have to see in that verse. The Jews require a sign. Well, coming back to Acts chapter 7, when did God begin dealing with Israel on the basis of signs and wonders? When Moses went back to Egypt. You remember the very first argument that Moses had, that he wasn't qualified anymore? He'd been herding sheep for 40 years. He'd been away from all educated people and, and a fluent civilization back there on the backside of the desert, and he had all kinds of excuses. And what did God ask him? What's in your hand? Well, a shepherd's rod. What did he tell him to do? Throw it on the ground. What happened? It was a writhing snake. Now what does he tell Moses? Pick it up by the tail. And suddenly it was back to his shepherd's rod. Well, it was, of course, a supernatural miracle, but for what purpose? To prove to Moses that God was going to use him to bring Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. All right, now then, from that point on, Israel is accustomed to the supernatural miracle-working power of God all the way up except for the last 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Those 400 years of silence? No, nothing. But other than that, Samson, what did Samson do? Why, all those signs that people think are just a figment of somebody's imagination. No, God did it, miraculously. And uh, on up through with the prophets and their supernatural ability to prophesy the future. That was all part of Israel's history. And so they were accustomed then, show me a sign, see? All right, so here we have it, beginning with Moses, who was shown with wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. Then the greatest one of all, I still think, is the greatest miracle of all the miracles that God performed with Israel was opening the Red Sea. I mean, that's just beyond our comprehension that here God opens up the ocean, as we would look at it, for a distance of however many miles it took for several million people and all their livestock to go through on dry ground. And again, it's not a figment of somebody's imagination. It happened, because the book says it happened. And now, of course, some are beginning to find some of the evidence of that with chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea. But whatever, 
These were all signs and wonders and miracles to convince Israel that they were God's chosen people. Moses is indeed his appointed man and that they were to trust him explicitly. But Israel has always had the same problem that the rest of the human race, and that is a lack of faith. And so in spite of the miracles, they were still so prone to unbelief. Okay, reading on now where we were in Acts chapter 7. And so this is that same Moses who said to the children of Israel, a prophet, now here's prophecy, see? A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, in other words, out of one of the tribes of Israel, like unto me, even as Moses was a prophet and a leader and a deliverer, in the future there will come another one. Now verse 37, the last four words, him shall you hear. And that was a reference to Jesus of Nazareth. Israel was to have responded to his three years of signs and wonders and miracles. All right, verse 38. This is he. Speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, this is he who was in the church or that called out assembly of Jews coming out of Egypt down to the wilderness of Sinai. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Well, many may think it's referring to Moses, but I don't think so. Because you see, when the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, took them around Mount Sinai, gave them the law, built the tabernacle, set up the priesthood, now where does he take them? Up to the southern border of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea. And what did the God of Abraham, Jacob, and the rest of them promise those Israelites? Go in and take it. You will not lose one drop of blood. I'll drive those Canaanites ahead of you, and they're going to be chased out with hornets, plus some other things, and all you have to do is go in and take it. Occupy it. And what did Israel do? Unbelievable. They said, we can't do it. Why, the cities are walled. The people are giants. There's no way. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. But God had said it. All right, now let me show you the verse that sets the whole thing on edge. Go back with me all the way to Hebrews, chapter 3. And this is so appropriate even for us today. Because God is still dealing with America on the same basis. Believe him. But they refuse. My, you wouldn't dare bring any of these things up in the halls of Congress. They'd have a conniptic fit. Because God isn't in part of our culture anymore. But see, this is the problem. It's the problem that they will not recognize that we are still under the sovereign authority of the Creator God. But see, Israel was the perfect illustration. Hebrews chapter 3, and uh, oh my goodness, these are all good verses. I think I'll take time to read them. Start with verse 7. This is just good rehearsal. We've been here before. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of testing or temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers, your forefathers, tested me, I use tested rather than tempted, when your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, they have not known in my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter in to my rest, which was the promised land. 
All right, reading on. Take heed, therefore, brethren, in verse 12, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of immorality. Was that their problem? No. Of what? Unbelief. No faith. That's been the problem all the way up through human history. People cannot believe what God says. And Israel was no different. All right, so they had within them that evil heart of unbelief. And uh, by that they departed from the living God. But now the writer to the Hebrews, which I think was Paul, in verse 13 says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. <clears throat> For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, now he's bringing it all up from our situation rather than Israel's at Kadesh, that if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as they did back there in the provocation in Kadesh Barnea. Now verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, because after all, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, we can take them. So they were in the minority, see? But, verse 17, now here's where the lesson comes down to where you and I are today. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them who had sinned, the sin of unbelief, remember, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he, now we're speaking about God and Israel, and to whom swear he, or God, that they should not enter into his rest, the promised land, but to them who what? Believe not. That was their problem. God had already forgiven them and dealt with them on the basis of that golden calf. They weren't now practicing immorality. They weren't having any other moral problems. What was their problem? They couldn't believe that God said they could take it. And so they shrank back. Okay, and so whom did he swear that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? Now then, verse 19, that puts the cap on it. So then, or so we see that they could not enter in, that is, to the promised land coming in from Kadesh Barnea. They could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. And so it is all through God's dealing with the human race. It's the lack of faith. They just can't take God at his word. And it's the same problem today. They just cannot believe that what this book says is, like I said in the last taping, if it's prophesied, it's going to happen. What? It's going to happen. You can rest on it. It may not be in our lifetime, but it's going to happen someday. All right, so now then let's come back to where we were in Acts chapter 7, and I want to be ready for Saul's conversion in our next program. So let's come on back to Acts chapter 7 for a little bit. And so, verse 39 again, To whom our fathers would not obey, but they thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. And they said to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not what's become of him. So they made a calf. You know the story of that one. All right, then come all the way on up for sacred time. Verse 45. Which also our fathers who came after brought in with Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles. That is, when Joshua came into the land of Canaan and had to fight for it and had to have war in order to gain the occupation of the land. All right, so under Joshua... And then God drove them out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. See, we're coming all the way up through Israel's history now. Abraham at uh, probably around 2000 B.C., 430 years later, we have him coming out of Egypt. Then the 40 years in the wilderness. Now we're up to the time of Joshua and uh, through the book of Joshua. 
and then we come to King David, 1000 B.C. All right, now David, verse 46. He found favor before God and desired to find or build a tabernacle or a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. In other words, he wanted to build a permanent temple. David didn't get to do it. Verse 47 says, but Solomon did. Now verse 48, Howbeit the Most High, that is, the God of Israel, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Verse 49, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? In other words, he's emphasizing even to David and Solomon that he's more than just the God of a physical temple of wood and stone, but he is the creator of everything. All right, now then verse 51. Here Stephen begins to come down hard on the religious leadership of Israel. Remember, it's the high priest who introduced the chapter. All right, now to the religious leadership. Stephen says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Oh, they've been circumcised in the flesh. But circumcision of the heart, the cutting off of the old Adam, as we're showing lately in the book of Romans, that's all Paul emphasizes. You've got to put old Adam to death. He has to be cut off. Well, that's the circumcision of the heart when Adam is cut off. It was just as appropriate for the Old Testament Jew as it is for us today. But they hadn't been. They were still in their carnal state. They were still in the flesh, see? So he calls them uncircumcised in heart and ears. And you do always resist against the Holy Spirit. As your fathers, your forefathers did, so you do. He's bringing everything that happened in the past right up to their present day. And he says, you're no different. Now, we know from history, what did Israel do to most of the prophets? Killed them. They didn't like the message. They'd kill the messenger. You've heard me say that more than once. All right, so Stephen is driving the point home. You're no different. You're just as rebellious as they were in the past. All right. So which of your fathers have not your fathers, or which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain or killed them who showed or wrote or prophesied before the coming of the just one, of whom, that is the just one, you have now been betrayers and murderers. You have received the law, the Mosaic law, by the disposition of angels, but you've not kept it. You didn't care what the law said. You lived your own life. Now then, verse 54. When they heard these things, these religious leaders, the priests and the Pharisees, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Conviction. But did they respond in the right way? No, they responded the wrong way. Instead of succumbing to Stephen's message, they rebelled against it. And so what did they do? They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Here's another miracle again, typical in Israel's past. He saw the glory of God, and in that open view into heaven, what he really saw was what? Jesus standing. Now, that's another question that comes in all the time. Why did C. Stephen speak of Jesus standing when all the other scriptures, Psalm 110, 1 and Hebrews chapter 1 and a couple others, he's seated, but here he's standing. Read it again. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, standing on the right hand of God. Now, as soon as he said that, what happened? An uproar. And they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon. Mob. 
Now, I've got one scripture I think is the answer, and if you don't want to agree, that's fine. I'm not going to make a big deal, but come back with me to Psalms 68, and I think this is the answer to what Stephen witnessed. And these religious leaders of Israel responded. Psalms 68. <coughs> Psalm 68 is what I call the explanation of Acts chapter 7. All with me? Psalms 68, drop right in at verse 1, honey. Psalm 68, verse 1. And watch this real carefully. Let God, what? Arise. Now, wait a minute. Maybe I should take the time. I think I've got it. Keep your hand in Psalm 68. Jump ahead to 110 in the Psalms. Psalms 110, verse 1. See, and this is what the Jews knew. They knew these Psalms, forwards and backwards. All right, Psalms 110, verse 1. This is what everybody understands. All got it? The Lord said unto my Lord. In other words, God the Father says to God the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now that's a loaded verse. So when did God instruct him to come and sit at his right hand? After his resurrection and his ascension, and he sat uh, positionally, symbolically, how you want to put it, but he sat at the Father's right hand, but not forever, a sword, until. So there would be a time coming, but like I said, let's see, if I got my board up here? No. How about next program? Everything in the Old Testament was looking forward to a straight unfolding of the prophecies, including the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom. So all of this was in a rather tight time frame. And the 2,000 years of the church age was unknown. All right. So now then in Psalms 110, verse 1, we have the Lord seated at the Father's right hand until he would go and destroy his enemies. Got it? Now then, back to Psalm 68. And I think these Jews knew Psalm 68 just as well as they did 110, verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him do what? Flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. And I think they saw the whole impact of this. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Were those religious people ready for that? Oh, heavens, no. So instead of succumbing to it by faith, they rebel at it under the, inst the uh, instinct of old Adam, as we've been seeing in Romans. All right, so now then, if you'll come back to Acts chapter 7, this is what I think you've got here. That when Stephen saw Jesus standing, and they reckoned it according to Psalm 68, and he would be coming and destroying the wicked, Wow, they weren't ready for that. And so again, instead of accepting the message, they kill the messenger. Isn't it amazing? All right. So they cry the loud voice, verse 57, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him, put him to death. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. We're going to be introduced to him in our next program, Saul of Tarsus, the next major player from there on till the book of Acts is completed. And so they laid their clothes at the feet of a man whose name was Saul. They stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. All right, now then, for just a little bit of continuation, go on into chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul, Saul of Tarsus, 
the same man we're going to deal with now in our next half hour. Saul of Tarsus was consenting unto his death. He was more than consenting. He was actually promoting it. And at that time, there was a great persecution against this assembly of these believing Jews that we've been talking about all afternoon. Now there's multitudes of them, thousands of them, see? And now there comes a great persecution against the assembly which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. They never left, and they stayed in Jerusalem until a lot of time goes by because they saw absolutely no need to go on out into the Gentile world because they were not apostles of Gentiles, they were apostles of Israel. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back for program number four of book number 75. So keep that in mind, and uh, I don't know where we're going to stop. People are writing and asking, how long are we going to go? Well, I don't know. I threatened to quit, you know, a couple of years ago, but uh, we had our mind changed. Okay, we're going to move right on now to chapter 9, and uh, after we have the stoning of Stephen, as we just looked at in the last program, which I call the epitome or the crescendo of Israel's rejection. They just came to like the end of an orchestra piece and just screamed, we will not have this Jesus of Nazareth ruling over us. And at the same moment, we're introduced to the next major player on scriptural's stage, and that is Saul of Tarsus. So we're going to go right over to chapter 9 for this half hour and look at the conversion of this religious, fanatic, zealous Jew and how he had to completely turn a full, what should I say, a full flip-flop, if ever there was one, from the one who was so steeped in Judaism to one who would now proclaim, you're not under the law you're under grace. All right, so we're going to start reading at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against these disciples, or these Jewish believers now, of the Lord, and he went to the high priest and desired or asked of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that is, believing that Jesus was the Christ, or what we call the kingdom gospel, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. I mean, the guy was heartless. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from where? Heaven. Now, you know, it's amazing what people are saying anymore today. Somebody sent me an article. I don't remember what part of the country it was from, where this preacher was saying that the only people that ever went to heaven was Elijah and Enoch. <laughs> Imagine. And he said, nobody knows what heaven is. They don't know where it's at. Well, Here's just an example. In Acts chapter 1, at the ascension, where in the world does Scripture say Jesus went? He went into heaven. And where does it say he's coming from? From heaven. 
And so all of Scripture is pointing to the fact that heaven is a real place. And they can't see that. But here again, this light came from heaven. Where did it come from? The right? The left? From underneath? Where did it come from? Above. So what do we take from that? When we go up to heaven, we don't go horizontal. We go up. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> that's enough. Heaven is up there someplace, and it's a literal, visible, physical place to which we are going and from which Christ has come. All right, so now we've got Saul of Tarsus raging, I always say, like a bull can't get to Damascus fast enough so he can arrest these Jews who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth and take them bound back to Jerusalem so he can put them on trial and hopefully put them to death. Now, you know, I made a comment on program way, way back. I don't remember when it was or where it was. Maybe you've heard it lately. I don't know. But nothing brings out the wickedness in people like religion. Just look at the world today. In the name of religion, they can just drive a suicide bomb into a marketplace and blow people to smithereens in the name of their religion. Well, the Muslims aren't the first. It's always been that way. Religions will cause people to just do barbaric things. Well, Paul or Saul of Tarsus was no different. Now, before I even start, so that you'll see where this man came from. Let's back up, I guess. I was going to go ahead. Back up with me to Acts. No, it isn't. I'm in chapter 9. I want to go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Acts is the fourth program. See, then I get kind of loose. All right. <coughs> Acts chapter 26. Here he's rehearsing. He was rehearsing this lifestyle that we're looking at now on his road to Damascus. Acts chapter 26. Verily see, verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, that is, those believing Jews, many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. He was working hand in glove with the religious leaders. And when these believers were put to death, I gave my vote against them, where I get the idea that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Verse 11, I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and I feel that was using torture, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities whereupon I went to Damascus. That was the life of Saul of Tarsus, the religious nut. See? All right, come back with me now then to Acts chapter 9, and uh, we want to move on quickly if we possibly can, because most of you have heard me teach this over and over and over. And this light from heaven, verse 3, verse 4, and it had such an impact on him, he fell to the earth. Whether he was afoot or whether he was horseback, doesn't make any difference. He's prostrate on the ground. And he heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, that is, Saul said, who art thou, Lord? Now, my marginal... Bible says Jehovah, and I agree with that 100%, because for a good religious Jew who did not like to even mouth the word Jehovah, Lord was the substitute, see? And so in reality, whether he said it or not in his heart, he was saying, who art you, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, see? Who art thou, Jehovah, and Jehovah, the Lord, Jesus Christ, who's one and the same scripturally, the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now then, the immediate response when he heard he was dealing with Jehovah and Jesus, one and the same, the man melted like 
butter on a hot afternoon. He just literally melted there on the road out in front of Damascus. And trembling and astonished. What astonished him? That the one he'd been persecuting was the same one he was worshiping. They were one and the same. And all of a sudden it struck home. I don't think any of us can get the impact of that. That here he had been actually putting people to death for embracing Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, but he was also the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And so it hit him that the one he hated was the same one he thought he was serving. All right? So trembling and astonished, um, in an immediate conversion, immediate recognizing how wrong he had been, now he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, Damascus, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. All right, now you know the rest. He comes into the city, and uh, this religious, now this religious, this believing Jew, Ananias, who has become an embracer as well of Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, is the go-between. He's the one that God has designated. Now you go and you find Saul of Tarsus, and this is what you're going to tell him. All right? Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, that is to Ananias, who was scared to death of this adversary of these believing Jews, not knowing that he had been converted out at the city gate. The Lord says to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, I pointed this out, I think, in one of the previous programs. All of a sudden, you have a complete change in the modus operandi. Back in the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry, remember, he told the twelve, go not into the way of a Gentile, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. To this man, he is not saying, go not to Israel, but he is saying the emphasis now, you go to the Gentile, a complete change. In fact, as I was just mulling this over this last week, I thought of something, and I'm going to just throw it out just uh, for something to think about. When God called Abraham, or Abram, out of the Ur of the Chaldees, he too started something totally, totally different in dealing with the human race. So now I'm going to set two biblical pillars. Abraham, the pillar of the beginning of the nation of Israel, God's earthly people. Here in chapter 9, we've got the second pillar, the Apostle Paul going to the Gentiles, calling out the body of Christ, which is not earthly, it's what? Heavenly. Now, use that as an example. Abraham, the pillar at the beginning of Israel. Paul is the pillar that gives the sign for the beginning of the body of Christ. All right, now then, as you come on down, I want to bring you all the way down to verse 20. And before we read it, I'm going to make the point, and I'm going to have the fellows show on the screen what just came to me yesterday, just in time for this, from one of my listeners off the Internet. And it's a statement from the founder of the Dallas Theological Seminary, Lewis Sperry Schaefer. And as we... Read it after a bit, and the guys put it on the screen. I want you to see how identical it is with the words that I've been teaching for the last 15 years. All right, but here it is, verse 20, and then we'll come back to Sherry's, uh, Chaffer's, Lewis Sperry Chafer's statement. Verse 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God, period. What does Paul not yet understand? That it's the cross that is going to be the point of salvation. He's still on kingdom ground. Now it stands to reason. How could he preach something that God had never yet revealed? And he hasn't, see? He won't until Paul begins his three years of hiatus in the desert. So Paul has to be saved under the same economy that's been all through the book of Acts, the kingdom gospel that Jesus was the Christ. And that's his point, see? That's his point. Straightway he preached Christ 
in the synagogues, not that he died for the sins of the world, but that he is the Son of God. See? That's the kingdom gospel. All right, now if the guys can put it on the screen for me, this uh, <coughs> statement that I have from Lewis Ferry Schaefer, and it was up on the internet, and I hope that's all the credits I have to give to it. I don't want to do anything contrary to the law, but I'm going to read what this gentleman who was, remember, the beginning and was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Kingdom gospel versus grace gospel. Strong objection is offered by covenant theologians to a distinction between the gospel of the kingdom as preached by John the Baptist, Jesus, the disciples, and the Pauline gospel of the grace of God. One covenant theologian states that to make such a distinction is unfortunate and dangerous. Well, that's the kind of calls and letters I get. How can you possibly preach two gospels? Well, they don't understand. We're not saying there's two gospels today, but back here in the beginning of everything from Christ's earthly ministry until we get to Paul, it was the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was the Christ. Not a word about death, burial, and resurrection. But as soon as you get into Paul's gospel, what is it? How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. All right, now then, uh, Dr. Schaefer goes on with this. He, with others, contends that the kingdom gospel is identical with the gospel of divine grace, here, nevertheless, will arise an absurdity which does not deter this type of theologian, namely, that men could preach the Pauline grace gospel based, that is, on the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when they did not believe Christ would die or be raised from the dead. Isn't that what I've always said? Luke 18, you remember when Jesus told the twelve, we go up to Jerusalem and everything that's been written by the prophets shall be accomplished. The Son of Man shall be tortured and persecuted and he will be put to death and on the third day he shall rise again. But what's the next verse? And they, the twelve, understood none of this. And they weren't supposed to because God hid it from them. And then I always have to come right back with common sense. If these men knew that Christ was going to die and be raised from the dead, which they'd have to know if they preached Paul's gospel, then why weren't they outside the tomb on resurrection morning? Why did they have such a hard time believing that he had actually been raised from the dead? John 20, just as plain as day, for as yet they, Peter and John, knew not the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Well, then how in the world could they be preaching it if they didn't know it? Well, that's exactly what Dr. Trafer said. And I just loved it. I said, man, if people think I'm some nut, and I do, I hear it. I'm some nut coming out of the woodwork with this. No, this is the truth of Scripture. That when Jesus and John the Baptist and Jesus and the Twelve begin preaching, it's only that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And he had come to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. There's nothing about death, burial, and resurrection in that. Nobody knew that that's what was going to happen. Now then, when Paul comes on the scene, as he says in Corinthians, we preach Christ, what? Crucified and risen from the dead. That's his message. And you can't see the difference between that? My, there's something wrong. Oh, that's a vast difference. Plus, the kingdom gospel was preached to Israel in view of all the Old Testament covenants. Paul's gospel is going to the whole human race, as we said in the last program or two, not to bring in the whole, but to call out some. And when the body of Christ has been called out and is filled and completed, we have to get out of here so that God can finish his dealing with Israel. That's why I am so adamantly pre-trib rapture. We won't fit in that seven years of tribulation. That's God dealing with Israel again, see? So anyway, now we can come back to our text. I hope that got on the screen where people can read it and they can see that men far greater than I 
have said the same identical thing. Whoever sent it, if you're listening, I thank you because uh, I'd have probably never ever found it. All right, so now then back to Acts chapter 9 and the few minutes we have left. Verse 20 again, he preached Christ, that is the Messiahship, that's what Christ means, in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he who destroyed them who called on this name in Jerusalem? Isn't this the same guy? Yeah, but he's been saved. He's had a conversion experience, see? And then they went on to say, isn't this the same guy that came here to Damascus for that intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priests and then put to death? Verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength. You remember that experience on the road to Damascus decimated him. I think he came out of that experience not only blind, but he was dehydrated. I think he was a physical wreck. I mean, it was more than just a casual experience. All right, so he increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, because that's the only ones he was dealing with. He wasn't trying to win Gentiles yet. He hasn't been told that he's going to go to Gentiles. That's just Ananias. So he is still dealing with the Jews in the Damascus synagogues and again continues to prove that this is very Christ. In other words, this Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the promised Messiah. And that's what they were to believe. And even Saul of Tarsus couldn't convince many. All right, verse 23, after many days, a couple, three weeks, I don't know. But after many days were fulfilled, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews now that he would been part of, seeing that he had turncoated on them, they took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul. He found out somehow or other. And so he knew that they were watching the gates day and night to kill him. Verse 25. So there's only one escape. They'll have to get him out of the city. So his fellow believing Jews, like Ananias, who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth, the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. That was his escape mechanism out of Damascus. All right, now then the scripture just drops us there. And the next thing we see in verse 26 is three, four years later, when he's come back from this Damascus experience to Jerusalem. So we don't go on. We've got to go over where the scripture picks up, and that would be in Galatians chapter 1. And again, a portion that I know I've taught over and over, but I never get tired of it. I hope no one else does. And here, Paul now writing to Gentile churches many years later. Let's see, this is probably uh, 37, about 11 years later. <coughs> Eleven years later, Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians. Fourteen years later. Let's see, 37 from 51? Yeah, 14 years later. My math slipped. Galatians 1, verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. Now this is the very beginning of this change of operation between God and the human race. Instead of dealing with Israel on covenant ground under the law of Moses, we are now dealing with primarily the Gentiles, but Jews included as well, under this whole new program. Never, ever hinted at anywhere else in Scripture. All right, verse 11. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by other men, but by the revelation or revealing from Jesus Christ. And where's Jesus Christ? In the glory. See? All right, now before we go any further, most of you know this, but there's some out there that may not have ever heard it because I said it before and I'll say it again. Every tract that comes through our office, they never use these four verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul's gospel. And it's just amazing that so few, I won't say nobody, but so few use it. I, I can't understand it. 
because there is no other portion of Scripture that is so simply put. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. <coughs> Moreover, brethren, see, he's writing to believing Gentiles over there in Corinth in Greece. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, not a gospel, the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. In other words, they had now been brought out of paganism, and they are standing in this glorious gospel, and the power of the Holy Spirit that is keeping them from falling back into it. All right. And which, by verse 2, by which also you are saved. See how plain this is? This is the gospel that saves us today. <coughs> not taking Jesus into your heart. Not believing that he's the Messiah. Not believing a lot of other things that were being thrown at us. It's believing this gospel that saves lost people. All right? So by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory. In other words, you understand what I'm preaching. Unless you believe in vain. But here's the gospel. Plain and simple. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. Now see, that's why I call chapter 9 the pillar. As Abraham was the pillar for Israel. That's why this apostle is the pillar now for the body of Christ on which it rests. All right, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received from the ascended Lord, remember, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's Paul's gospel. Now, that never elevates Paul. Like he told the Corinthians, he said, I didn't die for you. But Paul is the designated apostle of the Gentiles. All right, now let's finish our few moments back in Galatians chapter 1, where he rehearses his salvation and being designated as the apostle of the Gentile. All right, verse 13. For you have heard of my conversation or my manner of living in times past in the Jews' religion and how beyond measure I persecuted the church, the assembly of God, the Jewish assembly back there in Jerusalem. Profited in the Jews' religion. He was one of the big wheels in Judaism. Above many my equals my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my father. Like I said earlier, he was a religious nut. He was a zealot. All in the name of his religion. Verse 15, but, see, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me as the designated apostle to the Gentiles, that as he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by grace to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the heathen, the Gentiles. See that? Immediately, while he's in Damascus, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. All right, now in the 52 seconds we've got left, I always make this simple illustration. Here you've got this religious Jew who has been raised and lived most of his life in the land of Israel, knew all about Christ's earthly ministry, knew who those 12 apostles were. Don't think he didn't. What would have been the logical thing to do? Well, go back to Jerusalem, look them up and say, look, fellas, tell me everything you know. God has called me, but I don't know. But God wouldn't let him. God forbid, forbid Paul or Saul to have any contact with those 12 men. Now, just think about that. Why? because of God's own purposes. He was not going to let those 12 men influence his other apostles. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. 
or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in on kind of a chilly day in Oklahoma, but we're glad that you braved it and you're here, and uh, we just appreciate so much that you folks here in the Tulsa area come in and uh, comfort us with your being here because it's the only way I can teach. And again, we always like to remind our television audience how we do appreciate your letters and your prayers and on behalf. And speaking of prayer, you remember in one of my recent programs, I mentioned that the young red-haired lady that always sits here in my front row was fighting brain cancer, and she's been gone about two months, and Sharon is back with us today. And uh, we want our whole national television audience to know how she appreciates your prayers. After that went on the air, she actually had contact from people out there. So uh, when I saw her today, I said, well, I just better let the audience know that Sharon is back. And uh, she's not over the hill. She's not out of the woods. She still has to uh, take some chemo. But we just praise the Lord because she has meant so much to the ministry. She's the one that did uh, the closed captioning and so forth. All right, we're going to... Uh, Pick right up where we left off in our last program, which for those of you here were a couple, three weeks ago, but for those of you on television, it was just a week ago. And uh, we're going to jump in at Matthew chapter 9, and we're just going to review a little bit before we carry on from where we left off, because uh, I see it more and more all the time. You've got to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. So I'm not going to apologize for it. We just covered this, but I'm going to repeat it just to uh, remind everybody where we're coming from. All right, that'd be in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to start reading in verse 35, and then we're going to skip right over to chapter 10 in verses 5 and 6. All right, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease, not just one here and there, but every sickness and every disease among the people. All right, now as you come down into chapter 10 then, he chooses the 12 disciples, and we don't have to read those names, but you can just jump across then to chapter 10, verse 5. Chapter 10, verse 5, these 12, now remember this at the onset of his earthly ministry, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, that's the key word, he commanded them saying, go not, and I have to emphasize that, go not into the way of the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but... Instead of going to Gentiles, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what the Word of God says. Now, that is as plain as language can make it. You don't go that way, you go that way. There's no making up your mind. You do what I tell you. All right? Now, we know what happened after the three years of earthly ministry. The nation of Israel rejected it all brought about the crucifixion, which, of course, had to happen. And then Peter and the eleven, even after Judas is gone and they replace him with Matthias, they too continue on with that same message, the same signs and wonders and miracles. Only difference is now Christ has ascended back into glory. But their operation, the modus operandi, stays the same. They're still preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're still hoping to convince the nation of Israel that the one they crucified was indeed the Christ. Repent of it. Believe that he's alive. He's been raised from the dead. He's gone back to glory, but he's going to come very soon and still fulfill all the Old Testament covenants and promises. But, you see, 
God had something else on his mind, which was totally, totally secret to every other writer of Scripture. You cannot find anything of this anywhere in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, or Acts, or Revelation, or anybody else, because God is now going to take the opposite tack. And that's in Acts chapter 9, where we were probably just a few programs back, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, and he's just experienced the horrendous meeting of the Lord out there on the road, and I think it left him physically devastated. He was blind. He was probably dehydrated. He was famished, and he actually needed physical help to get into the city of Damascus. But while his friends are helping him along the way, God leapfrogs into the city, and approaches one of those believing Jews who no doubt old Saul of Tarsus had on his list to arrest and take back to Jerusalem. All right, so now we're going to come in in Acts chapter 10, just uh, Acts chapter 9, just for sake of review now. And uh, verse 10, where the Lord says, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord, and the Lord. Now remember, where's the Lord? In heaven. He's ascended. So we're dealing with the crucified, buried, risen, and ascended Lord from glory. And he says, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. He still hasn't gotten over that tremendous experience out there on the road. All right, and he hath seen in the vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So he says, Saul knows you're coming. All right, now look at Ananias' response. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints or those believing Jews at Jerusalem. You know the account, how that he arrested them, threw them into prison, and if possible, put them to death, persecuted them without end. All right, and now Ananias is rehearsing all that to the Lord. And now he says, here he is in Damascus. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind or arrest all that call on thy name. In other words, Jews who were embracing Jesus as the Messiah, which was contrary to Orthodox Judaism. All right, but now here's the verse we come for. But the Lord said, from heaven, go thy way. For he, this Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, what's the point I'm making? Back three years ago, the Lord told the twelve, go not to the Gentiles, go only to the house of Israel. Now, these three some years later, it's, well, it's a little more than three years later, it's about uh, three, almost seven years after Pentecost, I'm sorry, seven, eight years later, now God is going to let Israel go, and he sends this man to the Gentile. And that's the point I try to make over the phone with people. They just, they never hear it in church. They never hear it taught in Sunday school. But here you have two direct opposite commandments, not a contradiction, it's a change of program. He tells the twelve, go not to the Gentiles. He tells this man, you're going to go to the Gentile. Okay, now that can bring us up to where we left off in our last taping, in the last program. And now I want you to jump over with me to Galatians chapter 1. Because this is so hard for people to see, especially theologians and Bible teachers and preachers. They just can't see that here we have two totally different programs. I read it, I hear it. Well, there's nothing different. Paul just preached the same thing, only in a little different atmosphere. Peter and Paul never had any difference of opinion. They all preached the same thing. No, they did not. You remember my last program, I put on the statement from Lewis Berry Chafer. My, I hope people will cut that out and pin it on the wall, where he said exactly what I say. The gospel of the kingdom was God's nation of Israel based on his Messiahship. Under the law, nothing had changed. The temple was operating. But to this man, this 
new apostle, this new direction, he is now not offering the gospel of the kingdom, but the gospel of the grace of God, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as Sperry Chafer said in that statement, I put on the screen, what an absurdity to try to say that the Pauline gospel of death, burial, and resurrection is no different from the kingdom gospel, which was before the cross ever happened. And they didn't know he was going to go to the cross. How could they preach it? Well, they couldn't and they didn't, see? All right, so that's what we have to constantly point out. All right, now then, coming over to Galatians chapter 1, still a review from the last program. Verse 11, where now Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is God's word just as much as what the Lord himself said in read back in the Gospels. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, that is, by other men, but by the revelation or a revealing from Jesus Christ. And never forget, where is he? In glory. So from glory, God supernaturally, through the work of the Holy Spirit, however you want to do it, revealed to this man this whole new modus operandi is what I like to call it. All right, now verse 13. For we have heard, you have heard of my conversation or manner of living in past in the Jews' religion. How beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, which was the Jewish church at Jerusalem, and these Jewish believers wasted it, destroyed it. Verse 14, profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of the fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, my, the man didn't deserve it. He hadn't worked for it it was all of grace. And what was the purpose? To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And immediately, now it wasn't within the next five minutes, but within the next few days, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. All right, now I'm going to stop right there. If Paul is preaching the same thing that Jesus and the Twelve preached, then why does the Holy Spirit inspire the Apostle to say that I conferred not with flesh and blood? Why did Jesus make sure that this man would have nothing to do with those twelve men down there in Jerusalem? He wasn't going to get it all mixed up because he was going to come out with something totally different that these men knew nothing of. And so everything, if you watch the scripture, everything is done to keep Paul from them until he's established enough that now he can go back and uh, compare notes with them. All right, now then, keep your hand in Galatians. We're going to come right back, but back up again to Acts chapter 9. And this is still a little review. <clears throat> when we find that after Saul of Tarsus plays his hand, recognizes that now he is indeed a believer that Jesus was the Messiah. Again, the Orthodox Jews of Damascus were in a dither, and uh, they only had one object, and that was to get rid of him. All right, so now then you come down to verse 20 and 21 of Acts chapter 9. After he's come through that experience on the road. He's been baptized according to the kingdom operation because that's what saved him. He didn't yet believe in a death, burial, and resurrection. All he believed that this Jesus that he thought he hated was indeed the Christ. Don't lose that. That's the basis of his salvation. So he has to still come through the baptism bit. So after he's baptized, he went straightway, verse 20, preaching Christ in the synagogue. Well, that's not what God intended. God intended him to go where? To the Gentile. See? But you see, he's still adhering to that Jewish mindset that he had to prove to Israel that Jesus was the Christ, which is what he'd been hearing for three years while he was up there in Israel. All right, so now he's continuing on that same line that Jesus was the Christ and that Israel had to believe that. 
All right, verse 21. All that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And they came hither, that is, up to Damascus, for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But as a result of that conversion out there on the road, Saul increased the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. Not a word about the death, burial, and resurrection. Not a word about the cross. Still on that same premise that Jesus of Nazareth was that promised Messiah. Now, you see, in God's providence and in God's miraculous power, he could have just simply done with Saul like he did with uh, Philip, I think, back there with the Ethiopian eunuch. Here he was on the road down to Ethiopia, and the next minute you know, he's up there at Azotus back in Israel. I think God just picked him up and set him down. Well, why didn't he do that with Saul of Tarsus? Well, you see, God operates on two different levels. Sometimes he will do the supernatural. But most generally, he uses common circumstances to get people where he wants them. That's true of every one of us, I'm sure. We are where we are spiritually because God has just simply maneuvered us by one event, another, closed doors, open doors, and here we are, just exactly where God wants us. Every one of you, whether you know it or not. All right, so now God isn't going to do the supernatural. He's not going to just lift Saul up and set him down in the desert. He's going to use circumstances. And what is it? They're going to threaten his life. Okay, now let's read on. After many days, in verse 23, were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. They thought that if he would try to escape Damascus, they'd be able to nab him and put him to death, and that would end it. But, you see, after they got aware of this conspiracy to kill him, his friends now, these believing Jews, as they're called disciples, in verse 25, took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. All right, now as we said when we taped last time, there is a gap here of time between verse 25 and 26 because we know he did not go from that basket experience in Damascus right back to Jerusalem because that was the last thing God wanted. He did not want him to have contact with the twelve. All right, so then that's why we got to flip right back to Galatians chapter 1 that after they let him down in the wall, let him down the wall in a basket. What happened? All right, here it is. Verse 17. Verse 17. He didn't do the logical. Neither, he said, did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, which, like I said in the last program now, that would have been the logical. Go back and ask the twelve. Tell me everything about this Jesus that you know. But no, that's not God's way. So now God providentially gets him out of Damascus and evidently picks up with some kind of a supernatural way of taking him down into the desert of Arabia. See, reading on in verse 17. I did not go to them who were Paul's before him, but I went into Arabia, returned again to Damascus, I think because that's where the primary trade routes were, from Damascus up over the Golan Heights, down around the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and down into what is present-day Megiddo, and then over the Mediterranean Sea, and down to Egypt. That was the major trade routes from the Far East, see? So that's why I think he goes from that desert experience in Arabia back to Damascus. All right, now then the next verse is what we have to do uh, is just use common sense. It does not specifically say that he spent the three years in the desert, but it almost makes it sound like he spent the three years in Damascus. And let's read it so you'll know what I'm talking about. Verse 17, the last half, I went into Arabia, returned again to Damascus, and then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter in abode in 15 days. All right, now what am I trying to do? There was a three-year period of time there from the time he was let down in the basket until he finally goes back to Jerusalem by way of Damascus. Now, you've got to know your Middle Eastern geography, Mount Sinai, where, again, I didn't take the time to do that. Do that right now. Turn on over to chapter 4 in Galatians, and here's where I get the scriptural concept that he went not just into the desert someplace, but that he went down to Mount Sinai 
Otherwise, I don't see why the Holy Spirit led him to use the term right here just a couple chapters later. But in Galatians chapter 4, when he's speaking of the law and grace allegory between Isaac and Ishmael, he uses, verse 24, he uses this allegory to bring out what I think is a scriptural point. And that is, in verse... 25, for this Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, who in the allegory are the pictures of law, which was of the flesh. It was fleshly. It was powerless. Isaac, on the other hand, is the picture of the spiritual, where we are. All right? But that's not the point I want to make. I want to make the point of geography. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai, where? In Arabia. See? Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, why would that be put in here if it was not a little feedback on what Paul is talking about, that he went into Arabia? And so I've taught it for years that I think the Lord led him down to Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And for three years, he had a person-to-person -person relationship with Saul of Tarsus, unveiling all these things that had never been revealed before. And that's the whole object of Paul's doctrines, that they were never, ever revealed any other place in Scripture until God gave it to him. Now, I'm sure he didn't get everything in those three years, but he got enough that it set him apart from Judaism and where he could make the statement, statement in Romans 6, verse 14, what? You're not under law, you're under grace, see? All right, so now then, after these three years, it says he went up to Jerusalem. So now, the question comes every once in a while from the TV audience, well, did he spend the three years in Damascus? Well, I can't just adamantly say no way, because it doesn't speak of it that way, but logically, logically, had Paul spent three years in Damascus, what would he have left behind? Evidence! There would have been congregations in that city, more than one. But were there? Not a one. Nothing. You never, ever in Scripture see that Paul or Saul left behind any kind of a group of believers in Damascus. So on that basis, I maintain, no, he didn't spend that three years in Damascus. He meant the three years in the desert in the presence of the Lord. And then I have another reason. You know, when uh, Paul was in his ministry, especially amongst the Corinthians, they were always downgrading his authority, his apostleship. And what would they compare him? Well, we can believe Peter, we can believe Jesus, but who are you? Well, you see, with this three-year experience behind him, I think he could come back and he says, well, sure, you had three years with the Lord, but so did I. And the Lord just leveled the playing field. So those are my, my reasons of assumption. Like I say, it's just uh, something that I can't point and say, this is what the book says, like I normally do. But on the other hand, you've got to figure some of these things out with common sense, that he did not spend those three years in Damascus for nothing, but he must have spent that whole three-year time in the presence of the Lord, where he revealed unto him these glorious, glorious gospel of grace truths. All right, now then I think we might as well finish the chapter here in Galatians 1, and then we're going to run back to Acts a minute. So verse 18 again, after three years I went up to Jerusalem. Now that'll fill the gap back there in 9 before between 25 and 26. I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and bowed with him 15 days, but other the apostles I saw none except James, the Lord's brother, Verse 20, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, those Jewish congregations, but they had heard only that he who persecuted them in the time past now preached the faith which he once destroyed. All right, now I'm going to go to the timeline up here for just a little bit and review this as well. From Abraham to Moses to David to the... Uh, Babylonian captivities and the appearance of the prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and all the rest of them, leading us up to Christ's earthly ministry. Then we begin that three years. 
He's rejected. He's crucified. He's ascended back to glory. Now, so far as all of these prophecies were concerned, they were to expect shortly the tribulation to come in. That would trigger the second coming, and in would come all the fulfilled prophecies from back here in the Old Testament in the form of the kingdom. But, unknown to all of Scripture, and I can't emphasize that enough, nowhere, nowhere in our Bible do we have any indication that God was not going to finish everything with that top line. But here in Acts, when we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and we have that specific instruction, don't go this way, you go that way, now God opens up something that is entirely new and different, and you can't find one word, not one word, in the four Gospels, in the Old Testament, or Revelation, or any place else. It's a closed body of truth that we're going to be looking at the rest of the afternoon. All right, so now then, and when you come back to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, instead of the tribulation coming in, as Israel was expecting, God now does something different, and the whole Jewish kingdom program is going to fall through the cracks as Paul's ministry takes the ascending role. So back to Acts chapter 9, and... Uh, at that point now where uh, they laid him down to the basket in verse 25. Now in verse 26, we pick it up after that three years that we just read about in Galatians. And so now, as Paul said, he meets with Peter for the first time. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or attempted to join himself to the disciples, that is, to those Jewish believers now gathered around Jerusalem ever since Pentecost that we talked about last time. But they were all afraid of him. My, they all heard what a vicious persecutor he had been. And they believed not that he was now a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how he had seen the Lord in the way and rehearsed his whole Damascus Road experience. All right, now then in verse 30, in the seconds we have left, we'll see that now there was such a hatred again rising about this new apostle that they had to get him out of Jerusalem and they take him up to Caesarea and they send him forth to Tarsus. What was Tarsus? His hometown. And so he heads up into Gentile territory north of present-day Lebanon, up into southwestern Turkey in our present-day geography, and there he will begin his ministry in his own hometown. And then from there on, we'll pick it up in our next program. But here is where you have that change of direction. Instead of going to Israel, God is now going to go to the Gentile world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and for those of you out on television, we just thank you for joining us and studying with us. My, our letters just keep encouraging us more and more that... Uh, for the first time in people's lives, they're enjoying their Bible, they're studying it, they're reading it, 
And uh, that, that just thrills us, you know, that we're getting people to finally do what God really expects. Because this book, as I've said a hundred times in this program, was made in such a way that plowboys in England could understand it. And if a plowboy in England in 1500 had enough wherewithal to understand this book, then there is not a person in America that can say, well, I can't understand it. It's just a matter of knowing how to read it and how to separate some of these things. So anyway, we're going to come right back in with our connecting the dots. Isn't that right, Jerry? And uh, we started in Genesis, and it's just sort of a, an overview instead of verse by verse like we've done for the last 12, 14 years. And so we're just doing a fast overview, and uh, we're following the timeline as we come up through the Old Testament. We've now come through the four Gospels and the book of Acts, and we have just come past Saul's conversion which means it's the beginning of Saul's ministry to the Gentiles. And so that's where we're going to pick up now in the book of Acts, if you will join me, and uh, come back to, uh, well, I had it here at one time, I moved it, chapter 13, where Paul and Barnabas have just begun their ministry to the Gentile world, having left Antioch. And they stop on the island of Cyprus, and uh, they go to the far western end, where the largest city even today was Paphos. All right, so when you get to verse 5 of Acts chapter 13, when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John, John Mark, their minister. And when they had gone through the island unto Paphos, the city at the far western end, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the deputy or the governor of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, do you get the picture? Here we have a Gentile that is open to the scriptures, and Paul and Barnabas are attempting to get to him so that they can lay it out in front of him. But this fellow servant, who was a false teaching Jew, a sorcerer, did everything he could to keep Paul and Barnabas from him in order for this deputy or this governor not to hear the word. All right, so now just continue reading with me and see what happens. And so verse 8, Elimus the sorcerer, so, so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, see, held them at bay and wouldn't let them in to see the deputy or the governor. And uh, he withstood them and seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is now called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not just a response to an angry Jew against another Jew. This is God's chosen apostle to the Gentile, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, look what he does. He sets his eyes on him, and he says to this false teaching Jew, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease or stop to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, Paul puts it on him. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Thou shalt be blind for a season, seeing not the sun. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. All right, now if you'll just turn while we're in this part of Acts, just turn over to chapter 17, and now we get the big picture. See, Elimus the sorcerer was just a symbol or a picture or a type of the nation of Israel in general as a whole. Now, when we were teaching this back here years and no, years ago, I made the point, I know I did, that God always dealt with Israel back then on two levels, national and individual. And nationally, these things happened, but that still left the individual Jew with the opportunity for gaining salvation, see? So it doesn't that it shut the Jew out completely, but nationally, they were no longer responding as the nation that they were under Moses and so forth. All right, now then, Paul and Barnabas come on to their ministry amongst the Gentiles, and we pick them up again over in chapter 17, where they have now begun their second missionary journey. They started up there at Philippi, and they're coming down the Aegean coast in, in Greece. And, uh, oh my goodness. Let's just drop in at verse 5. 
And I think they're still at Thessalonica. But the Jews who believed not, see, that rejected Paul's message now of grace. The Jews who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base of sword, gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. In other words, they were just adamant in their opposition to anything that Paul was trying to do, see? And then verse 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. All right, now you follow on down. You see that as Paul and uh, Barnabas continue their ministry, it's a constant opposition from the unbelieving Jew. Now, when I say unbelieving, they could not recognize that Jesus was the Christ. They were still orthodox. They were still in their Judaism, but they could not accept that Jesus was the Christ. All right, so here we have the foreview then that this Jew on the island of Cyprus was merely an indication of how God would deal with the nation as a whole later on, see? All right, now then, in order to follow that up, go with me up to Romans now. Chapter 11, and uh, verse 7. And again, it's the same setting. Every place that Paul went, he would always go first to the synagogue of the Jew. And when they would reject him and his message, then he'd go out into the Gentile community and have his converts. But all right, here again, this is what God finally did with the nation. Now remember, I'm emphasizing, individual Jews can still be saved, but nationally, the majority are rejecting everything. All right, verse 6 of Romans 11. And if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. In other words, you can't have both. It's either works or it's grace. Now, under Judaism, of course, it was primarily works. We're going to look at that later. But under grace, it's without works. Now, verse 7. What then? Israel, the nation, has not obtained that which he seeketh for. Well, my goodness, all the way up through the Old Testament, what was being promised to the nation of Israel and what were they looking for? the Messiah and his kingdom. Get rid of all these Gentiles and their oppression. And they could have what we call Shangri-La or whatever, or utopia, if they could just get rid of all these Gentile armies, see? All right, so they had that in their mind that that's what they were looking for, but they didn't want to do it God's way, they wanted to do it their way. And that was their problem. You know, I've shared this, I think, more than once on the program. One of the first times that Iris and I were in the Holy Land, and we were in Jerusalem, and that goes back quite a few years. Might have been the very first time, was it, honey? In 75, 76? And we were coming out of the dining room, one of the hotels in Jerusalem, and uh, a nice, well-dressed gentleman came up to us, and he says, uh, you're Americans, aren't you? Yes. He says, what do you think of our little country? Yeah, it had to be in 75 and 6. I said, it's amazing what God has done. And he bristled. He said, God didn't have a thing to do with it. We did it. <laughs> well, you see, that's their mentality. They don't need God. They can do it on their own. Well, that's exactly what Paul is talking about clear back in his day, see? They couldn't accept the fact that God still wanted to do all these things God's way, but no, they wanted to do it their way. All right, so that which Israel was seeking for, they did not obtain it, but the small percentage of Jews that did become believers are called the remnant. And so the election hath obtained it, and the rest, the vast majority, were what? Blinded. Blinded. Not physically, but to spiritual things, see? Just exactly like the type was set with Elimus, he was blinded physically, but it was a symbol of Israel's national spiritual blindness. All right, now then, if Israel is going to be blinded, and it's not forever, it's not till the end of time, it's only for a season, see? All right, so now if you'll jump ahead with me to Romans chapter 11, verse 25, and we'll be coming back to this same verse a little bit later because you can't help but repeat some of these things. Now you come back to Romans chapter 11, and we'll find that 
the national blindness is going to end, just like Elimus's would end sometime after Paul put that thing on him. He would receive his sight back before he died. All right, now here in 1125, we have the same kind of a picture nationally. Verse 25, where Paul writes to you and I now as Gentiles primarily, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, and this is why I'm going to be coming back to it. It's one of the mysteries that I'm going to touch on in the next few programs. Lest you should be wise in your own conceit, now here's a mystery that no other portion of Scripture ever explained to the place where people could believe it until we get to this apostle. All right? So lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness. See how plain this is? That blindness, a spiritual blindness, has happened to Israel. But what's the next word? Until. That's a time word. So there is coming a day when Israel's blindness will be removed. All right, and when will it happen? Read on. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Well, what's the fullness of the Gentiles that Paul is talking about? The body of Christ. And so when the body of Christ, the outcalling of Gentiles that we're going to pursue now in a little bit, the outcalling of Gentiles is complete and we're out of here now what can God do? Open the eyes of Israel and go back and finish his dealings with them. So God's not through with Israel. Their future is still glorious. And uh, I don't care what people say about God being all through with the Jew. He is not. If he were, then all the promises of the Old Testament fall apart. And then that means that ours wouldn't mean anything either. But God will yet come back and fulfill those Old Testament covenant promises with the nation of Israel after the church has become complete. Now that word after just reminded me of another portion that we're going to look at. Come back with me again to Acts chapter 15. And let's just for sake of time, because we've looked at it several times, Acts chapter 15 is a parallel with Galatians chapter 2. It's the Jerusalem Council of A.D. 51 when Paul and Barnabas had to go up from Antioch to Jerusalem to deal with the Jewish church, the believing Jews, but they were not grace believers, they were kingdom believers. And that's why I'm glad I was able to put it on the screen, that it's not just from me, it's from the likes of Lewis Perry Chafer, and I hope everybody got a chance to read those. But anyway, here we are in the Acts account of that Jerusalem council, and the whole purpose was for Paul and Barnabas to convince James and Peter and John and the rest of the twelve that God was saving Gentiles by faith and faith alone without the ramifications of Judaism. No circumcision, no law-keeping. They've been saved by grace, see? And so this is the big controversy, and finally Paul gets through and more or less wins the day. And now James, who is moderating this particular meeting, comes in then at verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience or listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now verse 13. And after they had held their peace, everything quiets down. The arguing stops. James, out of the Peter, James and John that we're dealing with in especially Galatians chapter 2. And so James answered saying, men and brethren. In other words, he's addressing his... Jewish congregation up there in Jerusalem. Men and brethren, hearken or listen to me. Simeon or Peter has declared, because after all that's what ended the argument when Peter remembered what took place in the house of Cornelius. Peter at the first did visit the Gentiles, now watch the language, to take out of them, who were the them? Gentiles. So you've got to watch your pronouns. God is going to take out of the Gentile world, not everybody, but a small percentage of people for his name. 
Now, of course, no one but Paul ever uses the term the body of Christ, but here it is. Even though Peter, James, and John didn't understand that that's what it would be called, all they realize is that there are going to be Gentiles called out of their paganism or whatever and become part of God's own modus operandi, which, when we get to Paul, will be called the body of Christ. All right, so at the first, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, he witnessed that God would save Gentiles on the spot without repentance, without water baptism, without anything else. He saved them by their faith. All right, now verse 15. James is still speaking, and he says, To this, the calling out of a people for his name, this agree the words of the prophets, for as it is written, after this, see, that's what made me think of it. After this, after what? After God has called out a people for his name. See how it all fits? When the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in? Well, when is that? After this. <laughs> you following me? Good. So after this, the prophet says, I will return. And of course, he's merely the spokesman for God himself. And so God says, I will return and build again the tabernacle. And the other word for tabernacle was temple, remember. And he'll rebuild again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down and has been now for almost 2,000 years. See? And I will build again the ruins thereof. Now, what does that mean? God is still going to finish his Old Testament promises with the nation of Israel. Now, let's go back and look at it. It's in the book of Amos. And uh, you've got to read it with your own eyes. And you come back out of the uh, major prophets, Hosea, or Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. And come to the last chapter, Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. Because this is the very verse that James was prompted to quote. Now here in Amos chapter 9, just like all the prophets of Israel, the major as well as the minor, were always talking about the bad things that would happen to Israel, their chastisement, but the end result would be God's blessing. Well, first was the Babylonian, remember? Then came the Roman invasion of 70 A.D. Now the one that's left is the tribulation and the second coming. All right, so now Amos has brought all three of these around, and you can just jump in at... Uh, Oh, verse 8, so you get the flow, as I call it. Amos chapter 9, verse 8, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it. See what I talked about? The bad things happen before the good things. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. See, he's not going to totally annihilate them. There's going to be a nation of Israel left for end time. Verse 9, for lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. That's why they've been out in dispersion. Like as corn or grain is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In other words, they rebel against all of God's overtures. But now verse 11, see, after all the chastisements, after the horrors of the tribulation are past, now here comes the promise, and this is what James quoted. In that day, when God is ready to come back and finish his work with Israel, in that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, and they shall possess, and so on and so forth. And then you come down to the verses at the end of the chapter, we might as well read them, because this is Israel's future. Don't you ever let somebody tell you that God is through with Israel. No, he is not. Their blessings are coming, the greatest they've ever had. But it won't be until the church is complete, and we're out of the way, and then after that, Yes, here it comes. Now, let's just read them for the thrill of it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of grapes will overtake him that soweth the seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. That is, with blessings, see? And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities. 
inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit. You see what that is? That's just fantastic production. The milk and honey that Israel was promised when they were offered the land of Canaan in the first time. Here it's going to be. It's just going to be glorious, see? And then verse 15, And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord God. Well, when will it happen? After the church has been completed and taken out of the way. All right, now that brings me back then to what I call the third reason that we can open up the timeline scripturally because we have to do it scripturally, otherwise we're just, you know, we're pulling it out of the woodwork, as it says. But here we're going to have the third reason. The first one was that Elimus was a type of Israel being spiritual blinded, but receiving her sight at some time in the future. Then the second one was, as we went back into Romans 11, and uh, the church has to be called out and completed, and in that period of time, Israel is under a spiritual blindness. All right, so I want to come back to that one now again for the last few minutes of this half hour to Romans chapter 11 to again show that we have to have a break in the timeline. Okay, we've got it up here, so I better use it. Here we come. We've come all the way out of the Old Testament, up through the prophets, ever since the Babylonian captivity, and then Israel come back into the land, and they were there, and had temple worship and everything going, and the Messiah appeared. He has his three years of earthly ministry, rejected, crucified, buried, risen from the dead, ascended back to glory. Okay, so now then, we've been in this period of time that all the Old Testament prophets and Jesus spoke of it as being this way. Peter in the 11th thought that they go right on through into the seven years of tribulation and then the second coming and the kingdom. Well, you see, that's where most of replacement theology is even today. They totally ignore this second line. They think everything just keeps on going up here. Well, you know, when uh, years ago we taught those little epistles at the back, Peter, James, John, and Jude. And I know I shocked a lot of people. All those little epistles were written to believing Jews in this point in time, here between the ascension and the tribulation, certainly hasn't started, but they thought it would any time. Here they are. And so all those little Jewish epistles were written to believing Jews to prepare them for the horrors of the tribulation, but they can come through on the other side and have the glories of the kingdom. See? So plain. But what nobody understood, and a lot of Christendom today can't understand, yes, God stopped the timeline right there. And now we drop down to this one. And we open up what Paul refers to, and we're going to look at that all afternoon and maybe the next taping. I don't know how long it'll take. But we open up this parenthetical period of time that we call the dispensation of grace, where God is calling out the Gentile body of Christ, and when it's full and out of way, yes, then he's still going to finish this program, but now it's down here. To me, it's so plain, a five-year-old should understand it, but, you know, most of Christendom can't get it. They just ignore Paul. It's just unbelievable, the mail that we get. I, I had one call. Maybe I referred to it before. I know I did to a couple of my classes. I had a lady in a far part of the country uh, write me and across the top of her newspaper, she wrote, Now I see what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. Well, there was a letter to the editor in there, and it was the most venomous language you could ever imagine and still be printable all against the Apostle Paul. Some of the language, she said, they kicked him out of Greece, they kicked him out of Turkey, and what an idiot, and see? That's the kind of language they use about the Apostle Paul. Well, if you're going to use that kind of language about Paul, you're not going to be studying him, and so you're going to miss the boat. And that's most of Christendom. They just totally ignore him, or they dislike him. But all right, now if you've got Romans 11:25, I've only got a little over two minutes left. Let's look at it again. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, this secret that was never mooted or hinted at anywhere else in Scripture except what we read in Amos 
But what could you take out of that if you didn't know it after the fact? Nothing. And so same way with some other little statements. It didn't mean a thing until after it was fulfilled, see? All right, so it was a secret kept in the mind of God. And what was the secret? That Israel would go through a time of spiritual blindness, beginning in Paul's day, and it's going to continue right up until the church is gone and the tribulation begins. And then Israel will begin to have an awakening. Now I say begin because it's not going to happen to the whole nation all at once. But you see, as you open up the tribulation, you've got the 144,000. Well, those are just the beginning now then, see? And then the 144,000 circumvent the globe. And then by the time we get to the end, yes, there will be a remnant that will suddenly realize who Jesus Christ really is. All right, so finishing verse 25 now again. That blindness, a spiritual blindness in part, has happened to Israel, see? Specifically the nation of Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. In other words... Israel will not respond in great numbers to the gospel until the church is gone. Now, we always rejoice to everyone that we get, naturally, but we're not going to make a big issue of it that you have to see every Jew saved before anything can happen because God has his own timetable for the nation of Israel. But never lose sight of the fact that he has not walked away from Israel and their promises they're still going to enjoy it, but until that day comes, he's still working through the body of Christ. He's still out there with the gospel of the grace of God, and it's our responsibility to just simply tell it to whomever we can that Christ died for the sins of the world, he was buried, and he arose again. That's the gospel. That's plain and simple. See, now, how in the world can they accuse me of anything so false if that's what I primarily proclaim? That's salvation, see? That's it in a nutshell. And oh my goodness, I wish you could see our letters and re hear our phone call over and over and over. It's the same thing, see? How that God opened my eyes and for the first time, I'm believing the gospel and I know I have salvation. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible Ministry, if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have you all back from your coffee break. And for those of you joining us on television, again, I always have to remind folks that we're just an informal Bible study. Hopefully, I'm not going to preach at you. We'll leave that up to the evangelists and so forth. But we do like to teach it in a way that you can study it on your own and uh, enjoy your Bible. Don't just read it because you think you have to. But uh, let it be a joyful experience. Okay, we only have one book that we always continue to let people know is available, and it's our question and answer book. It covers a lot of things, and uh, it's uh, had a lot of uh, good response. A lot of people use them, almost hand them out like tracks. Instead of a little track, they hand out a question and answer book. Okay, now the studio audience, for those of you out in television, the studio audience has let me know that I not only skipped number four, or five, which we did in our last half hour, but I also skipped number four. And somehow or other, that didn't come out in my bookkeeping, so we're going to pick up on them. It doesn't make any difference in the order. So turn with me now to Colossians chapter 2, and we'll spend a few moments, probably not as much as I would have had I had my thoughts all in order, but uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, but we're going to start with verse 1. Colossians 2 beginning with verse 1. 
For Paul says, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, which of course were two little cities, sister cities almost, right out there east of Ephesus in Turkey, as we know it. And for them in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. In other words, Paul was not instrumental in starting these two little congregations. Colossae and uh, Laodicea were evidently begun by converts from maybe Ephesus or even some of his other churches. So he had never been there to see them face to face. All right, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and we've been stressing that, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement, or ready to accept the fact, of this mystery, the mystery of God, and the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, I think all the apostle is doing here is reminding us again of the triune God. In fact, you can just go a little further in this same chapter, going on down to verse 8 and 9. Because, see, these are things, as I said in the last taping already, that you do not find anywhere else in Scripture. It was left for this apostle to reveal these things that God had providentially kept secret, see? And that's why I just told a gentleman yesterday, Jehovah's Witnesses, the wife was only in it about nine years, so she had a better chance. But the husband had been in it since birth. And so after watching my program for not all that long, she saw the truth of all this and was genuinely saved and came out of it. But she wanted me to talk to her husband because she said he's starting to look at it, but he's been in it all his life. He, he is having such a hard time. Would you talk to him? Yes, gladly. And he was a real nice gentleman. You know, a lot of times these people, they're abrasive. They're against you. But he was real open. And uh, so we talked a good long while, over half an hour. So finally, I left the conversation with him this way. I said, look, if for the next three or four weeks you will just read nothing in your Bible but the book of Romans, and then for another week or two read the, best, the rest of Paul's epistles on through Philemon, I then call me back. And uh, I said, we'll just pick it up on the phone. Well, fortunately, they're in an area in... Wisconsin, where I'm going to be in August and September, and so they promised that they would be coming to one of my seminars up there. All right, now here's where prayer comes in. You just pray that these people will just get this full understanding of who God is. Now, those of you who have been approached by Jehovah's Witness at your door or wherever, I think you're all aware that they cannot accept the fact that Jesus Christ is God. He was something less than God. He was through an act of reproduction somewhere along the line, but they can't accept that he was part of the Godhead. All right, and that's what made me think of them. See, what Paul is talking about here as being the mystery of God is his triuneness, if I can put it that way. That he's a one God, according to Deuteronomy. Absolutely he's one God, but he is still in three persons. Now, there's no way we humans can understand that because it's into the realm of the Spirit, see? So how do we take it? By faith, see? God says it, that settles it. Why question it? Like I tell more and more people when they come up with these things that are not definitively answered in Scripture, hey, if it doesn't affect your salvation, if it doesn't affect your eternal destiny, if it doesn't affect your Christian walk, if it doesn't affect your hope for the end here on this planet, Wait till we get there, and then we'll have all understanding, see? And I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. Don't try to find something that the Scripture doesn't address. Wait till we get there, and we're going to have full knowledge. But here is an item that Scripture does address. God is a God of three persons, see? All right, down to verse 8. 
Paul writes to these Gentiles in Colossae and Laodicea now, beware or be careful, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Oh, now listen. If the Colossians needed this, we need it today a million times more because the false stuff is coming in like a tsunami. And now listen, when a tsunami is coming, you've only got one way to go. And what is it? High ground. That's the only way you can go. You've got to hightail it for high ground or you're never going to make it. Well, that's where we are with false teaching today. It's just coming in like a tsunami, and all we can do is race for a place of safety. And what's our place of safety? The Word of God. See? The Word of God. This is it. All right, now listen. Don't let anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain or false teaching, vain deceit, after the tradition of men. Now, in all of this tsunami of false teaching that's coming up lately, especially in the term the emergent church, and I tell everybody, run from it like an emerging, like a tsunami, because even though it sounds good, it sounds valid, reputable men are embracing it, that doesn't change it. You run from it. Because, see, what they're trying to do is take us back to the early church fathers. That, that, that's one of their premises. We've got to get back to the teachings of Origen and uh, Justin Martyr and Christostome and Anastasius and some of those. Listen, every one of them were heretics. Every one of them. And yet everybody has been resting on the church fathers for ever so long, and now they're trying to take us back to them. Well, I think I mentioned it one day last week. All it's really amounting to is getting the world ready for the tribulation one world church where anything and everything is going to fit together, see? All right, but Paul says, hey, you stand alone. Run from all this stuff, see? After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Now, again, we have to remember, as we saw in our last taping, you go back over here to chapter 1, and I could repeat it every week because it is so earth-shaking. Come back with me right now to chapter 1, verse 15. The pronoun who is referring to the Redeemer up in verse 14, who is the Son of verse 13, who is connected to the Father, up in verse 12. But all right, now into verse 15, here's God the Son. And we covered it in detail in our last taping. Who is the image, the visible manifestation of what kind of a God? Invisible. Why is he invisible? He's spirit. He's spirit. And so no man hath seen God at any time. Now that throws a curve at people. Why not? Because until Christ became flesh, God was an invisible spirit. Again, when the scripture says, no man has seen God at any time and lived, what was it talking about? That triune spirit, Godhead. No one has ever seen that and lived. But once God the Son became visible, of course, that's no longer an instruction because we do see God in the person of God the Son. All right, and that's what Paul is addressing here. See, he is the image of the visible manifestation of the invisible God or the Spirit God. He's the firstborn or he comes before everything else that was ever created. And in verse 16, for by him, by God the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, what happened? Everything that was ever created was created by him. That's why he could go to that cross and take the sin of the whole world. From Adam to the end, everything would lay down. How else could it happen had he not been the creator of everything himself? Nobody else could do that. And that's what we have to emphasize. When we believe in a work of the cross that took not only my sin, but everybody else's, how could he? He was the creator. See, that's what we have to understand. And that's what Paul is revealing for the first time. 
Now you ask the average Sunday school person, you ask the average churchgoer, I don't care whether they're liberals or conservatives, you ask the average church person, who created the universe? What's their answer? God. Well, yes, that's true. But what person of the Godhead? They haven't got a clue because they never read Paul. And I'm going to say some more about that before the afternoon is over. I, I, well, I don't know. I'm already in the second floor. No, I won't get there. But anyway, anyway, they ignore this apostle's letters. I'm always using the expression, they treat him like an unwanted stepchild. Oh, he's there, but we don't want anything to do with him. And I can tell it in the articles I read, in the sermons I listen to, they just avoid this apostle. And I read, I think I referred to it in the last taping. You go back into church history, starting with these early church fathers. Did they put any emphasis on Paul's apostleship? Not on one of them. Where was all their emphasis? Er earthly ministry. The Sermon on the Mount. And that's as far as they ever get, see? Oh, it's sad how that the millions upon millions down through history have been totally deceived and misled. All right, but he said, down back to my text in chapter 2, the mystery of God, how that we are not to be deceived by the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. He is the key of everything. And here's why, in verse 9. And I love this verse. Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him, not the Father, not the Spirit, but the Son, see? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And what's the Godhead referring to? The Trinity, the triuneness, see? Now, I'm beginning to shy away from the word Trinity because it's not in Scripture. You know that? The word Trinity isn't in our Bible as such. But the triune, see? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. And Jesus Christ now is the manifestation of that triune God bodily. See? We're going to see him someday. He's in a body. And he will be for all eternity. And I always put it this way. He condescended to limit himself to that body for the sake of the salvation of the human race. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to. He could have just as well stayed an invisible spirit. He went eons and eons and eons of time that way, as far as we know. But for the benefit of saving the human race, he confined himself now to that body in which he will dwell for all the rest of eternity, if I understand Scripture, see? All right, now verse 10. And you, as a believer, you and I, as a believer, are complete in him. In other words, when we place our faith in that work of the cross plus nothing, do we need anything more? No, that's all we need. It's complete, see? And he is the head of all principality and power. Now we might as well keep on going. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made with out hands, not a physical circumcision, a spiritual. Well, you all know by now, you've been studying with me long enough, circumcision is a cutting off of that which was superfluous. So in the spirit realm, what's superfluous? The old Adam. We don't need him. He's superfluous. He's worthless. And so he's been cut off by an act of God, not by an act of a human being. That's the circumcision made without hands. And it puts off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now then, verse 12, buried with him in baptism. Not water, but Holy Spirit. See? And now i got to chase another verse, don't we? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've got to cover everything with Scripture. <coughs> First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Now this is the baptism that Paul refers to. Romans chapter 6, and here in Colossians chapter 
2, and in other scriptures, whenever he speaks of baptism, this is what he's talking about. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we are all, every last believer, has experienced this baptism. Every believer. And there's no denominational connection whatsoever. This is a thing between the believer and God himself. So by one Spirit, we are all baptized or placed or positioned into one what? Body. The body of Christ. See? No church can do that. No denomination can do that. Only God can do that. And so every believer now then becomes a member of this body of Christ by virtue of the Holy Spirit placing us into that body. And so even though we're many, we're one, and so also is Christ. All right, back to Colossians chapter 2 once again. So we're buried with him in baptism, that Holy Spirit baptism, where also you are risen with him. See, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us out of deadness into life. And through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. See, there are certain elements of Paul's epistles that just keep popping up and popping up. Three of them are faith, hope, and charity. They just keep popping up all, all through Scripture. The other one is the death, burial, and resurrection. It just keeps coming to the top over and over. Why? Because they're paramount to our position in Christ. See? All right. Now then, verse 13. And you, being dead in our pre-salvation existence, we were spiritually dead in your sins and the uncircumcision. We hadn't been cut off from old Adam. He still controlled us. And that's all in our past, see? And so being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, God, up in verse 12, he has quickened or made you alive together with him, that is, with Christ, who also now has been raised from the dead. But here's the best part of all. We've been what? Forgiven. How much? Up until today? No, you're forgiven. Past, present, and future is already placed under the blood of Christ. Forgiven all our trespasses, see? And that's not licensed by any stretch. It's just something that should sober our thinking. That Christ has done that much on our behalf without our lifting a finger? Yes. The moment we believe it, he considers our whole sin problem forgiven and in the past, and it's done and never to be brought before us again. All right, now then you come on into the next verse. See, I, I wouldn't plan to do this. Can't help it. You just got to keep going. Blotting out. Why? Because we've placed our faith in that finished work of the cross. We've been forgiven. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. And now these are things we have to understand. Don't be plagued by these things from the past. Don't let somebody come out of something that was taught to Israel in the four Gospels and say, well, you got to do this. Oh, no, I don't, because I'm under a whole new program. See? And what is it? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Now, I like to think of the 613 rules and regulations that came out of the Ten Commandments in Judaism. 613 rules. Man, that was all nailed to his cross, see? It was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. What does it do when you crucify? You put it to death. So all these rules and regulations were put to death. Now, verse 15 having spoiled or defeated principalities and powers. Now, when we speak of principalities and powers in scriptures, whose power are we usually referring to? The satanic, see? And so all the satanic principalities and powers are utterly destroyed so far as we are concerned. They're defeated, see? 
Why? Because he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it by his work of the cross. When he rose from the dead in victory and power and majesty, see, and, impu and uh, imparted, or imputed is the word looking for, and imputed all of that to you and I as a believer. All right, reading on. Verse 16. Therefore, see? Therefore, let no man judge you or point an accusing finger at you because you aren't keeping such and such a rule or because you aren't keeping such and such a law. Hey, that's all been crucified to me. I'm set free from it. So don't let anybody judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You see how plain this is? Why? That was all nailed to his cross. We're free from it. And look at the millions of people that are still laboring under a Saturday Sabbath. And if they don't keep it, they're going to hell. Well, the poor people, yeah. Yeah, they are. Whether they keep it or not. Because they're not putting their faith in this finished work of the cross. Oh, it's so sad. And they're under that legalism. They're afraid to break out from it. And if they don't, then they are. They're doomed. They're not going to make it. So don't let anybody judge you as a believer in what you eat or what you drink or in respect of holy days, going back to Judaism, of course, or the new moon, which again was part of Judaism, when the first little sliver of the new moon, then that set the next month in motion. All right, and uh, same way with the Sabbath days. They are, they're all a thing of, of the past. We have no Sabbath day per se. Now, verse 17, what did it all amount to? Well, it was all a shadow, see? It was a shadow of things to come. Now I come back to one of my favorite illustrations. You already know what it is, don't you? The big old beautiful tree with the sunlight shining behind it. What lays out on the ground? The shadow. And you remember the old fellow came along, wanted to buy that beautiful tree to make furniture, and the guy says, no, I won't sell you the tree, but I will sell you the shadow. How much furniture can you make with a shadow? Well, none. How much salvation can you get keeping the law of Moses, which was a shadow? None. Get the picture? Oh, it's all so obvious. That was all part of the looking forward, but it has no validity for us today. All these things were a shadow of things to come. Well, let's see. I wanted to make one more comment yet before we go away from this mystery. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And remember our subject for this half hour is the mystery of God. Who is he? What is he? Well, he's a three-person Godhead operating as one. And here we have two of them in Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 20. And it's also an instruction for prayer. How do we pray? Well, here it is. Ephesians 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the formula for prayer. You approach God the Father, however you want to do it. If you want to start out like the Lord's Prayer, our Father which is in heaven, that's absolutely legitimate. But somehow or other, you address the Father, and you're going to ask and pray everything then in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now then, in the minute we have left, let's go back to Romans chapter 8, where we pick up so explicitly the third person of this triune God, the Holy Spirit. And you remember when we were teaching Romans, we pointed out that in those first seven chapters, the Holy Spirit was hardly ever even alluded to. And that's why Paul had the problems that he had in, verse, in chapter 7. But then you get into chapter 8, and the Holy Spirit just breaks out all over the place, just like blossoms in the springtime. Every place you look in Romans chapter 8, you've got a reference to the Holy Spirit. All right, starts right out in verse 1. 
Romans 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. See? All right, now just come on down. We'll do this quickly. Verse 11, But if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, see, resurrection again, and if that Spirit dwell in you, he that raised up Christ the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his Spirit that what? Dwelleth in you. And then you come over to verses 14 down through 17. Again, it's the operation of that third person of the Trinity. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. See that? They are the children of God. Verse 16, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. You see the role of the Holy Spirit? It's everywhere. God the Father, God the Son, and God Thank the Holy Spirit. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. That's better, and we're glad to see everybody back from your coffee break again, and we'll just go into the third program now this afternoon, and we are in book 76, for those of you out in television, and uh, we're in the final four programs of that book, right, Jerry? And uh, hopefully we can get through the next two mysteries in uh, these next two programs, and that will put everything then in Book 76 concerning these mysteries. That would kind of work good, wouldn't it? Okay, so those of you in television, we're just asking you now to turn with us to Romans chapter 11. The studio audience is already waiting, and we're going to drop down into verse 25, and we're looking at the sixth mystery up here on the board, which is the blinding of the nation of Israel to spiritual truth. Now, these things are hard to comprehend. I know they are. I'll comment on it in a little bit. <coughs> Romans <coughs> chapter 11, verse 25. For Paul writes, For I would not, brethren. So he's writing to believers, as I'm always emphasizing. Paul never writes to the unbelieving world. But I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery or secret lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Now here's the mystery. That blindness, spiritual blindness, in part, for a period of time, not from here till eternity, but for a period of time, blindness has happened to Israel. And it's going to remain until, that's the time word, the fullness or the completion of the Gentiles they come in. Now, when Paul speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles, I have to feel he's talking about one thing and one thing alone, and that is the body of Christ. And so as we get closer and closer to the end of the church age and the body of Christ is nearly full, Israel is back in the land where she has to be. Maybe a lot more will have to come yet. But whatever, Israel has to be a... Uh, sovereign entity, which they are, and they've already come back from many, many of the nations of the world, but uh, they're still in a spiritual blindness. But you know, that's been Israel's problem from day one, see? And the people have been so prone to unbelief, and it's always been that small remnant that remains true 
to a faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, just to show you how all of this comes about from way back, uh, I've got to go back to 1 Kings, way back in the books of history. 1 Kings. First Kings, chapter 19. Oh, I'm in Samuel. No wonder it didn't look right. First Kings, chapter 19. Should be verse 18. Yeah, there it is. First Kings, chapter 19, verse 18. And of course, God is speaking here. He says, yet I have left me, or I have kept to myself, 7,000 in Israel, all the knees who have not bowed to Baal. Now, you'd think it'd be the other way around. You know, maybe 7,000 fell into idolatry, but it wasn't. Out of the whole 7, 8 million, what I usually put on the number of Israel's population down through their antiquity, Somewhere around 7, 8 to 10 million. Today they're 15 million. But only 7,000. Now you've heard me refer to this one over and over. That boiled down to about one-tenth of one percent of Israel who were remaining loyal to the God of Abraham. The rest had succumbed to idolatry, see? Of all people? Now, here's where I think I better make my comment before I go any further. You've heard me say it with regard to the beginning of the human experience, that God set the whole system of humanity on planet Earth in motion, back there in Genesis. And he gave mankind a free will, right? God did not use them like puppets on a string. And yet here we are 6,000 years later. Is God's schedule still on time? Absolutely. To the last jot and tittle after 6,000 years of human history of men's free will to declare war, sign peace, and do all these horrible things, yet everything is exactly where God programmed it. Which tells you what? He's in control of everything, which makes you ask the next question. Then why all the misery? Well, that's hard to answer, isn't it? Why, if God is in such total control, has he let the human race bring in so much misery and discomfort and heartache if he could have programmed it differently? Well, I can't answer that. You can't answer that. But it's just one of the unique things of Scripture that God in his sovereignty has permitted all these things. I don't think he directed it per se, but he's permitted it. And you look at the suffering in the world today in this enlightened age with all of our technology, there's more death and murder and sorrow than any other time in history. Well, why? Well, because this is the way God programmed it. All right, now with the nation of Israel, it's the same way. God miraculously brought Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, miraculously brought him into faith, miraculously gave him all the promises, following it up with the others, Isaac and Jacob, and then those that followed. And in spite of all the promises and all the evidences that Israel's God was the eternal creator God, yet what happened to the nation spiritually for the most part? They departed. They went into idolatry. They went into rebellion. And God would discipline them. And they'd go out like to the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. How many of them came back to the homeland when Cyrus came up and said, all right, Israel, you can go back to Jerusalem? How many took the offer? Again, out of seven, eight million people. 
44,000, something like that. That's all. Just a little handful comparatively. Was that according to God's design? Yes, absolutely. That's the way he designed it. And see, these things just boggle the mind, and that's why we got to just come away from all of this thinking and trying to figure it out. Take by faith what we can understand. And like I said in the last half hour, if the Bible doesn't definitively give you your answers, wait till we get there. And we're going to be able to ask a lot of questions if we have to. I don't think we'll have to. I think we're going to have full understanding and knowledge. But anyway, isn't it amazing that here this chosen nation, this favored nation, would all the way through its history only give a small remnant of obedient Jews or Israelites, whatever you want to call them, to God's service. All right, let's move to the next one. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, and a verse that we've used over and over through the years. And again, just says the same thing. It, it's just so hard to believe. Why? When these people were so favored, and because of their unbelief, they became almost what we would think the unfavored. If you remember ever watching Fiddler on the Roof, what did the old boy, the main character, what did he say? Well, if we're the favored nation, I wish he'd choose someone else for a while. Well, I can understand why they would. Why would God treat us the way he treats us? Well, because of their disobedience, their unbelief, see? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Except, or unless, the Lord of hosts. There again. See, now, Paul would define that. Who is it? Well, it's God the Son in his Old Testament operation. So, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we would be like unto Gomorrah. And that would mean what? Destroyed. But what kept God from destroying the nation? That little small percentage of faithful. The rest turned their back on Jehovah, and went into abject idolatry. All right, we can take the next one now then from uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Go back a few pages. Back into the history again. Ezra and Nehemiah. These are the two that led that small contingent of Israelites back from their Babylonian captivity. And uh, go to Ezra first. Chapter 3, Ezra, chapter 3, and drop down to verse 64. All got it? Uh, Ezra, chapter 3, verse 64. Now, you've got to remember that up there in uh, chapter 1, maybe we better look at that first. Keep your hand in chapter 2. Let's go back to chapter 1 first. Ezra, chapter 1. Verse 1. Now, they've been out here in captivity for 70 years. According to your today's news, you should know where that is. That's in the area of present-day Baghdad. But now, verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, Aram, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. Now this is what his proclamation said. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He was the absolute monarch. And he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. Fair enough? They were all free to go. He wasn't holding a one of them back. All right, now come back to where we were looking at chapter 3. How many bought into it? Out of... Oh, it's in chapter 2. You're right, honey. <laughs> You're right. I was looking at the number down below. Chapter 2. Thank you. Chapter 2, verse 64. 
out of those several million Jews, Israelites, who had been taken captive, and Cyrus gives the full permission to go back to Jerusalem and reestablish everything. How many buy into it? Here it is. Verse 64 of Ezra 2. The whole congregation together was 42,360. Isn't that something? Why? What was the matter with the rest of them? They had no interest in what God had for them. They had no interest in rebuilding a temple. They had no interest in seeing Jerusalem become once again the capital of the nation. Why? Because they've become so materialistic. What have they been doing? Oh, they've become bankers. They've become businessmen. They've been now migrating throughout the then known world. That's why wherever Paul went years later, every place he what, went, what did he find? Synagogues of the Jews. But they had no real spiritual life or interest, see? And so now you can come in the Nehemiah. He's the next one, some years later. And uh, come down to Nehemiah chapter 8. Now he's coming back to rebuild the city walls and the housing and in order to make Jerusalem a viable city once again. All right, just to give you a little inkling, Ezra chapter 8, verse 35. Also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, 12 bullocks for all Israel. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, why am I emphasizing this? Well, you see, most of Christendom has bought into this false idea that the ten tribes of Israel to the north disappeared into the captivities of the Syrians and so forth, and that really the only people of Israel that were left after all this were the two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, the biggest lie ever perpetrated on the Christian church. Those ten tribes weren't lost. Most of them had already migrated down into Judah before they were taken captive by the Syrians. And so now here's the scripture proof of it, see? That these twelve bullocks, in other words, one for each one of the twelve tribes. Now this is at the end of the 70 years of captivity, this is the beginning of the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in its homeland. All right? So 12 bullocks for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and so on and so forth. And all I want to make out of that is the proof that Israel was still not just two tribes, but all 12 are now represented. All right, now then let's just take a quick jump because I'd kind of like to wind up this in this half hour and it's going so fast. Jump all the way up to chapter, got to look a minute. I want to go up to Acts and probably be around in 13 or 14. 13. And again, we've touched on this before, but it doesn't hurt to repeat. Now we've got Paul and Barnabas starting their first missionary journey. And after they have left Antioch, they've sailed those few miles west and stopped on the island of Cyprus. And as they went to the western end of Cyprus, they came to the city of Paphos. Still there. All right, now I'll come to verse 6. We'll do this quickly. And when they had gone through the isle of Paphos, or unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, but he was a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Verse 7, who was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, who was a prudent man, who had called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now what have you got? You've got a Gentile who is calling for the apostle of the Gentile. He wants to hear the word of God from this apostle. All right, but this Jew is going to intervene now in verse 8. 
but Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name interpretation, withstood them. In other words, held them back from approaching Sergius Paulus and sought to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Boy, that's strong language, isn't it? Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease or stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? In other words, preventing this Gentile from hearing a Gentile plan of salvation from the apostle of the Gentiles? Now, verse 11, Now behold, Paul says to this sorcerer, this Jew, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be, what? Blind, physically. The rest of your life? No, for a time, for a season. What's the picture? That's Israel's role. They have been the opposing force against God's dealing with the Gentile world from day one. In fact, I can just take you across the page almost in the book of Acts. And uh, you come down to oh my goodness! I thought I could just turn right to it. Maybe I'm going too full. But anyway, all the way through Paul's ministry, especially there in Greece, I guess that'd be a little further. I'm not far enough back. Come back with me to Acts chapter 17. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 17. Now, this is the apostle's second journey. He's up there along the Aegean coast of Greece, north of Athens. And look at the opposition that he's getting from proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles. Verse 5 of chapter 17. But the Jews, see? But the Jews who believed not moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company and set all the city on uproar, assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. See? All right, and then uh, they had to escape for their lives practically from Thessalonica. And now you come on down to verse 12. While they're in Berea now, just south of Thessaloniki, therefore many of them believed, also of honor women who are Greeks and, and of men, not a few. But, see, now verse 13, when the Jews of Thessaloniki had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither, that is down to Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. To do what? To reject Paul's message. And so they have been spiritually blinded in order to make opposition to the promulgation of the gospel through the Apostle Paul to the Gentile. Well, now we can move up to the New Testament, the Gospels rather, and come back with me to Luke. Luke chapter 2. And again, this is some 400 years after they have come back from the Babylonian captivity. That's a long time. And the nation of Israel has now been pretty well established again under the Roman Empire, of course. The city of Jerusalem is thriving. The temple has been renovated by King Herod. And uh, it's time for the Messiah to arrive in his first advent. All right, is the whole nation waiting and ready for this event? No, just a little smattering, see? And I'm just going to point out a few of them. Uh, Luke chapter 2, and first in verse 8, and down unto those next few verses, you have the response of the shepherds to the announcement of the birth of Christ. And they knew what they were looking for, see? 
Verse 8, And there were, say, in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings, great die, great joy unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. All right, now the shepherds responded. They didn't reject that announcement. All right, now then you come on down to verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout. See? So we have that little remnant of believers even at the time of Christ's first advent, but only a remnant. And you can just go through then, just pick out. You go down to verse 36, we have another one. This time it's Anna. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years and so on and so forth. All right, verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So it's just a smattering of a few of these Jews who were still aware of the promises of the Old Testament. And then, of course, we come to the ones that are most well known, Joseph and Mary. Zacharias and Elizabeth, see, the parents of John the Baptist. All right, now then, let's just jump all the way up again to the book of Acts, if you will. Acts chapter 1, and again, we've touched on all these things before, but this is just good review. The response of the Jews of Jesus' earthly ministry. A great percentage? No. Just a few, comparatively. Now, don't let all those crowds that gathered around when he performed the loaves and the fishes and all that, you've heard me say what that was. That was the free lunch. They had no interest in spiritual things. But to fill their belly? Oh, absolutely. It's no different today, see? All right, so now in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And this is a shocking number, that after three years of signs and wonders and miracles, how many did even the Lord Jesus himself gather, at least in the area of Jerusalem? Well, here it is. Verse 15 of Acts 1, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, that is, these believers now who had become followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and they said the number of names together were about how many? 120. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to the whole. But that's been Israel's response all the way through, see? All right, now then we're going to come all the way up to Acts 28, 28. Coming all the way up to the end of Paul's ministry, he is now being taken prisoner to Rome. And he has met with the Jewish leaders of Rome. And they've rejected him out of hand. And as they leave, see? Verse 25. Acts 28, verse 25. And as they leave, they said unto Paul, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear more of thee and what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Then verse 24, some believe the things that were spoken, some believe not. Now, come on down to verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. What has happened to Israel? They're losing their opportunity. Now, when you get into Romans chapter 11, I think i got 40 seconds left. Okay, just quickly turn over to Romans chapter 11. And we have that concluding answer to Israel's dilemma until the church is gone. And then, of course, God will come back and still deal with them. But here it is, verse 7, Romans 11. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were, what? Blinded. And it's so true. My, it is so hard to get a Jew to see these things. Some do. 
it's always been that small, small percentage. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see you all back for program number four this afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, why we trust you understand that I think I better explain this real quickly, that these once a week programs, as you see them on the air, are current. Of course, you all realize that. And then you watch me on Monday through Friday, and all of a sudden I'm 15 years younger. Well, it's just because those are reruns. But uh, a year from now, I'm going to be pretty close, so I'll look just as old on those reruns as I do on the weekends. But that's the format. The weekend programs are, are weekly, and uh, the daily programs are reruns. Okay, yes, my little wife and everybody in the front row remind me. We are in book 76. We're on the last set of four programs. And so the next taping will be the first part of book 77. I got it done. <laughs> I got it done. Okay, this is book 76. All right, we're going to go to the next mystery, and I wish I had two half-hour programs, but since this is going to end book 76, some of it may have to go on into book 77 for those of you out on TV, but uh, I'm going to try and sandwich this in as quickly as I can. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 51, another one of the mysteries that were revealed to the Apostle Paul that had never, ever been even hinted at. And i got to emphasize that because everybody tries to blenderize it and say, well, the two taken at the mill, one taken to the left is the rapture. John 14, where God says, I will go and prepare a place for you, that's the rapture. No, it couldn't be. Because then God would be betraying the, the secret. And God doesn't work that way. God does not lie. All right, now here is the secret that's never been revealed before. And whenever I get letters of opposition, and it's getting worse and worse, not just for me, but for everybody that is proclaiming this end-time event, the rapture, it's coming under attack more and more. In fact, I mentioned last week at the conference in 1998, Tim LaHaye wrote a book, Rapture, Under Attack. Then already. Well, now it is 10 years later, and it's just been compounded, and it's no longer a kind letter that says, well, Les, I just can't agree. Now they attack, see? Where do you get such a dumb idea? And uh, a lot of them like to refer to this Margaret MacDonald. Oh, the minute I see that for you out in television, if you're going to write to me on the rapture, don't mention Margaret MacDonald, because when you do, your letter goes straight in the trash can. And I don't mind telling people that. I got one just the other day, and the first thing I saw, Margaret MacDonald. I didn't even read it. <laughs> Waste basket. You know who Margaret MacDonald was? No. Most people don't, unless you're in my position. But I first ran into it, I'm going to say at least 20 years ago, in one of the five cities where I go and teach, and it happened because many of the people in this one particular large church were in my weeknight class. And he got wind of the fact that I was teaching a rapture. Well, the next Sunday, he puts out hundreds and hundreds of copies of where this idea of the rapture began. And how it went back to the middle 1800s, at the time of John Darby, that there was this teenage girl who was running on less than a full tank mentally, you got it. <laughs> and she had a vision. And in this vision, she saw the Bible opened up dispensationally and the rapture. And so she took it, supposedly, 
to John Darby, and John Darby just jumped on it. Now listen, John Darby was one of the top theologians of his time, middle 1800s. He had already published his own Bible translation. I've got a copy someplace. Tremendous scholar. And you think he would listen to a teenage girl who wasn't all there? But see, that's what they're trying to tell people, that this whole concept was given to John Darby by this whatever, and that he latched on to it, and then from that point on, we have the rise of dispensationalism. That's a lie straight out of the head office of the God of this world, Satan. Don't you ever believe it. Now, I think I shared in the last taping. I had a poor gentleman, I think he was from Kentucky, 88 years old. And he said, Les, I've used my Schofield Bible since I was saved 60 years ago, and now I saw this on the Internet. And he sent me a copy of it. And just pure garbage trying to destroy the veracity and the validity of the Schofield Study Bible. Just literally ridiculing it and had all kinds of reasons why nobody should use it. Well, see, those are the satanic attacks that are coming in in these last days. All right, now, of all the letters that I've had through the years, and there aren't that many, probably what? One a month, if that? I doubt it. We get hundreds of letters a day, and if you get one a month, that's only one out of thousands. But they just immediately start showing me all these scripture verses to refute my teaching of the rapture. Well, where are they getting all their scripture? Old Testament, the four Gospels, and the book of Revelation, and they totally ignore Paul's epistles. So what do I do? I just skim through it, and if I don't see a reference to any of Paul's epistles, wastebasket. They haven't got an ounce of ground to stand on. Why should I bother trying to prove my point? Because the first thing these people have to understand is, as I've already said, only Paul has anything to do with the rapture because only Paul teaches the body of Christ. And anybody can see that by just simply reading the rest of Scripture, and you will not find one reference, not one, to the body of Christ except Romans through Philemon. That's all. Well, now... Does that take such an intellect to put two and two together? That if this apostle alone was given the revelation of these mysteries that would bring about the body of Christ, that these other places would have reference to it and still be called a secret? It can't happen, see? All right, so here's the key. Here's the key. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret. And here's the secret. We shall not all sleep or die physically, but we shall all be changed. Now that's obvious. When we come to the end of the church age, there are going to be living believers. Well, is God going to kill them all first so he can resurrect them from the dead? Well, no way. No way. So once he's resurrected the believers of the body who have died, and they're reunited with their soul and spirit, then the next event is to change those of us who are still on planet Earth from this body to the new resurrected body in an instant. And they can't seem to buy into that because I guess it's too hard. Hey, with God, nothing is impossible, see? All right, so I'm going to do quickly what I did the other night over a period of an hour, and that is show that this idea of believers being taken off the planet before the tribulation begins has absolutely nothing to do with the horrors of the tribulation, which are death and destruction. Not one word. Okay, now I'm going to have to watch time. Ordinarily, I don't do that. But to, on this half hour, I'm going to watch my time. Let's turn first and foremost back to Revelation chapter 6. Now, ordinarily, when I teach Revelation 6, I like to also use Matthew 24, but I'm not going to do that for sake of time today. But in Revelation chapter 6, you can start with verse 1. And here we have the appearance of the Antichrist, or the next event after the rapture has taken place. The church is now gone. 
because we can have nothing to do with death and destruction, which I'm going to show you in these next 18 minutes. But here we do. This is prophecy concerning the second coming. All right, the first seal is the appearance of the white horse, the fake Christ, the Antichrist. All right, then verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second creature say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And this red horse had power to take peace from the earth. All right, now back up real quickly to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And ordinarily, Paul makes very little allusion to prophecy, except in rare occasions, and I think this is one of them, as well as in 2 Thessalonians. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, did I say 4? I meant 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just start at verse 1. Now this is right after his comparison passage with 1 Corinthians 15, up in chapter 4. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, verse 17, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, now you drop down into chapter 5, and we're going to be dealing with those that are left behind. See? All right, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I run to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, now that's the tribulation, those final seven years are called the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, for, now watch this, when they, that is the world's population, when they shall say peace and safety. Now that's the white horse of Revelation 6. The Antichrist is going to come in promising peace and prosperity. Israel will be euphoric. They're going to have permission to rebuild their temple. They can lay down their military. Antichrist is going to promise their borders and their safety, see? And the whole world is in euphoria with him. This guy is supposedly almost the copy of the, of, the, of the true Christ, see? All right, so now Paul is telling us, yes, when the tribulation opens, it's going to be peace and safety. Then, what's the next event? Sudden destruction. All right, now come back to Revelation 6 again, and that's exactly what you've got. After the white horse of peace and safety, now you come into the second horse, and it's red. And this horse takes away peace from the earth, and they're going to end up killing one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, I associate that with the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, where Russia, heading up many of the Muslim nations of the world, will invade Israel. Well, I put it toward the end of the first year of the seven, because in biblical history, if a king came on the throne as much as one day before the end of a year and goes into the next year, that one day was considered a full year. That's biblical timing. All right. Now, if this Russian invasion then comes along at about the 11th month of the tribulation, then Israel still has one month of that year plus six full years to fulfill Ezekiel 39, which says that they will take seven years to clean up the residue of this destroyed Russian army on the hills of Israel. That's why I put it in the 11th month of the seven years of tribulation. All right, but its peace has been taken from the earth. All right, now drop all the way down. As a result of that invasion, of course, there's going to be tremendous loss of food production. Because I honestly feel the Russians are going to preempt everything they've got on North America, knowing that we would come to Israel's defense. But we're going to have enough nukes out there in submarines and flying in planes and maybe some silos that will survive, and we will retaliate and do the same to Russia. So you've got Russia obliterated, you've got America obliterated, the two greatest food production areas of the world are gone. So what's the next great event? Famine. Oh, it's as logical as daylight follows dark. 
famine. See? All right, that's back in Revelation 6. And then, verse 8, or verse 7, Then he sees the fourth angel, and the fourth creature say, Come and see. Now verse 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and hunger, and with death, and so forth. All right. Put two words in that scenario, and what would it be? Death and destruction. Not peace and safety. Death and destruction. All right, now for sake of time, I'm going to jump right over to Revelation chapter 14. And I'm not going to look at the companion portion in Isaiah for sake of time, but if you want to put it in your notes, that would be in Isaiah 63, where this final judgment that's going to come on planet Earth is likened to putting grapes in a grape vat. Now, it stands to reason when they harvested the grapes and they threw them into this huge hollowed-out stone, they can't just let those grapes sit there, so what do they have to do? Crush them. Crush them, one way or another. Now, the one that we saw in Israel for a demonstration, they'd put a couple teenage kids in there, and they would stomp them barefooted. But the whole idea was to crush the grapes so that the juice would run out of a trough on the bottom. All right, now, this is used symbolically of God bringing in the armies that are left in the world to the valleys of Israel, which will become God's grape vat. Okay, Revelation chapter 14. And uh, we'll start at verse 14 and do this quickly. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Speaking of a harvest. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, who sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's time for God's final judgment. And he that sat on the cloud, verse 16, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, having also a sharp sickle. And another angel came out who had power over fire, cried with a loud cry to him who had the sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Verse 19, The angel thrust in his sickle, gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress, not of a vineyard, but of the wrath of God. All right, now we've got to do a little thinking. The vast military that's still left by the end of the seven years of the tribulation, of course, will be the Orient. China has boasted 200 million men army ever since Mao. We're still going to have the millions down in Africa and Europe. I'm maintaining that Russia and America and the Muslim world is already gone. All right, but all these armies that are left of the world, the Antichrist is going to put out the command to bring them to the Middle East to get rid of the Jewish problem. Get rid of Israel once and for all. Well, it'll be a God-directed thing. It's going to be supernatural. And so these men, not knowing really what they're doing, are going to command the armies to make their way to the nation of Israel, and they're going to pack them into the valleys of Israel. Now, we normally think of the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Esdralon, which runs from the northern part of uh, the Sea of Galilee straight west to uh, Mount... Uh, Oh, I would lose the name of that one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Carmel. You can stand on Mount Carmel and you can see the Valley of Megiddo. But you see, just a few miles north is another large valley, flat as a tabletop, called the Hula Valley, which used to be swamp. And when the Jews came back from their dispersion, the first thing they did was drain those swamps, and it's now great farmland. Flat valley. All right, then along the Mediterranean coast, You've got another valley of Sharon, or Sharon. That's the third one. And then you've got another valley, which makes up the Jordan Valley. Now, there you've got the Jordan Valley. You've got the valley of Sharon. You've got the valley of Jezreel, or the valley of Esdralon, or Megiddo, whatever you want to call it. And you've got the Hula Valley. 
Now those valleys will hold millions upon millions of troops. You know, I read an interesting statistic years ago, not that many, but probably in the last 10 years, that every man, woman, and child in America could be put in the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I didn't dream that up. Somebody else did. Because Jacksonville, Florida has a large land area. I looked it up on the map. But you see, when you put people in, like sardines in a can, you can get millions in a small space. And God's going to do it. He's going to cause these army generals, stupid as it may seem, to pack their armies into these valleys of Israel. Why? It's God's grape vat. The human beings are the grapes. But like I said at the beginning of all this, when you get them in the vat, what do you have to do next? You've got to crush them. Okay, now let's just jump across the page in my Bible to chapter 16, and here we have the crushing element. Millions upon millions upon millions of the world's troops packed into the valleys of Israel, and here comes the final judgment. Revelation 16, verse 21. This is the last judgment before the seven years ends and God brings in the scenario for the kingdom. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone the weight of a talent. If you've got a marginal help, it's what? 100 pounds. 100 pound chunks of ice are going to come cascading down on these millions of men out there in the open field. So what have you got? You've got a river of melting ice and blood that will indeed run as deep as a horse's bridle. I think if it isn't already topographically possible, God will make it, and that river of blood will find its way to the Jordan Valley, and it's going to run all the way to the Red Sea, which is, as it says here, 180 miles. That's what's coming. That's the wrath of God. And all of the things from the day that the peace is taken from the earth at the 11th month of the seven years, it's nothing but death and destruction. Everything pertaining to the second coming is death and destruction. Now let's go back and show how Paul warns us for our final days on the planet, and that's going to be in 2 Timothy Chapter 3, and I shared with the conference last week, I was driving home from one of my classes in Oklahoma here a few, few years ago now, turned on talk radio about 9.30 that night, and I happened to catch Michael Reagan. He was just starting his program, and he says, fellow Americans, last night as my wife and I were having our family devotions, I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And he says, when I was through, my wife said, Michael, you have to read this on the air. And so he says, fellow Americans, that's what I'm going to do. And he read. And here it is. Read with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days. Now you want to remember, Paul has only one last day in mind, and that's the body of Christ. He's not concerned about prophecy. He's dealing only with the Gentile body of Christ. So in these last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a formliness and denying the power thereof from such turn away. And Michael stopped and says, fellow Americans, this is where we are. 
Is it? It's tomorrow's newspaper. It's next week's newspaper. It's exactly where we are. But now here's my point. Is there one word of death or destruction? Not a word. Now, isn't that amazing? This is the scenario that you and I can look for at the trumpet call. We don't have to look for vast devastation. We don't have to look for millions upon millions of people being put to death. In fact, I made the point the other night in uh, Revelation chapter 6, when at the midpoint of the tribulation it says one-fourth of the world's people will be killed. Good heavens, what's one-fourth of seven billion people? 1.75 billion, not million. One and three quarters billion people are going to be dead by the end of the first three and a half years. We can't imagine what that's going to be like. But by the end of the seven, they're just about all going to be dead. They're just going to be a little smattering of survivors around the planet. But see, Paul doesn't allude to that. Paul says it's a breakdown of moral and spiritual things. See the difference? Why, that's as different as daylight and dark. You and I aren't going to be part of that death and destruction. This is what we look for. All right, now in the two minutes I have left, let's just capitalize on this. Verse 2, lovers of their own selves instead of lovers of God. True? Well, you know it is. Nothing matters to the human race today like the economy. And it isn't just America, it's everywhere. All people are concerned about is how much money they can make. And that's all centered on self. All right, now I'm going to go all the way down to the fifth verse because this is the one that slaps us in the face every time we turn around. We're in a time where people have a form of godliness. Any power? None. It's all flim-flam. I call it hip-hop religion. And that's all it is. There's no power of God in it. I had one of my converts out of Roman Catholicism call from uh, Chicago after Christmas time. She had gone with a friend to one of these large mega churches. And says, Les, I was in that church for a little over an hour and never once heard the name of Jesus Christ. Not once. Well, what is that? Oh, it's church. It's a form of godliness. But there's no power. There's no preaching of the gospel. It's a feel-good religion. I could name them, but I don't like to do that. That's not my style. I'm just going to show the truth and let you let the chips fall where they may. But see... This is where I'm making such a dividing line between the body of Christ, which was a secret kept mind to God, never revealed in any of the prophetic statements, not one iota. It has nothing to do with the death and destruction of the end time scenario. And then they ridicule us for believing that we're going to be taken out. Why shouldn't we be? Man, this is the glory of being in the body of Christ. This is our blessed hope. Okay. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good. I would like to see that red light come on. Good to have everybody back from your coffee break. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, in case this is just your first time catching us, we're an informal Bible study. And uh, hopefully I don't preach at anybody. We just simply let them see what 
the book says. To me, that is paramount to everything. Just understanding what the Word of God itself says. Well, we've only offered one book over the years, and we've still got it. It's a series of 88 questions and uh, answers from our previous programs. And uh, if anyone's out there interested, you just give us a call, and the girls will get it out to you. We send it out with an invoice, so you don't have to pay for it until you get it. All right, we're going to pick right up where we... Uh, where we left off in our last program, now remember, we're connecting the dots. We're going from Genesis, and hopefully we'll go all the way through to Revelation if the Lord tarries. But uh, the last half hour, we merely showed our proof that there would be an opening up of the timeline because those three references we use make it so plain that for a period of time, Israel will be set aside and be dispersed while God goes to the Gentiles. Now, naturally, when you have two such totally different groups of people, you can't go with the same thing. It, it just wouldn't ring true. So when God saves Paul, he doesn't just have him go back and check with the 12, as we saw in previous programs, but instead he separated him purposely, kept him from the 12, so that he would not get mixed up with the kingdom economy because he's going to begin something totally different, which we call the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, I'm well aware that there are a lot of people out there that detest the term dispensation. In fact, I had uh, one fellow in my class one time who just suggested to his pastor, he said, why don't you ever preach a sermon on the rapture? He looked at him in shock, and he says, I wouldn't dare do that. He says, why not? He said, well, then they'd call me a dispensationalist, as if that's the worst thing that could happen, see? And so I was aware of that, and those of you who have been with me over the years, see, I never used the word for the first eight, nine years. I just did not use it because I knew it would just turn a good number of people off. So I would just speak of it in general terms. Don't you realize that when Adam and Eve came out of the garden, everything was different? When Noah and the family came off the ark, everything was different. After he called Abraham, everything was different. After he brought Israel out of Egypt and gave them the law, again, everything is different. Well, what makes it different? A different dispensation, a different administration, a different set of rules and regulations, see? All right, so now then, after realizing that God was going to open the timeline and make a parenthetical period of time, we don't know how long, we call it the dispensation of the grace of God, and it came about through God's appointed apostle of the Gentiles, Saul of Tarsus. All right, so I'm going to bring you in now, just as an introduction to the dispensational view, to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now remember that Saul of Tarsus, the rabid, orthodox, rabbi, Jew, whatever you want to call him, God saved him on the road to Damascus and then immediately instructed him that he was going to go to the Gentiles, which God had never before done. All right, so verse 1 of Ephesians 3, For this cause, because of what he's written in the first two chapters, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now you've got to remember, where is Paul when he's writing? Well, he's in prison in Rome. These are one of the prison epistles. And... Uh, whether he had a short release or not, but it ends up with his martyrdom at the hands of the Romans. And so when he speaks of being a prisoner, it was literal. He was in prison there at Rome. And for what cause? For the cause of the gospel. For the cause of Jesus Christ. On behalf of you Gentiles. See? All right, now then verse 2. If you have heard, and no doubt they had, because after all, Paul's been out there now for 20-some years. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. See, that's where we get the title for this period of time. It's the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, again, i got to qualify. A dispensation is simply a period of time. It can be short or long or whatever. That doesn't matter. But it's a period of time during which God lays on a segment of people that he's dealing with a set of rules and directions. Now, the simplest one, of course, I always go back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, God gave them instructions. 
And he says, now every tree in the garden is for your enjoyment, except those two over there. The one was the tree of life, and the other one was the tree of good and evil, and the knowledge of good and evil. Of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Simple direction. Everything else is yours to enjoy. And that's all there was to it. And that's why we call it the simplest dispensation. Now, we don't know how long they were in the garden. There's all kinds of uh, guesses and so forth. But however long they were in the garden, that was all they had to do, was just simply refrain from eating of that one tree. It was that simple. But they just couldn't cut it. <laughs> and so they ate. Well, when they disobeyed, they ended that dispensation and God came in with a judgment, a punishment, out of the garden. And then a new dispensation began. All right, so now when Paul speaks of the dispensation of the grace of God, he's speaking of this period of time now following the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when he is turning away from Israel and their whole system of law and temple worship and he's going to give to this apostle what we call the gospel of the grace of God, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now let's go back and look at it, even though you all know it from memory. We keep using it, and I'm finally getting some response. I had several now write that their pastors are actually using these verses in their preaching. Well, praise the Lord, because here is the gospel of the grace of God. Now again, it's not total, but there's enough of it here that you can branch out and find the rest of it without any trouble. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, what's this gospel that Les Feldick is talking about? You just tell them, well, it's as simple as ABC. It's just simply that Jesus Christ, the creator God of the universe, went to that cross and died and shed his blood, was buried three days and three nights and arose from the dead. That's it. And when we believe it, God moves in, and then everything else falls in place. Of course it does, see? But here's where we have to begin. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We might as well read the whole four verses. we got time today. Moreover, brethren, so Paul is talking to Gentile believers over there at Corinth, a few miles west of Athens. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. See, now I asked my class the other night, does anybody have a Bible that says a gospel? Yeah, sure there were. Well, see, that's what these new translations do. You see what a difference one little article can do to the thought? If you say that Paul is a or an apostle, what does that mean? He's one of many. But see, Paul never includes himself with others. It's always the singular I or me. And the same way here, see? It is the gospel, and uh, it's not a gospel, it's singular. And then when he speaks himself, I am the apostle, not an apostle, that makes all the difference in the world. And this is what we have to recognize, because to this man and this man alone were these directions for this dispensation of grace given. All right, let's continue on. We get back to our dispensational thought. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the one and only, which I preached unto you and which also you have received, and wherein you stand as a believer, positioned. Verse 2, by which? It's by this gospel. You are saved. Now, isn't that plain? It doesn't say this gospel and. No, it's by this gospel that we're saved. And that's the, the all-inclusive word of Scripture, salvation, to be saved, to be born from above. And all these things are tied up with our faith in this gospel. All right? By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. In other words, you have to know what you believe, you have to understand it, otherwise it's for nothing. Now here it is. This is the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Well, where did he get it? From the twelve? No, from the ascended Lord. Not from the twelve. The twelve never did really comprehend this. And so he says, 
I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that? Christ died for our sins. His as well as ours. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he arose again the third day, according to scriptures. Now there it is. Christ died for my sins. And that, of course, includes his shed blood. He was buried three days and three nights. And then he arose from the dead in power and victory and glory, and that settled it. That makes our debt paid in full when we believe it and trust it, plus nothing, see? But oh my goodness, I don't know if I should take time this afternoon or not. Maybe this is as good a time as any. I've been doing just in between times, you can come back to Ephesians chapter 3. On the history of the King James Version and how it came to the 1611, but not just the King James Version, but along with that, I was studying in my spare time. Now, I'm not one of these guys who just sits there by the hour and the hour and the hour. I don't have patience for that. But I can get a couple, three hours in an evening once in a while and maybe a little time on a rainy day and so forth. But I, I'm not a nut at, at this. But... In between times now, for the last several weeks, I've been looking at the history of the King James as over these other translations, but also the history of Christendom. Now, you hear me use that word quite often. Christendom, with a D-O-M. Speaking of all aspects of so-called Christianity. And you know, it was a shocking revelation. Because, you know, we've all heard of the early church fathers. Justin Martyr, and Chrysostom, and Oregon, and then we jump up to Augustine and so forth. Well, you know, those church fathers didn't all have it right either, especially Oregon. He was a rascal, and uh, he had a lot of corrupt ideas. In fact, Oregon, now I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, I've looked and looked and trying to find a dictionary that gives me the pronunciation, and I can't find it, so somebody will be letting me know. But it's O-R-I-G-E-N, I can give you the spelling of it. But anyhow, he was the first one that came, now he's in the first century, see, he's uh, within a hundred years of, uh, of the Apostle Paul. And he was the first of the church fathers to come up with the idea that God was all through with the nation of Israel because they had killed the Christ. And so that all the Jewish promises and covenants and everything were transferred to the church. That started with Oregon. All right, now you've got to realize that between the loss of Paul and Peter, probably around 68, just before the temple is destroyed. These little groups of believers keep expanding. They're out there, not in any great numbers, but they're out there. They're, they're maintaining their, their faith and so forth. And you've got to remember, there, there weren't Bibles for those people. Some of them may have had a scroll of the Old Testament, but there weren't all that. So they had to depend on gifted men to kind of hold things together. But anyway, if you go back and, and look at it, these little groups of people, like humans are prone to do, would say, well, let's just get together once a month and, uh, you know, we can fellowship in a larger group. Well, that's all well and good. But see, as time went by, there were too many of them to all go, so what would they do? Well, they'd form a committee. And boy, you know what a horrible thing a committee is. But see, then these committees would meet, and then after a time, they said, well, now, you know, there's a group of our committees over there in North Africa, and we're over here in, uh, in Greece. Maybe, maybe we should meet someplace. And so that's the way the thing started growing, see? And so it was. It was growing rather slowly. But then you get to 315, one of the high marks in human history, and what happened? Constantine, the Roman emperor, became a quote-unquote Christian. And what did Constantine do? Constantine do? He opened the doors of Christianity to the masses. It was no longer going to be persecuted. It was no longer going to be suppressed. It was a status symbol to be called a Christian. So what'd that do? That just brought in the numbers, but how little faith? Almost none. 
All right, but outside of all this big conglomeration, there were always these little small groups of true believers. And they were always hated, persecuted, driven from one valley to the next. Okay, now you come on up. I've got to do this as quick as I can. You come on up to 400 A.D., about 75, 80 years after Constantine opened the church to the masses. A guy by the name of Augustine. Now, over all my growing up years, I always heard almost nothing but good things about Augustine. Well, he did say some good things, but he had a lot of other stuff. And he, too, embraced Oregon's teaching of replacement theology. And so, just look how long we've had this idea that we teach has been suppressed. And the masses embraced the replacement theology, and replacement theology rests primarily, not exclusively, of course, but primarily on the four Gospels. And as one writer of history put it, and I had never seen it in that way before, they rested only on the Sermon on the Mount. Well, now you just watch even today your news reports, how they'll refer to the fact that Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount is what transformed the world. Did it? Not really. Not really. Now, it's got high, lofty uh, premises, no doubt about it. But see, that's not what transformed lives. So anyway, i got to do this quickly now. Augustine picked up on Oregon's replacement theology, and with the mass increase of the organized church, which is now leading up to Roman Catholicism, of course, is going to come out of that, and so replacement theology became the number one tenet for Christendom. What did that do with the Jew? Hated them, persecuted them, and they were just running from one place to the other. Okay, so Augustine was really the father of Roman Catholicism. And out of that came, of course, the appearance of the popes and the hierarchy and all the rest. And now if you know anything from secular history, 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. is called what in history? The Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. Well, what did that mean? The sun never shone? <laughs> no. Where was it dark? Spiritually. It was spiritually dark. Because, you see, the organized church now had proclaim the average believer could not read the scriptures himself, and so they confiscated it, really, and kept them locked up in the monasteries. The average man didn't have the scriptures of any sort, except, again, these little friends groups maintained it. Okay, now you come all the way up through the Dark Ages, and then in 1500, a little after, who was the great awakener? Martin Luther. So Martin Luther comes out with what we call the Reformation. The, the idea that all this religion was totally wrong, the just will live by faith, they're saved by faith, which on the surface sounds so good, doesn't it? But is that where Martin Luther stopped? No. Martin Luther came right on and embraced all the other stuff that he had been so-called hating and brought it out with him and made it part of basic Lutheran theology, and uh, that incorporated, of course, infant baptism and uh, the hierarchy and replacement theology, see? Now then, you just keep rolling. Out of Luther's Reformation, here came the next big reformer, John Calvin. Now, John Calvin sets up his headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. But after a time goes by, John Calvin isn't one whit different than Martin Luther, and he's no different than Augustine. They're all still on this same premise of the Sermon on the Mount, replacement theology, and a works religion. Amazing. And it just comes all the way up through the last 2,000 years. Now then, it jumps across the pond, and we come over here to the early colonies, and uh, especially the likes of the Puritans and so forth, oh, they were so thrilled to escape all that heavy hand of persecution in Europe, and they were now free. But what did they do with their freedom? They became just as legalistic as their European forefathers. 
And I told one of my classes the other night, if a young lad or a young lady of 17 would show a bare ankle, what would the Puritans do to her? Whip her almost to death. Well, what was that? Legalism, see? Well, anyway, you bring it all the way up to our present time. The vast majority of Christian preaching and teaching was the four Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount, with a little bit of Old Testament thrown in, and that's where it's been. I mean, you can't argue it. It's in secular history, just as plain as day. All right, so now then, these friends groups believe like I do. So what am I? Yes, we're out on the fringes. The vast majority of people aren't going to listen to my message. They don't like it. They hate Paul, as I've already emphasized. But you see, if you're going to ignore Paul, you're ignoring the basic message for this dispensation because it was given to him. Okay, now that was all it in a nutshell. And don't uh, take my word for it. I've got to give you another one. My goodness. I'm free. Here a while back, I had a gentleman call, I think from South Carolina, if I remember correctly. And he called me about midday, either just before noon or just after. And uh, he said, Les, he said, uh, I'm in a such and such denominational church. I don't remember what it was. But he said, why do we practice Lent? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to answer it for you, except to tell you, you go to your library, and you find the Encyclopedia Britannica, and you just look up the word Lent, and you'll get your answer. Really? I said, yeah. At least it was there the last time I looked at one. Well, you see, I forget about the Internet. Before the afternoon is over, he calls back. Oh, and then I told him, I said, now when you see what Britannica says about Lent, I said, it's going to blow you out of the saddle. See, I can't help using my farmer rancher language. So he calls back about four in the afternoon. He says, Les, you did. I said, I did what? You blew me out of the saddle. I said, oh, are you the guy that called about Lent? And he says, yeah. I said, what did you find out? He said, just that. He said, I couldn't believe my... He said, there were several pages. I said, you mean you've already been down to the library? No, he said, I got it off the internet. Well, dumb me, you know, I don't think of that. So anyhow, I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm downloading it. I'm going to lay it on my pastor's desk and let him read it. Well, now I know how many of you know what Britannica says about Lent. But I'm not going to tell you. I might get thrown off the air. You go and find it yourself. You just look up the word Lent, L-E-N-T, in a good encyclopedia, and it'll tell you exactly what it's all about. But you see, it's not in Paul's epistles. It's not in Scripture. See? All right, now then, I've got four minutes left. Come back to Ephesians chapter 3. See, I got way behind. I didn't intend you to give you that history. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 again. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you. Now, I've done this before. This is all review. So how did we get all of these doctrines of this dispensation? From Paul. Now, if that shakes people up, then just go back to Exodus how did Israel receive the law? God gave it to Moses. And what did Moses do with it? He took it down the mountain and gave it to Israel. So this isn't something all that out of the whack. This is the way God operates. And so this is what he's claiming. Like Moses received the law, Paul received these dispensational truths for the body of Christ. All right, now verse 3. How that by revelation... A revealing, a supernatural outpouring from God in heaven of these new directions for the mankind. Mostly for Gentile, but it's also applicable to Israel. Now, in this period of time, just like the period of time in the garden, however long it was, that doesn't matter. But in this period of time that covers the dispensation of the grace of God, we have our own set of directions. Just like Adam and Eve had, you can have everything but that tree. Okay, our set of directions are just about that simple. And what are they? 
Recognize that you're a sinner and you're lost. And when you do, recognize that Jesus Christ, the Creator, the Son of God, went to that Roman cross and shed His blood and died was buried three days and three nights, and God miraculously raised him from the dead. And that finished our plan of salvation. That's our directions. Now, is that so hard to follow? Now then, after you get the basic directions, then naturally, when we're a believer and the Holy Spirit comes in, we begin to see all these other aspects of Scripture. Then everything starts falling into place, see? In fact, let me show you what the Scripture says about that very thing. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians. I think we touched on this. I can never remember what I said in a class here in Oklahoma or whether I said it on the program. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Got to do this quickly. We're down to a little over a minute. Verse 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Now this is all part of our instructions after we have become a believer, see? Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We compare Scripture with Scripture, not Scripture with some secular book. We compare Scripture with Scripture. Now verse 14. The natural man, the unsaved person, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit can't deal with the unbeliever so far as his daily experience is concerned. See? All right. For they, these things of the Spirit, are foolishness to him, to the lost person. Neither can he know them. He can't understand these spiritual things. See? Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. And the man that's lost has nothing of the Holy Spirit with him. He can't understand spiritual things. Now, isn't that obvious? But we have to start with the basic, and that is we have to believe the gospel. And once we believe the gospel, everything else falls in place. For watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1 800 369 7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30 minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, Here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back again. And um, I've explained this before, but I've got to explain it every once in a while. They go for a coffee break between half hours. So I'm always glad to get them all back. All right, we're going to keep right on going. we got so much to cover. And uh, of course, it would be great if the Lord came before we finished. I'd be ready. <clears throat> Wouldn't mind a bit. But we'll pick up where we just left off on uh, Paul's... Revelation now of what we call the dispensation of the grace of God. Tempting something totally different from what he was doing with Israel. And that is that he would offer salvation to the whole human race without a temple, without a set of rules and regulations. And a simple matter of believing the work of the cross as the basis of our salvation. And it's working. My Irish can back me up. The girls in the office hear it every day. How many people are finally seeing it for the first time? And uh, it just thrills us beyond your imagination. All right, so chapter 3 of Ephesians, we'll pick up where we left off, but we'll go back to verse 1. For this cause, because of the first two chapters, I, Paul, the prisoner, he is in prison in Rome, remember, and he's there because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he's been taking out to the Gentiles. Now verse 2 again. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, 
to you word. Well, we covered that in the last half hour. That's obvious. We pick up all of these doctrines of Paul in his epistles and nowhere else. All right, and we're going to be looking at it. The brother has been kind enough to put them on the board for me. And uh, we're going to look at now verse 3. How that? By revelation to me the mystery. Now there the word is singular. So it envelops all the mysteries that become part of Pauline doctrine or are part of this dispensation of the grace of God. All right, we'll just run over them quickly. I don't want to have to stand in front of somebody that can't see it, so I'll try to get off to the side. But here we start with eight distinct mysteries that Paul reveals in various places throughout his letters, and we're going to look at them one by one, but let's just go over them quickly. Number one, right back there in Ephesians chapter 1, we have the mystery of his will. In other words, the will of God concerning mankind. We're going to see the mystery of Christ in our next verse now in Ephesians 3. We're going to see the mystery of the body of Christ in Colossians 1. We're going to see the mystery of God in Colossians 2. The mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy. The mystery of Israel's blinding, which we talked about in the first half hour this afternoon. It was a mystery, a secret. We're going to talk about the mystery of the rapture, and that's exactly what Paul calls it. In the very first verse that he begins in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we all shall be changed. Well, it's a mystery. And then the final one, the eighth one, is the mystery of iniquity that he speaks of in 2 Thessalonians when he makes the only reference in all his epistles to Old Testament prophecy. And that concerns the mystery of iniquity. So we're going to be looking at all these mysteries, and you put them all together. If we were to put them in a circle, you could call that then singularly the mystery. How that all of this composite work of God poured out on this apostle and by whom we have received it becomes then our dispensational directions or instructions or however you want to call it. All right, so now then, verse 4. Whereby, when you read, in other words, we read his letters, Romans through Philemon, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the what? The mystery of Christ. Now, I hope I can do this right. What word triggers knowledge? Now, that's ambiguous. I know it is. Wisdom. If you've got wisdom, you're going to practice what? Knowledge. Now go with me to a verse that we look at so often, and I use it when people accuse me of making too much of the Apostle Paul. Keep your hand in Ephesians. Now remember what word I'm talking about. Wisdom and knowledge. How that it is all part of this revelation of these truths that were totally kept secret until it was given to this apostle. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, and again verse 15 and 16, for probably the 300th time in our years on television. Account that the long-suffering patience of our Lord is salvation. My God's not willing that any should be lost. You know that. All right, 2 Peter 3, verse 15, now reading on. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even, now watch this carefully, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom and knowledge, see, given unto him, has written unto you. Well, where did he get it? from the ascended Lord. And who is recognizing the fact? Peter. See? Peter is telling his Jewish readers of that epistle, since 
Judaism is now going through the cracks. God knows, as he inspired Peter to write, the temple will be gone in just another two, three, four years. The priest will be gone. So what's left for the Jew? Paul's gospel. See? And so that's why he's telling them. In view of what's out in front now, it isn't going to be the tribulation and the second coming of the kingdom. Now it's going to be a period of time, the dispensation of the grace of God. And if you're going to cash in on that, Peter says, you go back to Paul, because that's the only place you'll find it. And when I talk to people on the phone, you know what I always ask them? Why didn't Peter say, go back to John's gospel? That's what most people tell you today. Well, if you're looking for salvation, go read John's gospel. Uh Uh-uh. Peter didn't do it, and I won't either. I never tell anybody, go read John. I tell everybody, you go read Romans through Philemon, because that's where it's at. Well, see, I want you to see that that's what the Scripture says. That's just not my idea. Peter says, you go to Paul because of the wisdom that's been given unto him, and he has written it unto you. And then verse 16, in all his epistles, see, I think he's referring to Hebrews. A lot of people won't agree with that, and that's fine. I don't mind. But I think when he says up here that he has already written unto you, he was referring to the book of Hebrews because that's where Paul is appealing to the Jew who is contemplating his message, but they still got one foot over the fence in Judaism, see? And the word that Paul uses all through Hebrews is better. Yes, Judaism was good in its day and time, but this is so much better. Yes, the law was good, but grace is better. And all the way through the book of Hebrews, just look for it. You got that word better, 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 see? All right, and so Peter is understanding that. And he says, yes, he said, you go to Paul, but not just Hebrews. Verse 16, all his epistles. See that? All his epistles. And he's speaking in them of these things pertaining to salvation, see? And in which that his epistles are some things hard to be understood. You've all heard this one before. And it's hard to comprehend. But I I can get an idea of why Peter, because he was so steeped in legalism himself, and God didn't really expect him to embrace all this, I don't think. No, others will disagree, that's fine. But I think Peter was kept separate providentially. But then Peter includes all these other false teachers, see, that are unlearned and unstable. And what do they do with Paul's epistles? They twist them all out of shape so that they lose all their meaning. And they do it with the other scriptures. And what's their end result? Their destruction. Now that's tough language, see? Okay, back to Ephesians. So we continue on now with what Paul calls the dispensation of the grace of God, which is really the revelation of all these mysteries. And when you put them in a composite, it's the mystery. Something that has never been revealed. Now again, just look at them. Just just look at them. They're all from Paul's epistles, and not one of those premises can you find anywhere else in Scripture. Nowhere. Try it, and you won't find it. And that's why it's called a mystery. It was kept secret since the age began. In fact, if I remember right, the last moment of our last taping... Come back with me. I'm pretty sure we were in Romans chapter 16. Jerry, maybe you remember, was it? Yeah. Romans 16. Let's go back there a minute. Now, I've got to keep hammering away and hammering away and hammering away because little by little you're going to see it. Some of you may see it a lot faster than others. But I've got to remember I've got that TV audience out there, and fortunately I forget about them. You know that. You know that when I'm teaching you people, I forget all about those cameras. They, they never enter my mind. See, that's why I say things sometimes that I wish I wouldn't say. <laughs> but it's fortunate, because I think if I was totally aware of those cameras, I wouldn't teach as easily as I do. But I can. I can forget all about them. All right, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him. Now remember, this is all Holy Spirit-inspired. Paul didn't sit there in some conclave all by himself debating, how can I put this? How can I? What word should I use? No, it just flowed like a river, see? 
And he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And what's Paul's gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the what? The mystery. See, Paul's gospel is going to fit hand in glove with every one of these. All except the very last one, the mystery of iniquity, which, of course, is the other side of the coin, see? But all of this is part of Paul's revelations, all right? According to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept, what? Secret, how long? Since the ages began. Where's that begin? Adam, see? It's never been revealed before. Oh, maybe in a latent form, yes. All the groundwork was being laid all the way up through the Old Testament for the work of the cross. But to reveal it to mankind as a means of justification and redemption and forgiveness and all these good things, no, it's not back there. The only place you'll find it are in Paul's epistles. All right, so now come back from the Ephesians, chapter 3 again. So this mystery, Paul's knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which, like he says here in verse 5, just like in Romans 16, which in other ages or dispensations or periods of time, however you want to put it, was not made known to the sons of men, but it's now revealed under his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now be careful. It wasn't revealed to the twelve, so he's not talking about the prophets and the apostles of Israel. He's talking about the men who became apostles with him. Barnabas, and Silas, Timothy, Titus, and some of these other men who had gifted ability to proclaim word. Because now you've got to remember, how many years has this gospel of grace been going to the Gentile world without benefit of one page of Paul's epistles? How long? Well, about 15 years. See, he began his ministry about 40, and i got to look a minute. I don't think he wrote Thessalonians until... I have to look in my Bible. i got it here someplace. About 54. That's 14 years. 14 years, these early little congregations had no benefit of anything written. So what did they depend on? Gifted men. See? And that was the gift of prophecy. Now, let me show you that. 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. Yeah, 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 1. Got it? Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, Follow after love or charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather are the most important that you can what? Prophesy. Now, the word prophesy here in the Greek does not mean tell the future like Isaiah did, but it meant to speak forth. Well, if it hadn't been for gifted men, Christianity would have died almost immediately because Paul couldn't do it all alone. After he established a little congregation of believers up there, somebody had to carry it on. Well, who did it? Gifted men. Now, once the Scriptures became a completed thing, and Paul's epistles are now available for all the little, that gift died away. It was no longer necessary to that extent. So always understand, and that's why I love history. I mean, you've got to understand how these things came about before it makes sense. All right, so now then back to Ephesians chapter 3 again. That it was revealed to not only Paul, but his fellow apostles and prophets by, again, the Holy Spirit. Now verse 6. That the Gentiles, see, a total different approach than when he was dealing with Israel, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Wow. You see that? 
Was Israel ever promised anything like that? No. Back up with me. Romans. I don't know how many of you folks in here watch the daily program, but I think we've been in Romans lately. Romans chapter 8. Because, see, too many times we read these words and it doesn't mean anything. But Gentiles coming in as a fellow heir with the God of Israel? Unbelievable. But that's where they are and that's where we are. All right, Romans 8. Starting up there at verse 14. See, and this is what made the Jews so envious. And, of course, that's what God intended it to do. He said in Romans 11 that he might make them jealous, that here we were as Gentiles reaping blessings that they could have had, but they rejected, see? All right, Romans 8, starting in verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, they are the sons, or I think a better word is children of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, now that's a small s, so it's that spirit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of adoption or of placing us now like the father with a business would bring his 14-year-old son. You remember I've explained that over and over. That's adoption, is to be brought in beside the father with full responsibility. And the Middle East is good at that. They know how to train those kids. I've given the illustration more than once of how Iris found that out firsthand. That she could deal with this little 14-year-old and the old man was sitting over there in the corner just letting him have at it. And I asked him, I said, you can let that kid do that? And he says, he's never lost a dime yet. Why? Because he had him well tutored before he came into that position. Well, that's where we are in the body of Christ, see? It's not heaven or hell. It's a position. All right, read on. You've not received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Respect to our position. Now then, verse 16, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not God's, but we are children of God. Now then, verse 17, here it comes. Now if we're children, then what? We're heirs, heirs of God, joint heir with Christ. I don't, very, I don't think many people believe that. I just don't think that most Christians believe that. A joint heir with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. Well, what's a joint heir? Come on, tell me, what's a joint heir? Yeah, what's his is mine, what's mine is his. That's it. What a position. No wonder the Jews were jealous. All they're going to get is an earthly kingdom. We're going to be joint heirs with Christ himself, not gods. Don't ever get that idea. We never become gods. But my goodness, we become joint heirs with Christ. All right, read on. Joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together by virtue of that position and we gain that position not with works, but by our faith in that finished work of the cross. My, I don't see how you can get it any better than that. All right, come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Our time is going fast again. Verse 6, just to read into verse 7. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, of which, remember, Christ is the head and we're the body and partakers of his promise in Christ, like I just said, not by works what we do, but by what? Faith in the gospel. See? Now verse 7. Whereof? This gospel and what it can do for lost humanity. Paul said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now, to show you the impact of that word minister, come back again to Romans, chapter 15, so that you see what an important, what an important word it really is when Paul says that I am a minister 
of this gospel of the grace of God. In Romans 15, verse 8, verse that I several months back used every time I had a class. Haven't used it now lately. Romans 15, <laughs> verse 8. All got it? Now I say that Jesus Christ was a what? Minister. See? Same word. That Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the nation of Israel, for the truth of God. But as the minister to Israel, what was his role? To fulfill the promises made to the fathers. In other words, all the covenant promises were his to fulfill. But Israel didn't buy it. All right, now the Apostle Paul has that same kind of authority, not like Christ over Israel, but he is still given that place of preeminence as the apostle of the Gentiles by virtue of being the minister of this age of grace. All right? Where was I now? Verse 8. Unto me, unto this one man, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, unmerited favor. He didn't deserve it. He didn't work for it. He didn't go to school for eight years so he could get a sheepskin that would now make him uh, available. Uh-uh. No, it was all by God's grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What does that mean? My, what this man has been permitted to feed to us are beyond human understanding. We just take what little we grasp by faith, but it's so unsearchable, beloved, we'll never understand it until we get there. In fact, that's getting to be one of my favorite answers anymore. You know, they call me with these questions, and for a lot of people, it's a point of controversy. And you know what I say? Listen, if it doesn't affect our eternal destiny, if it doesn't affect our Christian walk, then forget it. We'll find out when we get there. I think that's a good answer. A lot of these things we can't answer. Why argue about them? They're not going to affect your eternal destiny. They have nothing to do with the plan of salvation. If it doesn't tell you to go out and live like the world or something like that, if it still maintains our Christian walk, Hey, what difference does it make? Now, I can give you one example. Genesis chapter 6 is a big chapter of controversy where it says that there were giants in the earth in those days. Now, you know, there are two lines of theological thought. And I've got a chart at home. Great men, famous men on each side of the coin. Over here are men who say that these were fallen angels who had actually had relationship with female women and they had giant children. Over on the other side are those that teach like I always have, and I'm beginning to rethink it, maybe I'm wrong, that it was a breakdown between the godly line of Seth and the ungodly line of Cain. That's always been my take. But listen, what difference does it make? If I win the argument, so what? It's not going to make any difference. So a lot of these things now, that's the way I'm starting to answer people. I say, look, if it doesn't affect your salvation, if it doesn't affect your Christian testimony, hey, we'll find out when we get there. Then we'll get full knowledge, and uh, if the Lord wants us to know, we'll know. I think it's a good way to look at a lot of these things. All right, let's go on a little bit yet in Ephesians, and then the half hour is gone again. Now verse 9. After contemplating the unsearchable riches of Christ, unfathomable, will never plumb the depths, will never reach the height of them. But now verse 9. This was Paul's goal as a human being, as an instrument in God's hands, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What do these seven premises do for you and I as believers in our fellowship with one another? Why, it just brings us together like family, see? We are one in Christ, all right? The fellowship of the mystery, and again, where did it come from? Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. 
Now listen, that's not there just to fill the page. That's what it means. These truths were hid in the mind of God. Now, you know, I always go back to Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those that are revealed belong to us and our children. All right, that's the concept all through Scripture. God can keep things secret as long as he wants to, and he'll reveal it in his own good time. All right, so all the rest of Scripture never makes one mention of these mysteries, not one, except the iniquity. And so they are Pauline revelations, and you and I can just embrace them, and if you're the only one in the whole family that believes it, hey, blessed, you are the blessed one. Because, you see, most of Christendom does not buy it. They just cannot believe it. Watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1 800 369 7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30 minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, Here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody, and here's program number four already, and then we can be heading out for home. So those of you joining us on television, again, we want to thank you for your prayers more than anything, but uh, also for your letters and your financial help. Naturally, we can't do this without... You know, when we first... I got to tell things like that. This, I think, is what makes our program. You know, when we first came up here to talk to these station people. They were the ones that called. And they wanted us to make a program. So we came up here and had a breakfast meeting with them and uh, found out it was going to cost us like 2000 a month for one program a week and the production and everything. Iris doesn't say anything until we get to the car. And she said, Les, I thought they paid us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I imagine a lot of people think that because where do these Hollywood people get all their bucks? Well, you know, from what they do. And so it was a logical response because we didn't know anything about TV. You know, we were, as I always tell people, we were as ignorant as a clod of dirt when it came to television. <laughs> but anyway, here we are and uh, we have to pay for TV time. Uh, the television people don't pay us a dime. Okay, we're going to keep on... Uh, the dispensational view, and uh, we're going to come back to these mysteries in our next taping. But for this next half hour, at least the first part of it, we're going to start at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. A little different approach. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Now Paul is writing to the believers at Corinth who were not exactly the most spiritual of all his people. And so he says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers, see there's that word again, as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What's a steward? Well, let's look scripturally. Go back to Genesis chapter 15. Abraham. Genesis chapter 15. Let's go first. Keep your hand in 15. Go back to chapter 12 again. Abrahamic covenant. Just for a second. So to know what Abraham is, or Abram, I think is still... Yeah, it's still Abram. And what he's up against. Genesis chapter 12, 
verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. Now, that's as far as we have to go to get my point. What would Abraham have to have if a nation is going to come from him? Children. How many does he have? None. See? All right, and so here he's just almost befuddled with the idea, how can people come from me, and even if it's my own wife, Sarai, when we don't have a child? And it was plaguing him, see? All right, now then, you come over to chapter 15, still in Genesis, and uh, still no child, and still the promises keep ringing in his ear. All right, so chapter 15, verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now verse 2. Now don't forget the fact that Abram is 90 and Sarah is 80, and they still won't have a child until he's 100 and she's 90, but nevertheless they're up past already childbearing age. Now Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? What do you mean? What's a steward? A manager. See, an overseer, an administrator. Now we know Abram had tremendous wealth. He had men servants and women servants. He had cattle and sheep and goats and uh, he couldn't run it all himself, and so he had this steward, this overseer, this manager, Eliezer of Damascus. All right, now come back to 1 Corinthians 4, and maybe this verse will mean a little more to you. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards, managers, overseers, promoters, all the things that made an operation go, that's what we are to be, but not of a business, not of a farm and ranch operation, but of what? The mysteries. See? So every one of us as believers are stewards of this body of truth. It's up to us to get it out in front of people every opportunity that we get in one place or another. You don't have to use all of them at once, but let people know, hey, this is where it's at. And you won't find that back in the four Gospels. You won't find this back in the Old Testament. You won't find it in the book of Revelation. You find it only between Romans and Philemon, see? And that's why I'm constantly stressing study Paul's epistles. Now, you don't throw the rest of your Bible away. You know I don't teach that. I just used it. Man, alive, I love to use Genesis. I love to use the prophets. But I'm not going to take people back there to show them how to be saved. I'm not going to take them back there to show them how to live the Christian life in 2000, wherever we are. But we are to be stewards of these basic premises that we are calling now the mysteries of Christ and of God and so forth. All right? Let's just read on here a little bit. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards, overseers, or managers, that a man be found what? Faithful. Now, I imagine everyone in this room has known of someone who has been a victim of embezzlement or of a poor manager. I know I've known several in my lifetime who just simply got taken to the cleaners by an embezzler. I think of another fellow who had managers of his operation and they stole him blind till he almost went broke. Well, you see, it's the same thing in the spiritual. If we are going to keep all this to ourselves and never pass it on, are we going to enhance the body of Christ? No, we've got to share it. Now, that, like I said, you don't have to know all seven of these and pass them out at one time. But be ready. Be ready to share these things that most of Christendom knows nothing of. They don't hear it. They don't hear it. 
because most of Christendom ignores Paul. That's the basic problem. But this is where we ought to understand that as believers in this age of grace, we are stewards, we are household managers of this body of truth that we call the dispensation of the grace of God. All right? I hardly know where to go first because there's so much to cover and, and I don't want to get it all mixed up. But uh, let me just continue on here in 1 Corinthians 4. And uh, some of these verses disturb people. Well, I can't help that because it's what the book says. Come on over with me now in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 4, and go to verse 16. And remember, what's the basic instruction at the beginning of the chapter? Be stewards. As ministers of Christ, be stewards of these mysteries of God. Now, how are we going to be a good steward? Well, we have to be taught. You don't just automatically come in and run somebody's business without some training. So where do we get our training? All right, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. And like I said, people don't like this. Can't help that. Wherefore, Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not by Paul's own idea, but he says, Wherefore, I beseech you, be you followers. Now, most people think it should say Jesus, but it doesn't. It says followers of whom? Me, Paul, see? Now, don't worry, I'm coming to the right point. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now verse 1. Now this will set your mind at ease. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. All got it? Be ye followers of me, but don't leave the rest of the verse out, even as I also a follower of Christ. You see that? Now see, this apostle had direct communion with the Christ in glory. He had direct fellowship in more areas than one. In fact, let me just give you an example. I've got to back everything up with Scripture. I can't help it. Come back with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 22. This is even beside his experience on the road to Damascus. This is years later. So I know that the man was in fellowship with the ascended Lord. Acts 22, coming at verse 17. Now he's been out amongst the Gentiles. He's been establishing these little congregations. And now he's back in Jerusalem because he always had a heart for his fellow Jews. And he would bring back offerings to take care of the poor Jews in Jerusalem. And so here's one of his instances where he has come back to Jerusalem from his Gentile travels. Acts 22, verse 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem. See, this wasn't the first time. When I had come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. He had a vision. And I saw him, the Lord Jesus himself, and I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they, the Jews, will not receive thy testimony concerning me. See? All right, then he actually argues with the Lord. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beaten every synagogue of them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death. And I kept or I held the raiment of them that killed him. And he, the Lord Jesus, said unto me, Depart. Depart what? Jerusalem. Get out. See? Depart, for I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. That's where his ministry was. Not in Jerusalem, but out into the Gentile world. So we know that he had constant communion with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All right, let's go over a little further to Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Chapter 3, verse 17, honey. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. See, now here's three distinct instructions 
of who we are to follow. And most of Christendom gets all upset and says, I'm not going to follow some man, I'm going to follow Jesus. Well, listen, God gave to this man this place of apostleship. Christ himself designated as the apostle of the Gentiles. And as this man follows Christ, we are to follow him. And here's the third one now in just these few references. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them who walk so as you have us for an example. Now, how did Paul walk? Above reproach. You cannot find one word of Scripture that anybody ever had anything to malign the Apostles' Christian walk, if we want to call it that. Never. He was above reproach and suffered for it for 20-some years. And so when I maintain that as our Apostle, this is where we spend our time, are in his letters, because it is. It's God's letter to us as Gentiles, and it's through his letters that we not only find salvation, but the Christian walk. In fact, uh, let's just go to Titus a minute. Keep on going, Philippians through the Thessalonians, Timothy, and then we'll come to Titus. Chapter 2. Now, who in the world can argue against these kind of admonitions? Titus, chapter 2, did I give you the verse, honey? Verse 11. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God. See, Paul is always on that grace thing. We're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and we look forward to whatever eternity is coming by grace. We don't deserve any of it. All right, so the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. No one is going to be able to say, but I never had a chance. And I just told my class the other night here in Oklahoma, don't ask me to explain that. I can't. But there are three scripture references that maintain that every human being has had an opportunity. Now I'm getting looks of consternation. I have to stop right there. Come back with me to John's Gospel, because I don't like to say things like that and then leave it hanging by a cotton thread. Go back to John's Gospel. Chapter 1. John's Gospel. Chapter 1. I might as well, in order to make it clear as clear can make it, we'll start at verse 6. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 6. And we're dealing with John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. Now that's capitalized, so it's a reference to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All right, he came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. How many? All. See? All right. He was not that light, speaking of John, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now verse 9. My, this blows me away. I can't explain it. I have to just leave it where it sets, and you can do the same thing. That was the true light, Jesus of Nazareth in his earthly ministry. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. How many? Every last one. The Aborigines in the middle of Australia? Yes. The pagans, wherever they may be in the world? Yes. Nobody is going to come before the great white throne and say, but God, I never had a chance. You know why? Scripture. Now come over with me to Romans, and then we'll go back to Titus. I'm not through there. Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. Let's start at verse 18. 
Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God, not the love of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. In other words, God just puts it in the spotlight, and there it is. No argument. For God hath showed it unto them. Shown what? Their unrighteousness, their wickedness. Creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, in other words, who he is, so that they, the unsaved multitudes, are what? Without excuse. Now just let that soak in. Every human being is somehow or other enlightened enough that they could cash in and have salvation, but they refuse to. And so when they come before the great white throne, they are not going to have one word of argument because they're going to know that I'm here without an excuse. Now that's one of the quirks of Scripture, like I said. I can't answer it, so we'll just wait till we get there. But it's a fact that Christ died for every human being that has ever lived. You know, I get a lot of things in the mail. <laughs> and I had an interesting one. And if the lady is watching me in a few weeks, so be it. Because I, I wrote back to her exactly what I'm saying now. And uh, a good friend of hers had given her the previous Sunday's church bulletin in which the pastor had an article that, you know, I could agree with. I had no problem. But this lady was all shook up. And she wrote across the bottom. She said, Les, I don't think I can agree with this. And what the pastor was pointing out was how that Christ suffered so horrendously for the sin of the world. And she didn't think she could agree with it, so this is what I wrote back. By the time the program reaches her, she'll have already read, read my letter. I said, my dear lady, now you're talking like these Jesus seminar liberals who the last comment I read from one of them was, how in the world could any father cause his son to go through what Jesus went through? And that's how they ridicule it. How would anybody with any common sense make their son suffer like that? And so I said, you sound like some of these Jesus seminars. I said, listen, the whole idea of his suffering was that he was taking the sin debt for the whole whole human race. Not just a few thousand or a few million Jews, but for the whole human race. And then I gave her an example that we had experienced in Israel one day, and that goes back quite a few years, and we were still able to go into the Dome of the Rock. The Muslim, they don't like to call it a mosque, it's a shrine. But in those days, we could still take off our shoes and we could go in. And so inside the Dome of the Rock is this huge rock where supposedly Abraham offered Isaac. And it's got a retaining fence around it. So anyhow, the guide had our little small group of us right there at the high point of the rock. And he was explaining how that some of the Jews feel that that was the exact place of the ark at which they slaughtered all the animals. And the unique thing was that as that animal blood would go right down into a cavern and it would go out into the river Kidron. And so our little Jewish guide was expressing the same kind of thought. He says, you know, folks, he said, I just cannot believe that God would require people to kill these innocent lambs. And he said, many times that lamb was even the household pet. And I stopped him right there. And I said, now, wait a minute. Don't you understand? The reason God set up that sacrificial system, and yes, that made it all the more impact, if it was the household pet, that that Jew's sin is what caused that animal to die. 
He had to see the horribleness of his own sin. Well, it's the same way with the cross, see? We have to understand that when Christ suffered and died, he does it because of our sin. And sin in the eyes of God is awful. We've lost it, see? All right, so this is what we have to understand, that God wasn't being unfair to his son. He wasn't being morbid. He was doing what had to be done. Someone had to suffer and die for the sins of mankind. And who could do it but God himself? See, that's why he had to be God. All right, now then, that was all free for nothing. Come back to where we were in Titus, and then we'll close. Titus chapter 2 now. This is what we mean by following the writings of Paul. It's so logical. It's so appropriate. Verse 11 again. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. But for us who believe, now the next verse kicks in. The grace of God teaches you and I as a believer, as a child of God, as a joint heir with Christ, remember. All right, and it is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts or desires, instead of partaking, we deny them, and in its place, we live soberly. Now, that means... That doesn't mean you can't ever laugh or smile or have a good time, no. But it means that we're not going to be frivolous. We're not going to be with the crazy stuff of the unsaved world. We live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now, that's a small g. Now, where did the word Christian come from? Christ-like, that's right. See, that's what the pagan world, it was actually a a slur term when it first originated, that the pagans put on these believers who thought they were Christ-like, and so they called them Christians. All right, that's what we've got here. We are to live Christ-like. Now there you can go to the teachings of Jesus. I got no problem with that. And when he says that we are to be salt, the earth, absolutely we are to be. Are we to be the light? Sure we are to be the light. And so many of the other things that he taught are certainly appropriate. But, by and large, we come back to how does the Apostle Paul put it? We deny ungodliness, we deny worldly lusts and desires, and instead we live soberly, we live righteously, we live godly, see? Instead of with the things of the world and all of its ungodliness, we separate from it. And so we live godly, not just waiting for the next life, but where? In this present world. Even in our daily life, this is how we are to live. And then at the same moment, while we're living the Christian life here in this world, and that doesn't mean that you can't pursue happiness. That doesn't mean that you can't pursue enough to leave for your kids. In fact, Scripture admonishes us to. Parents should lay up for children and not children for parents. So there's nothing wrong with working and, and trying to, as we say in America, get ahead. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't become first place on your agenda. But while we are working, while we're doing whatever we're doing, what are we be doing? Looking for that blessed hope. And what's the blessed hope for us as believers? The glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then see the next verse, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar or a set-apart people, zealous of good works. Of course we're going to do all we can to help fellow man. Nothing better than to help someone who is destitute. And that's all part of our being stewards of the mysteries. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry 
If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, and it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and... Uh... We've got quite a few new folks that have never been here before, and so those of you out in television, you look over the audience, and you're going to see a few new, pa new faces this afternoon. And uh, for all the rest of you who come in, uh, we always like to let it be known once in a while anyway that we've still got the book, Question and Answers, and uh, I don't like to peddle them, but uh, on the other hand, we want to make people aware that they are still available. And uh, again, I always have to thank my audience, all of you here and those of you on television for your prayer support, for your letters, your comments. My, what an encouragement it is to know that the Lord is using us to open the scriptures to so many. And uh, we thank you for your financial help. After all, television is not free. And uh, we do thank you for all of that. All right. Now, for those of you in the audience here in the studio, you can see on the board that we're going to start with the mysteries that are scattered throughout Paul's epistles. And uh, I had the studio on his turn to Ephesians 1 verse 9, but I just happened to think I better go back <laughs> to Deuteronomy once again for the sake of new listeners. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Most of you regular listeners, you know this by memory just from rote repetition. But uh, it's one of the most descriptive verses for understanding what Paul ca calls the mysteries that were revealed to him and him alone. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I always have to give credit for finding this verse to a dear gentleman who was in one of my Oklahoma classes. He was not only a retired Army general, but he was a retired college president. And he came up one night and he said, Les, I found a verse that just fits the way you teach. And I said, what is it? Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I had never seen it before. Really, I had never seen it before. And now, of course, I use it hundreds and hundreds of times because it just says it all. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Now stop and think a minute. What does that mean? Well, exactly what it says. God is sovereign. God is in total control, and he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. Now, that's what it means. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. He can keep things secret if he wants to. But, see, the flip side. Those things which are revealed and are no longer secret, they belong to us. And, of course, Moses is writing, so he's speaking of the children of Israel. But nevertheless, it's still appropriate for us to understand, coming back now with me to Paul's epistles in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. And uh, we're going to be looking at mysteries all afternoon. And the first thing I have to qualify is that the word mystery is also the same identical word for a secret. That's why I took you to Deuteronomy 29, 29. All right, so now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, we have an instance, not the only one, not even the first as far as that goes. But in Ephesians 1, verse 9, he says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the secret of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, see, I've already explained that with my opening remarks. Why is it according to his good pleasure? He's sovereign. And he can keep things secret until he's ready to reveal it. All right, now here is one of the revealed secrets then that you'll find only in the letters and the epistles of Paul. 
and it's referred to here as the mystery of his will. Now, if you just read that casually, you just don't think anything of it. But hopefully, I'm getting people to understand that you've got to stop and analyze these things without just running by them. So what in the world is he talking about that God's will has been kept secret? Now, maybe I better qualify that. Uh, well, I'll make it easy for you. Just turn over in this same book of Ephesians. There's another one in Romans 16, but let's use the one in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 9, we'll be coming to it probably later this afternoon. If we don't get there today, we'll get here at our next taping. But here is exactly what we have to understand. That these things that Paul reveals, reveal, uh, refers to as the mysteries were doctrines and tenets of our faith that were never known anywhere else in Scripture. See, and this is what makes... Paul's apostleship, so set apart from all the rest of our Bible, is that all these things were kept secret until revealed to this apostle. See, and that's what most of Christendom can't understand. And of course, the first reason they can't understand it, they won't read Paul. In fact, I don't know if I mentioned it in my last taper or not, but one of my listeners, I won't even name the state, but in one of the far-off states, sent me a clipping from her newspaper. And across the top of the newspaper, she wrote, less. Now I understand what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. And then she had underlined one of the letters to the editor. And it was in response to a letter that a pastor in their community had written, being critical of, well, now this letter that she had outlined for me to read, I've got it in my Bible here, but I won't take time to read it. But you cannot imagine the venom that can spew out of people's mouths when they start attacking the Apostle Paul. And that's what she was doing, just with venom, no Christian love whatsoever. And she just ridiculed the man, how he was kicked out of Greece, he was kicked out of Turkey, and he was stupid, and he was this, see? Well, she's not alone. Now, she might be on the what shall I call, on the worst end of it. But that's multitudes of people today. They got no time for this apostle. And at most, they'll just use a verse here and there. But to understand his mysteries, they don't want any part of it. All right, you got Ephesians 3, verse 9, and I'll get back to the one I intend to start with. Verse 9, he says, And I want to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery now, when he speaks of the mystery, I'm going to put it this way. Now he's speaking of this whole body of truth. That all of these things that were revealed to this apostle, not counting eight, that's back in the book of Revelation 2, but all these first seven mysteries are, are basic doctrines that you will not find anywhere else in Scripture. You just can't find it. No use even wasting your time to look. All right, so back to my verse in Ephesians. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, or this huge compilation of secrets, which from the beginning of the world, now that takes us at least back to Adam, that have been hid from the beginning of the world, have been hid where? In God. That's why he could keep it secret. It was within his makeup, see? All right, all these things have been hid in God, the same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, so that's the whole concept then that I want to have you see this afternoon is that all these Pauline doctrines that he calls the mystery had never been revealed before. You can't find them in the four Gospels. You can't find them in the Old Testament. You can't find them in the little epistles at the end. They are uniquely within the epistles of this apostle. All right, so now then let's come back to our number one on the board, Ephesians 1.9 having made known unto us the mystery or the secret of his will. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Now, goodness sakes, we all know that beginning with the human experience, back with Adam and Eve, God's will was certainly exercised and made known, wasn't it? 
In other words, so far as Adam and Eve are concerned in the garden, what was God's will concerning what they could or could not do? Well, everything in the garden is for you to enjoy except that tree. So the will of God was expressed. And so when he dealt with Moses and he dealt with some of the other patriarchs and David and the prophets, we know that God expressed his will. So now what's the point I'm trying to make? Yet when it comes to you and I as a member of the body of Christ, understanding the will of God is something so totally different and superior to anything that ever went before. See, and that's what the average believer does not comprehend, that we are in such a unique position in God's dealing with the whole human race that as members of the body of Christ, we have an understanding of the will of God that even Adam didn't have. We have an understanding that Moses didn't have. We have an understanding that Abraham and the rest of them didn't have. All right, now let's just see what the Scripture says about it. Uh, continue on in Ephesians chapter 1 to see what I'm driving at. Jump across, at least in mine, to the other page. Go over to verse 15. And see if we can just get a little better comprehension of what Paul is talking about. This whole secret of a revealed will of God to you and I as believers today compared to the rest of biblical history. All right, verse 15. Now, this is a prayer of the apostle on behalf of the Ephesian believers. He says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, here is the apostle's prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Let me repeat. And you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? See, not the rest of the world. They know nothing of these things. But this is imparted only to you and I now as what we call grace age believers. See? All right, now let's just flip over a few pages to Colossians, and we have much the same thing, but to a different group of Gentiles over in Colossae. Now come into Colossians chapter 1. And again, we're going to look at a prayer of the Apostle on behalf of this congregation. And so we can just take the two of them together, and they're for us. Absolutely they are. Verse 9, Colossians chapter 1. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that is, of their professing faith in this preaching of the cross, that since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with, now here it comes, the knowledge of his what? His will, see? That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Well, for whom? Well, for us, for you and every individual believer. God has a will for that particular life, see? And this is what the apostle is praying. That to desire you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual, what's the next word? Understanding. How many church people have that today? Not many. And I'm not being judgmental, I'm just taking the general attitude of people. I hear it all the time. They invite them to a Bible study, not interested. They're not the least bit interested in finding out a little more about what this book says. Why not? They're not in the will of God, because God's will is that we grow in knowledge of his word. And when you grow in the knowledge of his word, you're going to experience, like I had a lady call from, I guess I can name the state, she called from Maryland. And she said, Les, Yesterday, I had the most exciting day of my whole life. I said, well, tell me about it. 
She said, I'd been to the mall and I'd finished shopping and I was on my way out to the car and she said, here as I went by one of these little outside cafes, you know, you see them in every mall. There this young man was sitting by one of those tables reading intently and she said, I walked over, got close enough and I noticed he was reading the Bible. And so she says, I stopped and noticed that he was in Proverbs and he had everything all highlighted and underlined. So she said, I was brazen enough. I said, young man, are you? reading Proverbs? And he says, yes. She says, why? Well, he says, it's the only book in this whole Bible that agrees with Plato. <laughs> she said, Plato? Who's that? <laughs> and he said, well, he lived 300 B.C. What's that got to do with you? Well, he says, according to Proverbs, he said a lot of the things fit. She said, can I just sit down and share the scriptures with you? And he said, yes, please do. Oh, he's just a young guy, about 30. So as I sat down, and she said, now, unless you talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, of course, she said, I've been listening to the program every morning in Romans. And so she said, all that was fresh on my mind. But I took his Bible, and she said, I went from verse to verse to verse. And she said, it was just the most exciting thing I've ever had happen. And she said, the guy was attentive. He was taking it all in. And she said, I was hoping that I could share phone numbers with him, but that he wouldn't do. But she said, when I got ready to leave, he did say this. He said, lady, you are the first person I've ever met that can make sense out of this book. Well, wouldn't you go back to your car on cloud nine? Yes, you would. And so this is what we have to wait for. When you get that off, don't think, well, I don't think I'm... Yes, the Spirit will take over. I had another lady some time ago in one of my classes in Oklahoma came in one evening on cloud nine. She had just shared the scriptures with a couple of three teenagers. And she said, every verse that came to mind, I could find it. And I said... That's the way the Spirit works. All right, so this is what it means to be under the control of the will of God because that will, in its turn, bring in wisdom and spiritual understanding. All right, now to qualify you as a believer to have this kind of understanding, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm hoping that I can make all these things come together and realize that you and I as believers have a relationship with God and an understanding of his word that Israel never had. Not even the best of them. Not even the prophets. Because, see, they didn't have this special revelation that we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Starting at verse 10. We're just going to do a lot of scripture reading today because after all, it's the Word of God that's powerful, not what Les Feldick says. The Word of God is powerful. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, searcheth all things, yea, the Deep things of God. Not just the fluff. See, that's where most of Christendom is. They're up there just scratching the surface. But the Spirit wants us to get down into the deep things. Now verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of men, save or except the spirit of man, whatever. But there's still nothing more than the things of men. See? All right. Now then, on the same basis then, even so... The things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. In other words, if you're going to send a young man to medical school, you don't expect some accountant to teach him anatomy, do you? <laughs> what do you expect? Well, you want somebody who is skilled in the discipline of anatomy to teach your kid the part of medical school that that applies to. Well, it's the same way with Scripture, see? You don't go to the outside world to understand Scripture. We go to that blessed Holy Spirit, which, as he says in verse 12, is freely given, see? All right, now verse 12. Now we have received get into the book. So we haven't got the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's not something you have to work and strive for. Just ask God to pour it out, and he will. And now verse 13. 
Which things, these things that come from God himself by way of the Holy Spirit, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, does that tell you something? Why do I use scripture verse after scripture verse after scripture, comparing spiritual with spiritual? Line upon line, that's the only way to do it, see? All right, now then verse 14. This is really the verse I was heading for. But the natural man, the unsaved person, the unsaved person receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. He's got no time for these things. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. That's why they're foolishness. He can't understand it anyway. And they are spiritually discerned. Now that's what it means then to know the will of God, is to understand that only by the working of that indwelling Holy Spirit can we come to a knowledge of these spiritual truths. All right, now then, let's see, where do I have you, 1 Corinthians? Come back a little further now to Romans. Come back to Romans chapter 8. And that's been on the air now, not too long ago, so this should almost just be a, 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 like a little quick review. And you remember that when I was teaching Romans, I emphasized that in the first seven chapters there was almost no mention of the Holy Spirit, almost none. But all of a sudden you break into chapter 8 and it just explodes. And I don't remember how many times, but I think it's something like 19, 20 times. In this one chapter we have reference to the Holy Spirit, and here it comes. Dropping down to verse 5, and this is all because of the revealed will of God in our lives, which was kept secret until it was given to this apostle. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but, now here it comes, they who are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life, that's eternal life, and peace, peace with God. And here's the reason, because the carnal, the unsaved mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, so they then that are in the flesh cannot please God. But, see, here we come. We're not in the flesh. We're in the Spirit. We're a whole new person as a result of our faith in that preaching of the cross, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, so we're not in the flesh. We're in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ... No matter how many times he's walked the aisle, no matter how many times he's been baptized one way or another, if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, he's still as lost as a goose, is my favorite expression. He doesn't know where he's going. But if you have the Spirit of God, then that is God's mark that you are indeed a child of his, which we're going to see in the next minute or so. All right. Verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, in other words, the very Spirit of the God of creation, the God who consummated the work of the cross, raised Christ from the dead, if the Spirit of that God dwells in you, and then He will quicken your mortal bodies by that Spirit that dwelleth in you. All right, now then, I'm going to bring you all down to verse 14. That when we experience true salvation, you have truly trusted and believed the gospel plus nothing. That the work of the cross was complete. I just emphasized again last night with a caller. I said, listen, when Jesus said it's finished, was he kidding? He was dead serious. And he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. The work of salvation was finished. He did it all. Now, of course, we've got to jump ahead three days and include the resurrection. But nevertheless, what has mankind done ever since the Apostle Paul was given this revelation? 
throwing everything at it but the kitchen sink. My, they're adding baptism, they're adding church membership, and they add tongues, and they add tithing, and they add healing, and they add this and that. Then what does that mean? That Christ didn't finish it, and you've got to add something to it? Isn't it ridiculous? But see, this is what I mean when I say that when you can place your faith and your trust totally in that finished work of the cross, nothing else is necessary. And then the Christian life follows. Of course it does. I'm I'm not saying anything about that. But I'm talking about the means of salvation. So if we have trusted that gospel of the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, now then verse 14 kicks in, and this is where we are. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, they are the sons or the children or the born ones, I think comes out of the Greek, of God. For, he says in verse 15, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't shake in our boots before a holy and awesome God, do we? I hope not. My goodness, we're in a relationship with him. We're his. He's ours, see? All right? So you haven't received the spirit of bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, which means you've been placed as a full son. Not a babe, but a full son. Now, again, I always have to emphasize, we start on two levels as a believer, don't we? The moment we're saved, yes, we're a babe in Christ. But on the other hand, we are placed in the body of Christ as a full heir. Read next verse. So the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are. Oh, I love that. Not something that you hope to be. Not something that you're going to try to be. You know, that's most of Christendom. Oh, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying. I'm working at it. That won't do you nickels worth of good because that's not what God is looking for. He's looking for faith and trust in what he has done. See? All right. So if that's what we have done, then this and will be for all eternity. We are the children of God. But hey, it gets better. We're not just children. We're what? Heirs of God. And we're not just heirs, we're what? Joint heirs. How much closer can you get? And we're joint heirs with Christ. And that means that everything that's his is ours. But it may also bring us to the place where we have to suffer with him. Now, fortunately, America so far hasn't had to do it. We may, but we know that down through the years, a lot of believers did. They suffered. They died as martyrs for their faith. But it's not a prerequisite, but it certainly is a distinct possibility that when we take a stand for Christ, we may yet have to suffer for it. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to all have you back, and you've had your coffee and your snacks and whatever, and we're going to get right back into the real food. We're going to get back into Ephesians chapter 3. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we just thank you for everything, and uh, We appreciate the fact that uh, many of you are learning how to study on your own, and nothing thrills us more. And uh, you're sharing it with others. You know, I've always said, you know why most believers do not share their faith? They're unsure of their wisdom. And so rather than get caught and embarrassed, they say nothing. But once we get people grounded in the Word, hey, when these cults come to your door, are they ever lacking for words? Never. 
Boy, they've got their verses down pat. See, well, once you get an understanding of the word, and uh, like I said in the last half hour, and you get an opportunity to share it, then you're ready. And uh, so that's basically why we keep teaching, is to prepare people to share their faith with those that they have opportunity. All right, we're in book number 76, the middle four programs. So those of you out in television, if you're interested in these things, why, give us a call. Okay, back to Ephesians chapter 3. And we're still going to deal with the mysteries all afternoon as we got them here on the board. Now we're going to hit number two, the mystery of Christ. Christ, a secret? Well, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. And uh, we'll just take a good in-depth look at it. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, of course, the verse we really want is verse 3. Is that what I got on the board? 4. Okay, it's 3 and 4. But let's start at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 1 and head for number 4. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for whom? Gentile. Gentile. See, now I didn't rehearse that again the last few programs. We've got to constantly remember, how did Paul end up being the apostle of the Gentiles? Well, you remember back in Matthew chapter 10, as the Lord had just chosen the twelve, he gave them marching orders. And what was it? Go not into the way of a Gentile and into the city of Samaritans. Enter you not. Why? Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so the twelve were then later on called the apostles of Israel. Now when Israel kept rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and they epitomized it when they killed Stephen, who are we introduced to? The next player, Saul of Tarsus. He held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen. All right, now then, when you get into chapter 9, remember, God is dealing with Ananias, who is going to be the go-between. And what does he tell Ananias? I'm going to send this man, Saul of Tarsus, far hence to the Gentile. Now, do you see the difference in the language? Jesus told the twelve, go not to the Gentile, go to Israel. To this apostle, he says, you're going to the Gentiles, and of course, Israel as well. Big difference, big difference. And again, most of Christendom can't get it. That's one of my number one arguments, if I get any in the mail. Where do you get this business of a gospel for the Jew and a gospel for Gentile? Well, just right there. How in the world? If Jesus sent the twelve out into the tribes of Israel, could they preach death, burial, and resurrection? Hadn't happened yet. Nobody had any idea he was going to die. And so they certainly had a different message. But all right, now to the Gentile world then, this man becomes the one and only true apostle of the Gentile. Now, of course, we know that following him came Barnabas and Silas, the apostle of the Gentiles as this one is. All right, now verse 2. If, what kind of a word is that? Well, there's a possibility you may not have. But if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. me For years and years, you know what that means. Just like God gave Moses the dispensation of law, and Moses took it down to the mountain to Israel, to this apostle, and I think on the same mountain, he gives now the dispensation of the grace of God, and he doesn't qualify just one group over another, but he says, take it to the Gentile world. Apostles were to Israel, this apostle to the Gentile. All right, now verse 3. Here comes our word. How that by revelation he, God, made known unto me the mystery, the secret. See, that's why I've got it up here with all the others. That he made known unto me the secret, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, that is, his epistles, <clears throat> you may understand my knowledge, and knowledge brings what? Wisdom. So you can just about put it all together, those words all fit, that you can have knowledge and wisdom and understanding, whereby you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
the secret things of Christ that were never understood until revealed to this apostle in plain language. Now, of course, a lot of things were in veiled language back here in the Old Testament in the Gospels, but did they understand it? No, they didn't know what it was all about. In fact, I guess this is a good time to do it, honey. Let's go to 1 Peter before we go any further. 1 Peter, chapter 1, starting at verse 1. So that you'll know who Peter is addressing. And you know that's our first rule of thumb. Always determine who's writing and who are they writing to. Well, Peter, the apostle of Israel, an apostle of Israel, he's one of the twelve, and he's writing to Jews. All right, verse 1 of 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and put in the word writing without doing any violence to the Scripture, because that's what he's doing. He's writing to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Well, who were the strangers scattered? Jews who had been chased out of, out of Israel and out of Jerusalem by first Saul's uh, persecution, and, and that was predominantly it, and other things as well. So they are scattered throughout that end of the Roman Empire. All right, now then, just to see who he's addressing, he's writing to Jews. Now look down at verse 9. These Jews were receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now verse 10. Of which, his fellow Jews, of which salvation the prophets, who? The Old Testament writers, the prophets have inquired. What's the other word for inquired? They were asking. See? They were asking, if not others, themselves. Well, what, what, what's this talking about? Who is God addressing? See? And so they inquired and searched the Scriptures. See? They were searching the Scriptures diligently. And these same prophets now prophesied or foretold things in the future of the grace that should be come to you out in the future sometime. Now verse 11. Searching the Scriptures, the Old Testament, as much as they had. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them. Now remember, the Holy Spirit has always been the same Spirit. God the Son has always been the same person of the Godhead. Only now in the New Testament we all right, so what manner of time this Spirit of Christ who was in them, that is, that Holy Spirit, did signify when it testified beforehand, before it ever happened, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, you see what I said? What were the prophets talking about? The suffering. There had to be a sacrifice for sin beyond the animal sacrifices, see? And so, but it was in such veiled language. God didn't expect them to figure it out, and they didn't. But for our benefit, now we can go back to Isaiah 53. Let's go back there. I haven't done it in a long time. I've got a lot of Jewish listeners, so maybe this is just for their benefit. Isaiah 53. Now I'm chasing rabbits. I'm sorry. I didn't intend to do this. This was not in my thinking at all when I left home this morning. But this is what we have to do. Isaiah 53. Start at verse 1. Now remember what Peter is saying. These Old Testament prophets looked at these verses. They knew there was something here, but they couldn't figure it out. And so they just kept searching and searching. But it wasn't time for them to understand. And so God didn't reveal it. All right, look at it now. Verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he. Now here we come. We're talking about the Messiah now, the Son of God, the Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. Now, 
What's that a reference to? Well, Bethlehem. Who would ever expect a coming king to be born in a stable situation down in the little lowly town of Bethlehem? So it's just like a little piece of grass coming up out on the desert. Insignificant, almost un unknown, see? So he comes as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, he wasn't born there with a great halo over his head and all the aspects of a king. No, he was in a lowly manger. All right? He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a great, fantastic, handsome individual that was just drawn because of his physical attributes. No. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, verse 3, here comes the cross now. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, for he was despised, and we esteemed him not. What does that mean? They didn't know who he was. Oh, they should have. He gave them three years of proof, but they couldn't believe it. All right? And so we esteemed him not. Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, what does that mean? He was the sacrifice not only for the whole nation of Israel, but for the whole human race. Yet we did esteem him stricken, beaten, misused by the Romans. Smitten of God, of course, that was the work of the cross, where all the sin of the world was laid on that sinless one. And he was afflicted. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, sin. He became the supreme sacrifice. He was bruised for our iniquity. He went through it all for the sins first of Israel, of course, but then for the whole human race. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, that is, the stripes of the Roman whips, we are healed. Now, that's not talking about physical healing. That's talking about the spiritual. We're dealing with the salvation aspect of that work of the cross, see? Now, verse 6. This is Israel. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. In other words, they just couldn't come together and recognize who this Messiah, born in Bethlehem, growing up in Nazareth, now performing miracles for the last three years, they just couldn't figure out who he was. So now then, reading verse 6, the end, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now verse 7, he was oppressed. This is all a reference to that work of the cross. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb or quiet, so he opens his mouth. Now, as you read this, of course, we can understand. It's after the fact. But can you see how much the Jews of antiquity could get out of this? There was no putting two and two together here. But yet, after the fact, they should be able to see it. And that's usually the vehicle that does bring a Jew to faith. They can then see that, yes, this all took place. Absolutely it did. But for those back there at that time, no. They could not figure it out. Then verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off. He was put to death. Now remember, in Old Testament economy, who were God's, my people? Israel. Who is Isaiah writing to? Israel. See? But on the other hand, God didn't expect them to understand who this was before the fact. See? And that's why all the, even the followers of Jesus, as it was getting up time for the cross, they didn't understand that he was going to be going the way of the cross. All right, now then, back to 1 Peter. I'm not through there yet. Back to 1 Peter. Oh, 
All right, verse 11 again. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ. See, back there in Isaiah 53, the Holy Spirit was already laying the seeds of this coming work of the cross. But God didn't expect the Jews of that time to understand it, even though they, they tried. Now verse 12, and then we'll move on. Unto whom it was revealed, that is, unto these writers of the Old Testament prophecies, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us. Peter is now writing from his point in time. Now, after the cross had been accomplished, see, and everyone should understand who he was and why he death, died the death that he did. All right? But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them who have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Well, now that was a reference, of course, to Pentecost. All right, now while we're back here at Peter anyway, we're going to jump over to chapter 2 because I always use this to allay my what should I call them? My accusers, making too much of Paul. Oh, they think I make too much of Paul. And all I say, well, haven't you ever read 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16? Well, then that shuts them up, see? Because here is the very answer to that accusation. 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 and 16. Come to my defense. If someone says, I won't listen to that guy, he makes too much of Paul. Well, you be ready. Well, if you think he makes too much of Paul, then Peter did worse. <laughs> well, they will never take anything like that and blame Peter, because that's the one they think they're following. But look what Peter says now at the end of his life, just shortly before he's martyred. Verse 15 of chapter 3. Account that the long-suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. God is not willing that brother Paul according to the wisdom well, what wisdom is he talking about these secrets that have been revealed see this whole body of truth that was never understood before comes from the pen of this hated apostle and so Peter has to even tell his Jewish people look you go to Paul's epistles because our program is falling away. And indeed it was. The Jewish program was falling through the cracks. And by the time Peter meets his martyr's death, nothing left. The temple would be gone in a couple years. The priesthood would be gone. No more sacrifices. No more temple worship. So what do they got left? Paul's gospel. See, So you go to Paul according to the wisdom given unto him has written unto you as also in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, speaking in them of these things pertaining to salvation, in which, that is Paul's epistles, are some things hard to be understood. Now, most of you have heard this a hundred times. Some of you out there for the first time. In Paul's epistles, in Peter's thinking, at the end of his life, were still hard to understand. Well, now you've got to remember, what was Peter? A religious Jew under the law. And I always point that out when I teach Acts chapter 10. My, when that sheet came down with all those unclean animals, and God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Even into the face of God, what did Peter say? No way. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, why did he say that? He was a law-keeping Jew. And against all good Jewish sense, heel prints in the sand from Joppa to Caesarea, and when he gets to the door, what does he tell Cornelius? Cornelius, you know, even you as a pagan Gentile know this much, it's an unlawful thing for me, a Jew, to keep company with a person of another nation. You see that? That was contrary to the Jewish makeup. They didn't have any marching orders to go to the Gentile world. That was Paul's prerogative. 
But yet Peter says here that all of Paul's epistles now are for even the Jewish people, not just the Gentiles now, and in which, yes, there were things for a good Jew to comprehend. A pagan Gentile can be saved without becoming a proselyte of Judaism? Unheard of. And even when God saved those Gentiles in the house of Cornelius before Peter even finished preaching, and the evidence of it was, was made known. What did those six Jews who went up there with Peter, what was their reaction? What's the word? Astonished. Astonished. Gentiles saved without becoming even a proselyte? You get that? And that just shows the vast distinction from the time of Christ's earthly ministry until this other apostle starts going to the Gentile world. All right? So in all his epistles, speaking in the name of these, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they who are unlearned, I'm afraid that's most of Christendom, unlearned, unstable, and they twist, and they twist, and they twist, as they do also the other scriptures. Now that statement right there then maintains that if all the rest of the Bible is Scripture, so is Paul's epistles. And then they ridicule it, and they hate it, to their own what? Destruction. The book says it. I didn't. All right, now then, let's go back. Oh my goodness, only got four minutes left, and I ain't even started. <laughs> Ephesians, chapter 3. <laughs> got to get back to what we're talking about. Verse 4, whereby when you read, that is, these Pauline epistles, that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery or the secret things of Christ. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. After all the Old Testament, after his three years of earthly ministry, there are things that were kept secret? How could it? Well, let me just give you one example that I think is the most graphic. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1, another portion. Many of you heard me teach more than once. But, oh, if this isn't a revelation of this Jesus of Nazareth like no other portion in Scripture, I don't know what is. Colossians chapter 1. We have to start at verse 12 so that we establish who we're talking about. And as we read this, and as I comment on it, just keep asking yourself, is this revealed any place else in Scripture? Does Genesis 1-1 say anything like this? Now, you all know what Genesis 1-1 says. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, period. But now look how the deep, the end of his prayer giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us and prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. See, we covered that in the last half hour. Who, speaking of God the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now that goes back to what we taught a year or two ago, that the body of Christ is in the kingdom of God. Now verse 14. In whom? Well, in who? The Son in the verse ahead. So in the Son... We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. Now here it comes. Here is what I call a revelation of a mystery that only comes from the pen of this apostle. Who, God the Son, is the image or the visible appearance of what God the invisible God. Now you've got to remember that when you go back into the Old Testament, God was the invisible three-person God, even though Israel only recognized one God, yet we know that the three were already visible or uh, mentioned and so forth. For example, the Spirit moved on the face of the deep in Genesis 1 and so forth. But to understand that one person of that Godhead did what Paul now gives Christ credit for doing, uh-uh, you can't find it. Nowhere. Jesus himself never made any descriptive account of how he created everything. He certainly let it be known that he was in control of the elements. 
He could get up on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a raging storm, and how much did he have to do? Spoke the word. Peace be still, and phew, the wind died down. The sea got calm, and the twelve said, What? What manner of man is this, that even the wind obeys his voice? Now listen, that's not empty words. Can you put yourself in those guys' shoes that particular day? When the waves are beating and the wind is blowing and it's storming like everything and all he says is, peace be still? No wonder they were flabbergasted. And what did they say? What manner of man is this that even the wind obeys his voice? Well, why did it? We'll come back to this in the next half hour. Because he's the God of creation. That's why. And I guess it's time for us to wind this down and we'll come back right in the next half hour. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, here we go, and you're back again from coffee, and we're just going to start right back where we left off in that last half hour. I ran out of time. I uh, didn't even get a good start on that half hour, but... Uh, Let's just jump right in. I don't have to make any announcements this half hour, so let's just go right back where we left off in the last moment of the last half hour, Colossians chapter 1, and uh, we're looking at the third one up there, the mystery, no, the second one, the mystery of Christ, the very secret of who he really is. Now again, as I said in the last program, you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's God who in the beginning created heaven and earth. But how much of God do you get out of that? And uh, Christ and his earthly ministry, I guess that's where I closed, wasn't it? How that the God-man, the incarnate, could speak the word and the winds would obey his voice. And he could raise the dead and all those other things. And yet... It wasn't the complete picture of who he really is. And that's what I want to unveil under this secret or the mystery of Christ as Paul reveals him. All right, so I almost have to go back like we did the last time and start over at least in verse oh, 13 because I've got to establish who we're talking about. <clears throat> so, God the Father... Up in verse 12, has delivered us from the power of darkness, has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now we know definitely who we're talking about. In whom, that is in the Son, we have redemption through his blood. So there's no doubt that we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, resurrected, ascended Lord, who also gave us then the forgiveness of sin. Now here's the part I want to reveal. A revelation of Christ like you've never seen anywhere else in Scripture. This Jesus of Nazareth, who has finished the work of the cross, has ascended back to glory and revealed these things to this apostle, is the image of the invisible God. Now think about that for a minute. The invisible God? Well, of course, God was spirit. When the scripture says no man has looked on God at any time and lived, what was it talking about? Not Jesus in his body of flesh. 
It was talking about that invisible Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they were invisible. They were spirit. No man has ever looked in on that invisible Godhead and lived. They wouldn't have. All right, so now we're bringing it down to the fact that this Jesus, God the Son, the one who suffered and died, is now the visible manifestation of that invisible God. You see that? Now, that's never been this plain anywhere else, Scripture. In fact, you know, I've said it before. First, some of the times I'd teach these things, people would look at me aghast. You mean Jesus of Nazareth was the creator God of Genesis 1? Well, of course. Of course he was. And people just can't fathom that. But he was. He spoke the word and the universe came about. Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we're talking about. See? All right, now with that in mind, let's read on. So this God the Son is the image or the visible manifestation of that image invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In other words, he was before anything that was ever created. Verse 16, here's why. For by him, as the creator of everything, as God the Son, as Jesus of Nazareth, I got to keep coming back so we don't lose who we're talking about. That by him were all things Everything was created. Everything. Things that are in heaven. Now stop a minute. What's in heaven? The angelic hosts. See? And all the beauty of it. The sea of glass as it's pictured in one place. And all the other ramifications. He's the creator of it all. He was before anything. That are in the earth. Everything. Everything. Every living creature, every bug, every fish, everything was created by this Jesus of Nazareth. See? Visible. Well, that's a little easier to understand, but the next part, the invisible. Even things that we can't see and yet we know from scientific experiments and what other things, we know they're there. If no other way, we know it from Scripture and we take it by faith, they're there. Thrones, wow, now what are we talking about? Governments, see? Empires, kings. How do they get there? By God the Son. Oh, listen, th th this is something exciting, see? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, now, some Bible scholars will bring that into the satanic realm of the demons and Satan himself, which, of course, is true. He's a created being. So principalities and powers, and now it's repeated. So that there's no doubt. All things, everything that you can imagine were created by God the Son. Now, granted, the other two persons were there. We're not going to leave God the Father and God the Spirit out of creation, but it's by virtue of the spoken word from God the Son that everything appeared, whatever it is. All right, they were created by him and for him. <clears throat> and now look at the next verse. And by, or, and he is before all things. See, that goes back to his pre-eternal existence. He's always... You know, I think I mentioned the last taping. Have you ever tried to lay awake a few moments at night, look at the ceiling, and stop and figure out where God came from? Have you? Yeah, I think we all have. How in the world? That's beyond us. Eternity is beyond us. We cannot comprehend eternity. It's utterly impossible. So we take it by faith. See? All right. So now read on the last half is what I really want to hit home on. And by him, by Jesus the Christ, all things consist. What's that mean? Are held together. The universe in all of its orbits and all the stars 
The sun never burns out. And that always gets to me. How does that sun keep generating without ever losing its energy? Mind-boggling. How did it get there? By the spoken word of this person of the Godhead, God the Son. And not only would he create it, but he's keeping it all running smoothly. And if he should ever give the word to destroy it, it'll go. But he is the controlling element of everything, see? All right, now then let's just come to the next part. And he is the head of the body, which is the church. Now there again, you hardly ever hear that. Christendom in general never refers to the body of Christ. They like to talk about the kingdom. Oh, we got to work for the kingdom. Well, that's as far as it's okay as far as it goes, but that's not what we're involved in. We're involved in the body. And that's why there's so much confusion. Christendom cannot get it through its corporate head that the body of Christ is something intrinsically revealed from, again, this apostle. Nowhere else. I've put it out there for 30 years. If you can find any direct reference to the body of Christ, any place but Paul's epistle, show me. Nobody has done it yet. It's not in there. It is a Paul revelation of things kept secret that this compilation of born from above believers become a part of an intrinsic living organism that we call the body of Christ, of which he is the head. And just like the human body, everything starts with a thinking mechanism up here. And that's why Christ then is the head. All right, let the scripture say it for itself. And he, this same Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Jesus of Nazareth, who walked the dusty roads of Israel, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, see, he comes from eternity past, the firstborn from the dead, there again, he's the first to have ever been dead and resurrected back to life, never to die again, he's the first. That in all things, in everything, he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father, see, now we bring him in, for it pleased the Father that in him, God the Son, should all fullness dwell. See? All right, now that's the Christ that has never been revealed anywhere else in Scripture like Paul does. All right, but just to make sure that Paul isn't out in left field, let's go back to John's Gospel a moment. But see, John says just enough to confirm what we're doing here in Colossians. But yet he doesn't give the details. You can't construct that much out of what John writes. Chapter 1, verse 1. Most of you know the verse. All got it? John's Gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and then we'll drop down to 14 for further confirmation. Verse 1. In the beginning, whenever it was, there was the Word capitalized. And the Word, capitalized, a member of the deity. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now then, verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, that's just confirmation, see? All right, now then, just to make sure that we understand who we're talking about, you take verse 14. And the Word, God the Son again, was made flesh, is incarnate, became the God-man. So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know definitely who we're talking about. All right, now i got one more that I usually like to... Uh, add for all this is Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> Hebrews 
Chapter 1. Now I've got to wait till you all find it, and then I trust everyone out in television does. Hebrews chapter 1. Might as well start at verse 1. God. See? That triune God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past to the fathers, that is, Israel's fathers, and they spoke through the prophets. But now verse 2, the same God hath in these last days, in other words, Christ's first advent are the last days of Scripture. <clears throat> this same God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. See? Plain as English can make it. 